Thank you for tuning to our Michelin Countdown to Green. We're into our race broadcast. Hello, everybody. It's John Heindorf and Jeremy Shaw live from the fifth floor overlooking the trioval and the start finish line. 61 cars have rolled out of the pit in a marvelous and Herculean effort by the Windward Racing team to bring a spare machine to them from Texas after their car was damaged in an accident earlier on this week. We wish the best to Lucas Dar, who's coaching from his hospital bed at the moment. Lucas, we wish you the best. Just off the beach, three and a half miles, 12 turns. The classic combo of the road and oval circuit that has started the international series here in the US for a very long time indeed. Oh, if these bits of tarmac could talk, what stories they could tell. And we're setting history again today here on this track with all the nuances of the infield through turn one and then back out onto the speedway turn one at turn six. The Le Mans chicane really underlining that this is a new era of sports car racing, a new era of cooperation, a new era of partnership, a new era of understanding, and the word is convergence. At the front of the field, nine new DPI 2.0s, GTP makes its debut on the world stage with Acura, Porsche, Cadillac, and BMW fighting to be the best of the next 24 hours. At 24 hours that you'll have here, live and uninterrupted on 107.9 around the circuit on Sirius XM 207 and of course around the world on RS2, the home of IMSA Radio. If you're outside the US, you can tune into our World Feed TV pictures via IMSA Radio and the live video tab. We'll start off with Jeremy Shaw and me, John Hindoff up here. It is Joe Bradley and Shea Adam in the pit lane. Nick Damon will join us later, as will Peter Mackay and Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones to come in our overnight night shift, where we uh, take over NBC from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Eastern uh, with our Night Owls presentation powered by Sacred Coffee. That's all to come, but for now, Take a breath, get yourself settled down and stand by. Those of you who are here will be able to say you witnessed this live. Those of you watching and listening around the world will be able to say that you heard the first turns of the Michelin tires of the new GTP class. I can't tell you how excited we are. I can't tell you how much excitement there is in the paddock and optimism, Jeremy Shaw, is flowing like a waterfall in the IMSA paddock. Great, great announcements this week from all the manufacturers. We saw the drivers for the Garage 56 for Le Mans announced early on the new shirt, the new uh, Corvette GT3 car sits just opposite us a golden age of sports car racing? No doubt about it, uh, and you're right. Uh, optimism, enthusiasm, excitement, all of those words, whatever adjective you want to come up with that's positive, go for it, because that applies to the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship and for the next 24 hours, the 61st Rolex 24 at Daytona. Cars are rolling on their formation laps. It's just about perfect. A little bit of cloud uh, overhead at the moment on the track. 84 Fahrenheit is 28 Celsius in the air. 64 Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius. That's a bit warmer than uh, the forecast was predicting. And the overnight temperatures nowhere near as low as they were last year, at least in the forecast. Yeah, that's exactly right. The forecast has changed rapidly through the week, but it's, it's getting more and more positive. Again, more and more positivity here. It's perfect right now, absolutely perfect. A little bit of cloud cover, still the sun is, so, yeah, no, just, the sun's not, just not too bright, but it's there, it's great, fabulous. Through the turn seven, Le Mans chicane, which has been an action area, Costa pole position for Porsche and Nick Tandy last Sunday when the grid was set. It will be Tom Blomqvist who brings the cars through to their start with the Acura number 60. He was quickest last Sunday with the Porsche 963 of Felipe Nazza alongside him. We've got triple wide. Check that, quad wide yeah. from our safety cars <laughs> at the front of the field. 
That is an awesome sight from our four manufacturers in GTP. More than a little golf clap there. Split start as well with the GTD and GTD Pro cars sitting a ways back from the prototypes. Take a deep breath, everybody. This has been a long time coming. Many of us never thought we'd see it in our lifetime. Convergence is real, and the 24-hour starts right now. Thank you to Dr. Don Panos, who put this all in motion back in the late 1990s. We are racing for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship and the 61st running of the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona. Tom Blomqvist gets a decent start and pulls away at the front of the field, but he's under pressure straight away by the yellow-fronted 0-1 Sebastian Borte Cadillac. That's a brilliant start from him. Now, GTDs, Mercedes for the top three, and then the vantage of Ross Gunn across the line. The bright blue chrome car down on the inside is the 71 Sun Energy 1. That was the 61st entry here this weekend as the Prototypes are about to go back onto the banking. It's a good start for Fabian Schiller. Mike Skeen holding on in second place. The top three Mercedes have got through. We've got a problem out on the far side of the circuit. It is already a problem for Stephen Thomas. And the number 11 prototype, that's the TDS Racing LMP2 car. He went straight on at the Western Horseshoe. Looks like there's little or no damage on that car. He recovers, but he's lost the draft, of course, which is so important here. There's, a, there's another car that's slow on the banking, too, coming out of turn six, I think. I'm not sure who that is. It's stuck on the banking, yeah. in fact, Jeremy. That is now just dropping down, and that's another one of the LMP2 cars. Yeah, Stephen Thomas just went way too, too, too hard into turn uh, five there. It was a whip round one. I think it's the tower it's car. Tower tower. I think slow. it is, yeah. It's the eight car looking through the binoculars at the far end of the field, far end of the racetrack. So drama early on. Wow, what a sight that was. Those nine GTP cars getting underway. Tom Blomfist has jumped off into a decent lead. What a start, though, by Sebastian Bourdais, who picked his way through into second. Felipe Nasser, who started on the outside of the front row in the best of the Porsches, in third. Then in fourth position, the Koninger Minolta Acura. Now, Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Autosport, two giants of American motorsport coming together. Making that collaboration and partnership. What else for Andretti? Formula One with GM, potentially, as well as everything else that they're doing, and now sports cars as well. But at the front of the field, we're still green, and Tom Blomqvist leads by a handy one and a half seconds. Unfortunately, although Stephen Thomas stayed out in the number 11 TDS car, the guys down at Tower talking to their driver in the number eight machine, that's John Ferrano, and the yellow is out. Pits are closed. All the excitement, all the anticipation, and Tom Blomqvist's one and a half second lead will disappear. Well, it gives us a breather at least, Jeremy, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Uh, I tell you what, it was a nice clean start there, and I think pretty much everybody did, uh, did a good job of staying in their lines, in their respective grid order, two by two, before the start finish line. That's the key to this. Anything other than that, you're going to get a penalty. If you change lanes before the start finish line at the start, you're liable to a penalty. Uh, the, the, interesting, the number 83 Lamborghini, which is about the most distinctive car in the field, it's bright pink. That's the Iron Dames Lamborghini. Rahel, Rahel Frey, she took initially thought about moving out and then quickly moved back into line again. Uh, I, so I think she'll be fine with that. I think that was OK. But uh, it was a nice clean start, and uh, boy, that, uh, that Atkin really left, leapt off the line, didn't it? But what a shame here for poor John Ferrano and this uh, Tower Motorsport team. They've got uh, some high-profile uh, co-drivers there with John for this race. The uh, IndyCar stars, the Bus Brothers, uh, Joseph Newgarden and Scott, Scotty McLaughlin. Joining uh, them is the youngster Kiffin Simpson, uh, and John Ferran, of course, he and Tower Motorsport, they won the LMP2 Championship last season, the overall championship, of which, incidentally, this is actually not a round. It is a round in LMP2 for the Michelin Endurance Cup, 
but for the season long championship it isn't long story but basically you've got long races and short races and uh, this one is not an overall championship round but this is really disappointing for that tower motorsport team they've uh, they, they came into this race with high with high expectations as they always do now particularly having had so, so much success last year but um it's, it's going to be a uh, going to have to be a come from behind effort now for john ferrano and team the good news for Stephen Thomas is he was able to, to get going get at the tail of the field in LMP2, so he should be fine. Uh, and before we go back to green now, once the field has, has uh, reset itself behind the safety car, then there will be a reordering of the classes. So the GTP cars uh, will stay at the front of the field where they are in any case. The LMP2s will move ahead. There's a couple of them, Stephen Thomas and Fred Pordad, who'd slipped behind a couple of the LMP3s, uh, Stephen, of course, because of his spin, but they will reset that order before the green flag. The GTDs and GTD Pros, well, they are treated as just one class. Yes. Uh, they, they're the same specification of car, whether you're pro or not, so they will not be set. It'll be all the GTD Correct. cars in whatever order they happen to be. Indeed, as they started, Jeremy, they, were, they, they qualified yeah. as a, a single class. Hello to Alan McNish. Feels like I haven't said that for quite some time. Tuned in from home, uh, reminding me that uh, this is my 25th season of covering uh, American sports car uh, racing. Uh, and also reminding me uh, when uh, Martin Haven, our cohort, introduced us both to speed pool in San Francisco. Uh, yes, I have a vague memory of that, Mr. McNish. Let's go down to the pit lane and to Joe Bradley. There's a story there, but it's, I, think we're, I think we're outside the statute of limitations now for that. Joe Bradley down with Tower Motorsport. Problems for them early on. Yeah, and we're not out the statute of limitations too early, I off. Um, yes, uh, they're not sure of what the problem is that's brought the car to a halt. What they are sure of is where the car's been recovered, and that's back to the garage. The team have left the box and are heading over there right now. Thank you very much indeed. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch with us. IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together outside the US. Two people saying they're uh, struggling to get that uh, international feed. We're checking with that at the moment, but uh, not aware of any issues. We'll, uh, we'll get back to you on the socials as far, far as that is concerned. Just coming through to complete a, another lap, Tom Blomqvist and the big winner, Seb Borde for Cadillac 01, the Chip Ganassi run Cadillac racing car who made up positions. Uh, I know this is early to say that, but obviously I've already had tweets on this, Jeremy. What is the distance record? What lap number uh, are we, we looking for? I'll leave you a moment to, to find that whilst I run down the positions of the car behind our safety cars. Porsche 963, number seven. Oh, Shea Adams already put a hand up down in the pit lane and says... Oh, you saw that. Um, it is 593 is the minimum number of laps that have been run by the top class car. 833 is the distance. Wow. That was last year. And uh, for... Or, sorry, 2020. And for the GT3 spec cars, 765 laps is their record. Their minimum is 561. So we look set to beat that uh, if we should stay green and not have that Give giant me. rain delay that we had in 2019. Give me that, that top number again. Uh, the, the max number yeah. for the top class cars was 833 laps. 833. And I've got a pick caller. I was not expecting this. AO Racing is in the lane with their Porsche, and they are going to work on the right front tire. Now, the pits are closed because this is considered a short yellow within the first 15 minutes of running. The pits will open off the back of the short yellow, which is different from years past, but it's been that way for a couple of years now. They've taken the right front off. They're looking at the right front and the left front. Ooh, and they've got a new brake disc up on the wall for each of the front wheels. That's not a great start for this team. Thank you, Shea. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. Other classes, Ben Keating held on to the lead from pole position in the wins. Oreca in LMP2. Nico Benio in the 33 Sean Creech Motorsport. That's the Stars and Stripes machine leading in LMP3. In GTD, Fabian Schiller held on for the bright chrome blue with flames on the front of it in GTD. 
That's the number 75 Sun Energy One car. Maro Engel leads the GTD pros for WeatherTech Racing in the white, red and blue at GT3 AMG. So everybody packing up behind the safety car. And the pits has been opened for everyone. Now, interesting. So the pits has been opened for everyone uh, early on. Down at the pit out end of things, we have the AO car still being worked on. This is the tribute swap shop livery. And hearing from the pit lane that Peter Hyatt lost brakes on his outlap and actually brushed the wall in that car. Green flag, back to green flag. That's why the pits were opened. And we are racing once again here at Daytona International Speedway. 23 hours, 49 minutes and 30, 29, 28 seconds to go. And Tom Blancmiss had to do it again, but this time at least in single file. Sebastian Borde, who was very sharp on the initial start. Philippe Nasser in third, the engineer here. Behind me is Pipo Durrani's Cadillac, the largest displacement. No replacement for displacement, as Chip Ganassi said to us earlier on this week. Nick Tandy just ahead in sixth position, uh, in fifth position, excuse me. In fact, he's gone through. The big engine of the Cadillac then purring away. The highest revving engine is the Acura, it's the smallest capacity, 2.6 V6, revving up to around about 9,500 revs, and, uh, and that is part of the balance of performance. They were hoping to get a couple of hundred RPM more than that, I think, but uh, IMSA erring on the side of caution in the early days of GTP. And in fairness, Jeremy, from our independent point of view, what, and I'm sorry if I upset anybody in any of the manufacturers or teams, having 0.7, 0.8 of a second between the GTPs in all the running last weekend at the Raw and this week, um, the stats so far by IMSA seems to have got things pretty right. Yeah, fantastic job. I think they seem to have done. You're absolutely right. And these cars are, they've got plenty of horsepower. They are a lot more powerful than the previous generation of DPI cars. They are a lot heavier, too. They're about 100, well, they are, minimum weight is 100 kilos more, so that's about 225 pounds more than the previous cars. Uh, and they don't have as much downforce as the DPI cars, but they are fast on the straights. And for the first time in oh, quite a few years here, these cars are, uh, are now maxing out above 200 miles an hour, depending on the wind di direction, either into turn one or into the Le Mans chicane, the bus stop on the back stretch. Last year's breeder cars, they, they topped out about 191, so these are significantly faster. And uh, speak to any of the drivers, they are an absolute blast to drive. Uh, if you're listening to us around the world on RS2, don't forget, uh, in the States, it's XM, uh, Sirius XM 207. Uh, go to imsaradio.com and hit the live video tab. Those pictures are working fine. So, it all coming back in to serve their drive-through, having done the emergency service for the brake issues at the front of the field. A second gap by Tom Blomqvist. Meantime, further back in GTD, it's the battle of the Mercedes, and Maro Engel in the pro car has just taken the overall GT lead. Of course, when we get to the last few hours of the race, the GTDs and the GTD pros will probably all have drivers in, so it will just be a battle. It is two separate classes. The cars are identical. What places the cars in the class is the makeup of the drivers and uh, what grades the drivers are. You rely on a full pro lineup in GTD Pro, clearly, whereas in GTD, you have to have some silver or bronze drivers. Mike Skeen then goes through in second. Maro Engel goes through to the lead. Much to the pleasure of Cooper McNeil, who's stepping away from full-time driving in the WeatherTech team. He's going to be doing some more of the uh, team management role, but he still will be turning out for the longer races in the Michelin Endurance Cup throughout the season. 
So change of lead in GTD Pro. Maro Engel now leads for WeatherTech. From the GTD leader of Mike Skeen, Fabian Schiller, still in third for the Sun Energy One machine, which was the ball set that dropped back a couple of places on that restart. Best of the Aston Martins, Ross Gunn for Heart of Racing, the number 23 blue car in fourth in the GT Pro GTD line. Then Ben Barnicott for Lexus. Ari Tealitz for Lexus, that's Pro from GT. D. And there's going to be a stop plus 10 penalty for the AO Porsche in properly served emergency service fuel obligation. You're only allowed five seconds of fuel when the pits are closed for emergency service. And so that car will have to come back in down the pit lane. And not just a drive through, it is a stop and hold. So, 23, 44, and 13, 12, 11, 10 seconds to go. Just in case you are linking up audio here in the States. Tom Blomqvist now three seconds to the good. This is impressive by the young Brit. I tell you, he was massively impressive last year, wasn't he? Uh, I think he... Uh, Great. Yeah, that was a... a an inspired choice for him. Uh, not he was not for for that ride prior to the beginning of last season, perhaps. But by the end of it, he absolutely was. Uh, he he was a star right from the very very beginning for Michael Shank Racing. He was invited to a test the previous fall, uh, and they imp he impressed them there. They signed him up, and boy did he deliver last year. Uh, he. Uh, and Oliver Jarvis just did a fabulous job all season long, but for me, Tom Blumkis really was the star. Uh, he was fast, he was uh, super consistent, and uh, just uh, you know, a, an exemplary job all the way around. And he is the team leader this year, qualified on the pole position again for this race. And now you're edging away another two tenths of a second. That's actually 3.4 seconds, the gap from first to second. He's settled into now a consistent pace. He's already set the fastest lap of the race, that was a 1 minute 35.616. Uh, he's now doing uh, 35.7, 35.8, the last couple of laps. So setting into, settling in to a nice, consistent, what he hopes is a nice consistent place. And that's the, the sort of pace we expected, somewhere between 35, 1 minute 35, 1 minute 36. The old lap record, by the way, in the DPI cars was a 133, race lap record, a 133.7. Um, the the uh, fastest lap in qualifying last weekend was a 134.0 so you know these cars are fast but uh, and, and particularly considering the fact they are very early in their development curve up to second in p3 gar robinson in the ranch 74 machine that's been a good early start for him as well jeremy in that riley run leash year Really good run for Gar in the second. Yeah, he's really charging up there, isn't he? And, uh, you know, that uh, Riley Motorsport team had a huge amount of success in the past. Uh, they've won six Michelin Endurance Cup championships over the last uh, eight, nine years. Uh, that's more than anybody else. They've won four in GT2. They've won the last two in LMP3. So not very much the team to beat, particularly in the long-distance races. Lap traffic for the leaders coming up this time around. As we continue to work the opening moments. Of this year's race. Nice to see that we're settling in to a bit of a groove after that early caution for the TDS racing car and the it was the tower motorsport car wasn't it all dealt with very quickly 107.9 fm around the circuit sirius xm 207 and around the world in audio at rs2 via the rs player video via the live video tab at imsaradio.com i'm reliably involved by the techs who've been working hard behind the scene that imsa 
Live.TV is working as well. There's also a selection of in-car cameras if you want to look at those two as AO comes through the pit lane to serve its 10-second stop and hold. Not been and the start of the race they want to do no, this. not at all. Tower has just gone back out again. Did we get to the bottom of that, uh, Shea Adam? What was the uh, the issue with that car? That's Joe Bradley's end of things, John. Oh, sorry, Mr. Bradley, did we get to the bottom of that uh, number eight tower machine? We saw it stopped uh, and then going again. What was the uh, the cause of that? Uh, not, uh, not aware of that at the moment. I'll go back and recheck. The team had all left the pit box and were headed back to the garage, which was where the car was uh, recovered to. So I'll go and follow that up. Thanks, Bradis. Hello to Jules Boyce watching and listening in London, just after a minute past seven there at IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch. Let's hope we get a nice long green flag run here. That's what Jeremy and I and the teams like. They, they want some long run competitive data here. Talking to the Porsche, three of the Porsche drivers a moment or two ago in the outstanding Porsche hospitality suites uh, overlooking uh, the Speedway turn one and uh, Mathieu Jaminet, Manny Campbell and Michael Christensen all saying, yes, we've had a lot of time, but we've not had enough time. They're still not really dialed into the low temperature tyres. And this is consistent with what we're hearing from the other manufacturer drivers as well. We, I do really feel, Jeremy, and, and I, I kind of like this. Nick Damon always says uh, in Formula One when there's a change of regulation, that, that things happen um, oddly and somebody will get it very wrong and somebody will get it very right. It seems like all the GTP manufacturers have got it pretty right, but there's still clearly quite a lot of data and knowledge for these guys to pick up at this race. And we start with a 24-hour race. This yeah. is not a four-hour little potter around, is it? Ooh, no, it's not. They're side by side across the start finish line there. The battle for fourth, uh, third position, Felipe Nasser and Ricky Taylor, absolutely side by side in amongst the GT traffic. I think the Porsche was just about able to hang on there, Felipe Nasser, but only Mike. just. Boy, that was, uh, that was uh, an interesting <laughs> moment. Uh, so, update on the tower uh, number eight in LMP2. That car is back out on track. It was an ECU. They simply uh, just swapped out a new ECU for the old one, and the car's back out and running sweet. Thank you, Joe. Well, that's the P2 car. We were, you know, we're expecting issues and electrical gremlins for the cars at the front of the field. Those are pretty well known. They have had a, a little change. They've lost about 50 horsepower, uh, although IMSA will be looking at that before Sebring. Uh, Quite frankly, because the GTP cars, I think, Jeremy, are faster than everybody expected at this stage in their development. So there may be a bit of power going back to the P2s after this race. Yeah. Uh, oh, Blomqvist is carving through this traffic like it's a police chase. He is, but last lap around was a 138.3. The previous laps were, were in the 36s. So it cost about two and a half seconds on that lap, working his way through that traffic. Uh, but uh, again, you, you've got to... We talked about it early on, you talked about it already, the Porsche keys to the race, you've got to be patient. Uh, losing a couple of seconds here or there uh, in traffic is not a big deal at all. There's three, at least three wide coming around turn four there as the, uh, the, the bright sort of gold and black Cadillac with Sebastian Bourdais at the wheel of the second place car number zero one was right up against the wall, passing two or three GTD cars at the same time. They were kind of side by side as well. This is really interesting battle here. Uh, so we're, we're now, uh, this is 12 laps completed by the race leaders. I'm expecting the first stint to last uh, somewhere around about 20, around about 30 laps or so before we see the GTP cars on two pit lane. Uh, and of course it's with the hybrid systems on these cars, it's not so much fuel that the teams are concerned about during each stint. You have a specific amount of energy that you're allowed to use, be that energy from the uh, internal combustion engine, the traditional motor, or the electrical power from the hybrid motor as well. And you have a, a th that, that is a set amount of power, or energy, I should say, that you are able to use during a stint. That is mandated. If you overstep that mark, then there's a penalty, and a hefty penalty at that. What I'm getting at here is, 
when the cars make their first pit stop, it will not necessarily be because they're out of traditional fuel. They might, they were, may well be a considerable amount of fuel left in the tank, but they've used up all their energy. Uh, 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 and so it, the, the strategies for on the pit lanes are going to be very different to what we've seen in the past for the GTP teams. Jeremy Shaw and John Heindhoff on the fifth floor as the number six Porsche of Nick Tandy now has to pick its way through the traffic down into turn one with a whole gaggle of cars ahead of it. It's fifth place for the man from Bedfordshire at the moment. Picking up his new company car when he gets back. Reliably formed as a GTS Cabriolet 911. Now very nice. Been very successful with Nick Tandy racing down through the years in the Carrera Cup GB. Over 100 victories now for Nick and the rest of the team. And I know that the Nick Tandy racing guys will be tuned in back in the UK with the other Nick. <laughs> he runs it when Nick Tandy's not there. Watching the boss, as they always call him. And he, at the moment, is holding down a solid fifth position. Yeah, he just got back past uh, Pipo Durrani. Those two have exchanged places already twice during this race. Uh, Durrani got past Nick Tandy uh, on, uh, on lap five. A couple of laps ago, Nick Tandy re returned the favour and got back past the uh, wheel and engineering Cadillac, car number 31. So, uh, in fact, the last couple of laps, he's pulled away a fair bit as uh, Pipo... Uh, I either had some problems with the traffic or he's managing his energy usage. That's something that the, the drivers are going to have to be very, very much aware of during this race. And we don't have any uh, readout on this virtual fuel tank as the leader goes across the line again. So this is something for IMSA to keep an eye on. Same as we don't know which tyres are on the car. We could have that information because it's all on RFID. Uh, chips, but uh, it's not given to us for, I think, perhaps, I think it would give uh, advantages to the other teams. A mistake there by Ricky Taylor, a rare one, at turn one, and he's dropped a couple of places. Ran long in the number 10, Koninga Minolta Angera was in fourth position, and I'm pretty sure at least Nick Tandy went through. So Tandy, I think, up to fourth position now. If not, he'll be very close to the back of that black and blue Acura. Here's Ben Keating down into turn one. Just to our right, turns in, got the Eel Porsche ahead, not the start of the race that they wanted. For that number 80, PJ Hyatt machine, if you missed the story. During the week, the swap shop colours are back. PJ owns the original 935 Porsche swap shop. What a lucky man he is. And Gunnar Jeanette, whose father engineered that car, was driving it for some promotional purposes uh, in the on the Thursday of Raw Week, so I got to see them both together running around. That was yeah. any time somebody fires up a 935 near you. Near, that that's a special day. Yeah, very cool cars those were, and uh, they were racing here. Uh, there were some of them still racing the first time I came here. Yeah, a long time ago. Uh, but uh, look, I feel bad for for. Uh, that AO team having the, the problems early on, but is that a little bit of a karma? The interview he gave to, I think it was, well, before the start of the race, he was, he was rather negative about the uh, balanced performance that uh, IMSA had given the, the Porsches. Is that, is somebody upstairs had a word with uh, that team and <laughs> dealt them a problem early in this race. I don't know, but uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't care for that negativity, quite frankly. Uh, well, I thought uh, that was rather sad. Uh, uh, the, the, the Porsche, line on that and, and if you haven't keep, I, I accept there's a lot of people who uh, you know will watch this race like you watch Le Mans and, and, and don't keep up with all of the stories the Porsche 992 GT3R is a brand new car like the Ferrari 296 and therefore IMSA are still collecting data on it they decided to go relatively conservatively with their settings for that car conservative for the settings on that car the car is the same weight as the car it replaces. It has a slightly bigger engine, 200 cc's more, which doesn't produce any more power, but it does deliver its power a little bit differently. 
Well, they have a five millimeter reduction in the restrictor. And that is causing some problems at the top end and pulling out the corners. One or two drivers you were talking to from other cars, Jeremy, we see particularly out of the International Horseshoe and down at the West Horseshoe, those Porsches seem to be, if not tied to a post, at least struggling a little bit. It's an ongoing situation. And the official Porsche line, as well as many of the other teams, is, look, we understand that it's an iterative process. We have full confidence in IMSA to gather the data, and they gather a lot of data. I spoke with somebody from one of the Porsche teams, I'm not going to say who this was, says IMSA are the gold standard. It's not working for us right now, but IMSA are the gold standard of setting their BOP in terms of it being a empirical process of data collection. Of course, they're disappointed right now, but they are going to race and they're going to see where they are at the end of this, and then there'll be a meeting and they'll be talking about it. And that's exactly why I was so disappointed going to Jeanette's uh, comments down there. Uh, they were uncalled for, particularly at that stage. You know, that's, we're, we're in race mode now. Uh, we've got, you've got what you've got, make the most of it, do what you can. Run what you brung, baby. Absolutely right, get on with it. And it's, I, I realise that these are million dollar commitments for these GT3 cars, for the Porsche customers, and so do Porsche as well. But let's see how it all shakes out for the rest of the season. It's a big race. It's, it is, it's an unfortunate factor as well as a great one that we start off with one of the biggest races and the longest race of the IMSA World of Tech Sports Car Championship season. When new cars come along, that's always going to cause talking points, yeah. let's say. Yeah, quite. Leader is out front, lights are on flash. <laughs> this is Tom Blomqvist, stretched it out about four seconds again. As he comes down into turn one, Goes through and now starting to pull his way through the LMP3 car. He's got the Sean Creech Motorsport leader right in front of him. Just past Fred Hordad in the number 55 LMP2 car. Now Nico Peño in the Sean Creech car. They had an engine issue early on in the week and it was changed. Not a brand new engine, but an engine change. God, Tom Blockfist really on it here. Has to be, though, because Bordet is pushing just as quickly. Lost a couple of seconds, though, last time around. Nick Tandy and Philip Nasser. Nasser in third in the number seven. The way to tell the Porsches apart, by the way, they're both that uh, red and pinstripe. The seven car has the black pinstripes and side stripes. The six car has the white. That's the more, for those of you my age, that's the Salzburg Porsche. Colours, if you go back a few years. Ricky Taylor in the number 10 is right with Tandy for the second of the Acuras. Then the two Cadillacs, and it's the Pipo Durrani driven wheel and engineer and Action Express car in sixth, the head of the Cadillac racing car in seventh. Then eighth and ninth, the two BMW M hybrids there, another three seconds further back down the road, Philip Eng and Nick Yellowly could be a little bit of a case, as it was last year for BMW with the new BMW M4s. A little bit of softly, softly catchy monkey. Side by side for fourth position through the tri -oval. And they go either side of the AO Porsche. My goodness me, no, that was the Fab Buddha car, wasn't it? The uh, Happy Buddha car, the Kelly Moss racing machine. Cool. The other red and white car, and they're still side by side. This is the battle for fourth position, and Nick Tandy has had to give best there to Ricky Taylor, recovering after an uncharacteristic error by Taylor a couple of three laps ago. Who was in the Kelly Moss racing car as they went through? I think they're still screaming into the radio even now, half a lap later. <laughs> Yikes. If you've ever had that happen to you, where two large prototypes go either side of you, the only thing you can do is keep the steering wheel exactly where it is and keep your foot on the throttle for as long as you dare. They were coming into a braking area there. That was outstanding driving. Who did start the Kelly Moss racing car, actually? Which one was it? Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah. I, I think it was Blake Morland. I think it was Blake Morland's car. So he's got a bit of experience. Yeah, well, yeah he's not driving it. That's, that's uh, it was, so it's the two gentlemen drivers who are... Who are driving? It's uh, it's it's 
either David David Bruley is number 92 car and Alan Metney in number 91. I didn't see which one it was to be honest. Well, that's interesting. And Blake and Morland qualified that car. Yeah, well, for some reason they've changed the rules there. You don't know? right. The the, uh, the qualifying driver doesn't have to start anymore. I don't know why they've done that. To be honest, like, it's, right. I, I liked it before, and um, I thought that was only if you put a bronze driver in, you could yeah, swap him out. But never mind. Moving on. Cadillac of Pete Durrani looking at the back of Nick Tandy's Porsche now. That's the one with the white pinstripes. As they head through and down to the International Horseshoe, so-called, because of Turn 3, if you like, but it's got the flags of all the nations represented here around it, and they are showing us that the wind is blowing behind the cars down into Turn 1 and onto the nose of the cars going into Turn 7, for which read from the drivers and the teams, few, because when it blows the other way, from the west end of the circuit, it makes the turn into turn seven, particularly for the prototypes, very difficult indeed to the Le Mans chicane. In the GGD Pro, that uh, Aston Martin's moved up well, hasn't it? Ross Gunn now is onto the tail of Maro Engel. That's the battle for GGD Pro, and they're ahead of all the GTD cars, uh, about six seconds behind uh, Engel and Gunn in the Mercedes and Aston Martin, respectively. So it's number 79 and 23 is Mike Skeen in the leading now GTD car. He's overtaken the pole sitter in that car, it's got Fabian Schiller in car number 75. So it's Team Kortoff Motorsports that leads the way in GTD. And then kind of a you know, big, old, big old train behind those two. But the Aston Martin certainly has, uh, has moved up the order very quickly in the early stages of this race. That's the heart of racing GTD Pro car, number 23 of the Englishman Ross Gunn. Here's a battle on the tri-oval and into turn one. This is going to be very tight. There's a touch there. Durrani hits the back of the six Porsche. Nick Tandy pulling over to take the racing line and Durrani running into the left rear corner of the Englishman. Oh, now, how will race control see that? Six of one and half a dozen of the other. Perhaps just shows how unsettled those cars are over the transition. Durrani comes down pretty early. Tandy, though, he's still ahead. Ooh, pick the bones out of that one, race control to our left. Was there any overlap? Possibly. Was he alongside? Absolutely not. No way. And no. both of the cars end up off the circuit. And it's good driving and good luck from Nick Tandy that there wasn't m more damage there. That could have pitched him sideways into the wall. That's actually a bigger hit yeah. than I thought it was, yeah. having seen it from the onboard. I think Tandy's... Look, I, I, I think Tandy I, can go for the inside there. I think he's still got the line, Jeremy. Oh, absolutely, he? has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T totally agree there. I mean, if there's going to be a penalty called on that, um, then it would be certainly on uh, on Durrani rather than Tandy. They might get away with it. Uh, it's if, under review. If, if Durrani had made, yeah, is it? Yeah, okay. If if Durrani had made the pass, then for sure there would be uh, some consequences. They might let it go in that they're both able to continue as long as there doesn't seem to be any major problems for either of them. It cost them a couple of seconds. But, uh, yeah, that was a, an un unnecessary move, I think, there for people to run. Particularly as we are 40 minutes into the race. Remember our Porsche keys to the race, traffic management and patience. That includes uh, with class cars as well as cars that aren't in your class. Sheer Adam has been watching the Ferrari 296 GT3, the blue and chrome car, Giorgio Cien, uh, Serna Giotto. There's never a bit of damage on that car, Sheer. There's quite a bit of damage. Uh, the floor was flapping as he came through the trioval the last time. It looked as if there's bumper damage as well. And the Chetelar mechanics still sitting, but they are aware that there's an issue with their car. They're just hoping that it hangs on and doesn't cause a debris caution. And, uh, and Durant did get past Tandy, didn't he? So uh, uh, he might be asked, at the very least, to give that position back again. We'll have to wait and see. 21 laps completed there for our race leader. Tom Blomquist leads by about five and a half seconds over the uh, Cadillac of Sebastian Bourdais in second place. That's the car number 01. Uh, Philippe Nasser only a second or so behind him in the best of the Porsches in third place.
at IMSA Radio if you want to get in touch with us. Always good to know where you're watching or listening for. Let you know what happens with that incident involving Durrani and Tandy. 5.7 seconds, Blomqvist over Sebastian Bourdais. These cars, these GTP cars through traffic are absolutely stunning. The GTD cars is as, are as quick as they've ever been here, and yet they looked, they really do look like they're chained to a post when the leaders go through. Extraordinary stuff. Jordan Pepper in the bright green 63 Lamborghini working his way through traffic. Got a bit of a battle going on with the GTD. Ferrari of Daniel Serra. Delighted to see Giuseppe Risi back. So Iron Links versus Risi Competizione, the Pennzoil sponsored car. Uh, and that uh, Risi Competizione team having won last year's uh, Michelin Endurance Cup in GTD Pro. Good effort by them. They just concentrate on those long distance races last season. I think they've already committed to doing the same again this year. So that's great that we will see that Ferrari on a regular basis, at least for the long distance races. The, um, and Giuseppe Risi telling us at Motul Patil Le Mans, he was investigating getting hold of a 499p, which is the new Ferrari prototype, which shares the engine actually with the new 296, the just under three litre V6 machine, 499 cubic centimetres per litre, hence 499p. And uh, yes, please, I think is the answer to that from all of us sports car fans. I've said it before, I'll say it now. Uh, even among the teams in the pit lane who have to compete against them, uh, Ferrari and Giuseppe Risi, particularly Giuseppe Risi's Ferrari, they are a popular team. Probably everybody else's second favourite team at the very least, even if you've got to compete against them. Two BMWs running in lockstep, the BMW M Hybrid V8, Philip Eng and Nick Yellily. Barely a tenth apart as they work through traffic, as in comes the EF Corsa number 88 LMP2 car, Francois Perotto and Eric Lux also coming in in the number 51 Rick Ware Racing car. This all looks a bit standard. Yep. So is that about right, Jeremy? You're happy with that? Yep, absolutely right. We are uh, 23 laps uh, completed uh, by uh, the or 22 laps actually completed by the LMP2 cars. Uh, yeah, they, they, they will go longer since than that once the race gets underway, but they've, they've already done two pace laps, of course, before the start of this race. I would, I'm, I'm anticipating LMP2 since once the race really gets going to be around about 25, 26 laps. So 22, yeah, it's on the conservative side, but you want to make sure uh, you've got your consumption right. I mean, this is these are conventional cars. There's no hybrid technology in LMP2. They're good old-fashioned um, good old-fashioned cars uh, and uh, yeah. yeah there's no trickery to those uh, but uh, they have been slowed down a little bit they're, they're using a lot less revs than they were a year ago they're mandatory and there's a little bit more weight wow. 10 kilograms of weight also onto those cars and also the fuel fill is taking a very very long time that has been slowed down also by yeah. 10 seconds yeah and they're, I've, they're, I've just noticed they're, that yeah, now their minimum minimum pit stop time for full full fill was 30 seconds same as the dpi cars but both of those categories now up to 40 seconds this year because the uh, in the uh, in the gtp cars the new top level cars they have a lot more fuel on board right. than they had one year ago uh era were in as well there by the way with drive where all three of those cars just taking fuel no michelin tires uh, and joe bradley is uh, waiting for the leader in lmp2 which is now in the pit lane joe yeah i've got him and it's again all only fuel for the number 52 the br1 matheson motorsport car coming in um i'm a little bit puzzled because they're allowed to change tires however they haven't got an unlimited stock, have they? They've got a limited stock of tyres, so they've got to stretch all of those sets, not just through the race, but through the week, practice, qualifying, etc. It's been fuel for all of the LMP2 cars down on my end of the pit lane, but four tyres going away with George Kurtz and the Crowd Strike 04. And we've got four tyres as well for Stephen Thomas in the number 11 after that off track incident right at the beginning of the race. They are waiting on the fuel, and the last part of the pit stop being the fuel means that TDS Racing has done their job to perfection. And the 55 Proton car, different strategy. This end, same as down Shears end up. The 55 Proton LMP2 entry, they're going for tyres as well as fuel. 
absolutely standard stops then for those uh, LMP2 early stoppers, although a little bit of a difference in strategy, uh, which is very interesting at this early stage. As the guys say, uh, tyres are not an infinite resource here. Uh, and indeed in GTP, two different compounds of uh, Michelin Slick tyre. I'll tell you more about that uh, later on. Hello to Dennis Foster, who's tuned in, watching and listening on IMSA Radio.com in Sound and Vision, three hours south of Lesoth. And we have a McLaren coming in. This can't be a standard stop. Tyres coming over the wall there. And driver change going on as well. That looks like Brendan Reeves' helmet. Uh, I believe he was getting aboard this car. Did he? He didn't start it. No. Uh, they are doing fuel and tires. They are slightly scuffed tires, but they are still new Michelin rubber. And we are waiting on the driver change to complete before they drop the car off the air jacks. It's got gullwing style doors, so if they were to drop the car off the air jacks, it would knock the mechanic trying to help install Brendan behind the wheel on the head. Now the fuel probe comes out about five seconds before the car actually manages to get rolling. Brendan with a brief stall, and there he goes out into the race. That felt a bit early, but it also meant that they were able to get in and do their stop before their P3 brethren on either side of them come in to do their class stops. And with the pit stops for all those LMP2 cars, the LMP3 cars just have not yet made their first stop. I don't expect that for another uh, few laps yet. They should be able to do you know, 32, 32 laps or so. So another five or six laps before they should come onto pit lane. Uh, and as a result of that, the LMP3 is ahead of the LMP2 cars. Nico Pino for Sean Creech Motorsports. That's the car that started on the pole position in that class. He's pulled away to about 10 seconds over D Dakota Dickerson for Andretti Autosport in car number 36. Gar Robinson uh, is running in third position in car number 74. And he's got his mirrors full of Cameron Shields in the uh, South Florida run Performance Tech Motorsports car number 38. It's the top four in, G in LMP3. At IMSA Radio dot, uh, at IMSA Radio rather, if you want to get in touch with us, IMSA Radio dot com for all of our pre-race coverage and the roar as well available for you. If you feel you need to take a break from this, but why would you? Uh, take us with you on any device with the uh, RS player. RS2 is the home of IMSA Radio, and of course, if you're here in the US and moving around, Sirius XM two zero seven flag to flag coverage. Uh, no blocks, no breaks on the audio and flag to flag coverage on the World Feed TV outside the US. A couple of position changes in GTP up into third place now in the number 10 car is Ricky Taylor. He's got past Philippe Nazar's Porsche last time around. So the number 10 car now in third position. Also uh, a couple of places farther back, Alex Lynn in the number 02 Cadillac has got past Nick Tandy's Porsche, car number six. I hope there's no damage to that number six car after that incident he had with Pippo Virani. We didn't, did we see any notification about what the stewards decided on that, John? I'll check that for you, but I haven't seen anything yet, no, if I'm honest. Certainly hasn't been any any penalties. Uh, in apparent. fact, no further action no, really? okay, well, came in a couple of minutes ago. Wow. Okay. So, racing incident noted, though. I mean, it's been looked at, so um, I like that system that we get from IMSA where we find out what's been happening. Coming down to 55 zero minutes gone. Let's take a quick look at the class leaders. Tom Blockfist out front by seven and a half seconds. Nico Peño for Sean Creech still leading before the pit stop start there by 10 seconds in LMP3. And actually up in the 10th position overall because the P2 stops. Ben Keating has made his first stop in the 52. Wins Oringer. And he leads LMP2. The GTD Pro cycling to the front now of the GT category. Maro Engrel for 79 Mercedes, the WeatherTech car. Ross Gunn for the 23 Harter Racing. Aston right on his tailpipes. And Antonio Garcia in the final season for the Chevrolet, Chevrolet Corvette C8R in its current form. Its replacement was unveiled here yesterday, the new Z06 GT3. And uh, leading in GT, Daytona standard, Mike Skeen for Kortov, ahead of a similar 
AMG GT3, the 75 Sun Energy One machine of uh, Fabian Schiller with in third place Karl Marcelli for the Rick Ware Racing Acura. The number 93 car. And uh, obviously all those drivers have been in from the start. Let's go down to share Adam, more pit stops. Uh, we've got the 47, Chetelor racing Ferrari, and the service is done, but the crew is being made to work on the back of this car. The floor was flapping as it was going through the triable on several different occasions, and one of the struts on the right-hand side that was meant to be supporting it is no longer there. Waiting for the all-thumbs-up from the official Jim Fowler, who says, yeah, it's all right to keep going for now. If it gets any worse, they will need to come in and do a bit more repair work on it to try and hold it in place. But in the meantime, Chetel are racing, doing a driver change, putting, uh, I think that was Roberto LaCourt, behind the wheel of the 47 Ferrari fuel and four new Michelin tires. Uh, yeah, the 93 uh, uh, NSX, by the way, I was trying to look at two things at once. I realised I said Rick Ware Racing, and I know, in fact, it's the race's edge with WTR car. Sorry, trying to look at two different parts of the time and screen at the same time. Uh, what uh, we have learned in the last uh, 51 minutes or so is how good Tom Blomqvist at this number 60 Acura is. We know, Jeremy, that they were given the uh, priority from HPD to go out and get that car quick over a single lap. Well, they've done that and they've made it decent on a long run as well. Tom Blomqvist able to pull away almost at will from a quality field of drivers in that number 60 Acura ARX 06. Yeah, but that gap is very much stabilised. Uh, it, it, it was six seconds on lap 17. Uh, it's six sec seconds now, absolutely, exactly, 6.000 on lap 29. So uh, it, it very um, closely matched in the last the 10 laps or so between those two. Uh, behind, behind them, they've strung out a little bit. Oh, we've got uh, GTP pit stops. Joe Bradley sees the first competitive GTP pit stop under green flag conditions. Yeah, make it on, everybody. The very first competitive pit stop in the GTP era is the 02 Cadillac. And make further notes that it's only taking on fuel. It's a bit of a wipe down around the headlights and certainly the windscreen. No tyres, no driver, just fuel. And it is taking a bit of a while. We get a thumbs up from the crew member at the back. He's cleared out all the ducts. We've got nothing. So Alex Lynn continues in that car. And leaves on the starting Michelin tyres. No engine noise there, as you notice, as it pulled away from Joe Bradley. You didn't hear that on his mic. That's because it takes off under electric power only. That indigo blue front end into the Cadillac Racing livery moving out now the engine has fired up and will continue now to take it out of the pit lane they, they can leave the pit box on either electric power or uh, internal combustion engine power all of the teams uh, i think are, are planning to start on electric power what, what actually do, these cars don't have onboard starters nor do they have alternators anymore they have the the uh, motor generating unit, the MGU, which produces that electrical energy that's regenerated from when the car is braking uh, from uh, sensors on the rear axles. Uh, and then the, when the car is dropped off the jacks, uh, the driver keeps the clutch pulled in, engaged uh, as he leaves the pit box under electrical power. Then when the car reaches uh, a set speed, he releases a clutch, clutch and effectively the engine bump starts itself and then carries on under regular power from there on. Really interesting. Uh, Nick Damon has joined us in the pit lane. Hello, Nick. Welcome to the 61st Rolex 24 Daytona. And you have the LMP3 leader making his first stop. Yeah, Sean Creed from Motorsport have just uh, completed the service. They've also changed drivers. Nico Pino's hopped out, so he was just in for that first 40 minutes, but they've, uh, he's done the job, kept the car going. I was uh, fighting my way through this incredibly crowded uh, tent city. Um, and in doing so, I couldn't see who got in. But I can tell you, it's not uh, um, a couple of other drivers. Just in case he needs something to chat. I'll try and grab a word with him, shall I? In a moment. You know? That was a, uh, a, a, a best result of all for that first stint, wasn't it? Straight into the lead of the class. Well, it was a uh, good start, of course. No many incidents in the beginning. I think we are doing a good job, of course. It's just the beginning, one hour. Almost one hour in, but a long way to go. I, now Lance is in the car. 
everything is feeling good, the car is quick. We, so yeah, just keep doing the things as we practice and let's see how things go. Is the rest of the field taking things calmly? Is everyone being sensible? I think it's everyone is taking it calm in the first few hours. You know, it's a long race. Everything can happen and the idea is to keep the car as complete as possible towards the end. So yeah, so far it's good. There's a lot of margin left uh, there. So yeah, pretty happy with it. And I think, of course, everyone is taking it easy in the beginning. Thanks, Nico. Down to Joe at Porsche Motorsport. Yeah, the number six has just been in. Nick Tandy brought that car in. Now, remember, the number six Porsche has been... Uh, th that was the car involved with a little bit of uh, contact. However, the left-hand rear corner showed hardly any signs. The tiniest of scuffs. The sort of scuff I could have caused with just running me boot over it. Uh, importantly, none of the damage at all to that area of the diffuser. It looked exactly the same as the right-hand side. So I think he's gotten away with that and just pulling out, as I was telling you that, is the number 60, of course, the Maya Shank car, the Acura, leading the race. That car has pit stopped and only took on fuel, which seems to be the trend down here. 25, 25 cars stopped on track, is it? That would be Nick Yellowly if that was the case. The, 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 the other car, the other BMW car number 24, that came in on the same lap as did Tom Blunkers to make its first pit stop. But uh, we're not quite sure where the other BMW is. It did not come into the pit lane. The sister car is leaving now, Jeremy. And that would be the 24 car, which had Philippe Eng behind the wheel. But we are a BMW down at the moment as we are just coming up to the first hour we'll have a full hourly update for you vp racing in race update coming in a couple of three minutes time as we start to get some of the gtd cars as well well if it's stopped jeremy it's behind the wall because i cannot see it anywhere on the circuit um where is where was the last where was the last sector the last sector was the third sector so has it come in it hasn't pitted so did it cut in behind the wall somewhere else joe bradley might be able to ask down there at rll bmw joe bradley is down there no sign of the 25 joe no the, i mean the team was ready uh, to receive it just like the uh, the sister car the 24 car that's been in and out and oh right I've, no, I've got it i've got it it's it's pulled off on the uh, far side of the uh, on the on the this side of the circuit, it's just in the cutout going into the back of the pit lane where the uh, where the Mazda pit uh, paddock was. So it hasn't made it to the pit lane entrance. Just see the back of the car sticking out now with the binoculars. Yeah. I was scanning around. I thought it must be pretty close to the end of the lap. So I, I'm not sure they can go and get that there, Jeremy, uh, because it's it's not. Well, is it behind the wall? Can they get assistance for it sitting there? It's not in harm's way because it, it's behind the... It's protected by the left-hand wall on the apron. But can, can they pick that up? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, there, there is an access. There's a, I'm not sure, there's a gate there. They can, uh, if, they, if they open the gate, they can probably pull it in straight directly into the garage area. But uh, other than that, no. Ouch. I don't think that will cause a yellow. No, it's it's not in arm's way, that's for sure. Well, fair play to Nick Yellowly, who does have the yellow helmet. Uh, there are some... Well, did it stop there rather than pulling all the way all the way in there, I suppose? I presume he was in good, contact it? with the pit lane. But So this then, the first problem in the new GTP category. Left-hand side door, the driver's side door is open for Nick Yellowly. I'm sure he's talking to the pits i mean to be honest it it, it it is it is very very honest racing that he hasn't just stopped that car on the track and brought out a yellow whilst they were cycling through it we'll get to joe bradley in a moment with some interviews from the drivers who've just got out of cars after the first stint but the number two cadillac of alex lean has just gone by sebastian bourdais that was a pass to, for position between the two Cadillac racing machines, that was for third. Uh, in fourth, then Seb Bordier, then Nick Tandy, who's managed to do his pit stop and get out ahead of Philippe Nazar. So the two Porsches have swapped around the way they were running.
But at the front of the field now, it is the two Acuras, Blomqvist from Taylor. And considering Ricky Taylor had a spin there, he's 10 seconds away from the leader, but second in the race. The two Acuras at the top of the field. Joe Bradley. Yeah, I've got a chance to talk to Russ Good, who's literally just handed over the heart of racing, uh, Aston Martin, to his teammate, David Pittard. Let's see if we can jump in. Ross, Ross. Oh, sorry, mate, I was just introducing you. Um, always the busiest time of a 24-hour is that stint. Yeah, for sure, it's usually the stint with the most cars, and uh, traffic, to be honest, wasn't too bad. I think the way they've slowed the LMP2s to, down, and obviously GTP are slightly slower than DPI last year, the traffic isn't so bad, so it's nice to have a nice, clean stint. We're doing OK. I mean, the wear and tear car is pretty strong. Uh, and we seem to have a good package as well, so just need a clean race, no mistakes, and should be all good. Did you change, did you, do you know if the team changed tyres on the car there? Yeah, we changed tyres, so we plan to do that every stint, unless there's a, a, a yellow that comes in, in halfway through a stint, but um, the tyres are holding up well, everything is going, going to plan so far. Thank you, thank you, Ross. Joe Bradley's going to go and have a word with RLL, Nick Yellowly is in uh, one of the special hybrid vehicle safety areas. Uh, it doesn't mean that he's got a hybrid issue, um, but potentially why nobody's near that car at the moment. There is a traffic light system on the machine, that uh, on the cars, that show whether it is safe to touch that car. So maybe that's what they're going through at the moment. So we've had the first hour. Let's take a look at the VP Racing Fuel in-race update. Pit stops for most of the classes now. Indeed, as I scan down our Alcabel timing schemes, and you can follow on as well uh, via the live timing Alcabel IMSA site. Uh, we'll start at the front of the field where Tom Blomqvist has barely been headed, I think, since the green flag in the number 60, Paul sitting car has never given up the lead, has led all 34 laps completed so far. 9.8 seconds behind in second is the Ricky Taylor car. Then the two Cadillacs having their battle, 0-2 from 0-1, and the one being pressured at the moment, in fact, just losing a place there. Sebastian Bordier and Nick Tandy, that's two spots Nick Tandy, uh, that uh, Sebastian Bordier's lost in the last two laps. Indeed so. He, he lost a place to his, to his teammate Alex Lynn on the previous lap and now to, uh, to Nick Tandy as well. Uh, did uh, we see those pit stops, whether one of them changed tyres and one didn't? Uh, we'll get that information from the guys. Good point down there. In sixth then, it's Philip Nazar for Porsche in the seven car. People to Rani, the 31 Cadillac. Wheel and Engineering car in seventh and eighth. The remaining BMW, the number 24 with the 25 car, Nick Yellowly sitting in the hybrid recovery area. In LMP2, Ben Keating leads from pole position from Francois Herault in second place in the, uh, the number 35 TDS racing car. There's another car that was off the circuit uh, earlier on as well. And then in third place, the AF Corsa, number 88, currently piloted by Francois Perotto in LMP3. It's 36 Andretti motorsport car that leads. Jared Andretti behind the wheel, having taken the lead from the pool sitting number 33 of Sean Creech Motorsport till Bechtelsheimer now behind the Ran 74 car and running an incredible uh, third position in his first LMP3 outing, first prototype outing. Uh, and as I say that, he pits, and uh, that car drops down. It's the 85 car that he's driving, rather. The Ranch 74 car is uh, Gar Robinson, who's just gone up into third position ahead of Sebastian Alvarez uh, in the number 43, which is the MRS GT racing car. GTD, it's the pro cars at the front for a change. Aston Martin's 23 heart, a racing machine ahead of Cooper McNeil. David Pittard, by the way, driving the 23 Aston. 79 Mercedes in second, then the first of the GTT standards is Mike Skeen for Kortoff, then it's the Corvette. The number three in GTD Pro with the red door squares. Jack Hawksworth now behind the wheel of the number 14. And making up the top six is the Acura 
Uh, and that is the racer's edge, number 93. Currently in the hands of Carl Marcelli. That is your VP Racing Fuels in race update. VP Racing, the official coolant of IMSA. Check out all of the details on Stay Frosty, keeping your engine cooler via vpracingfuels.com. So, Jeremy, first hour, uh, lots of penalties from that pit stop. But we'll see uh, two or three cars coming back down the pit lane, but the racing out front has been superb, and you've got to take your hat off to, Don Blanc to Tom Blomqvist, and indeed both of the Acuras, they clearly have the pace at the moment on the rest of the field with relatively temperate uh, conditions here. Uh, track temperature about 28 Celsius, 18 in the air. Good first opening stanza, isn't it, for those two Acuras? Yeah, it looks very promising for the Acura teams. Uh, Tom Blomqvist is his lead now 10 seconds. It was about around about six before the round of pit stops, because that was, was the number zero one Cadillac that was in second position. Then about three seconds back to the number 10 car, Ricky Taylor. Well, since the round of pit stops, Bourdais and that zero one car, they're slipping backwards, back to fifth place now. Uh, the gap between the two Acuras is about the same as it was before the pit stop, but there's nobody in between them now. So 10 seconds between those two, Alex Lynn, Next on the road in that number zero two car, the best of the Cadillacs, and he is just well a second or so uh, ahead of Nick Tandy in the best of the Porsches. So uh, Nick, uh, Alex Lynn, Nick Tandy, Sebastian Bourdais, Felipe Nazar in the car number seven and number 31 Cadillac of Pippa Durrani, they're all running fairly close together. And then there's a long gap back to Philip Eng in the surviving BMW, 41 seconds, and he's losing about a second and a half a lap since the pit stops. Let's go down to Joe Bradley, who might be able to throw some light on that BMW, which has now left the hybrid recovery area and has been pushed towards its garage. This is Nick Yellowley's car going back into the paddock garage. Brothers, what do you know? Well, I know as much as the team know, which is nothing at this stage. Uh, this is where they're going to find out. They, had, they were absolutely baffled as to why the car has stopped. The car has now been recovered. Uh, we see that car being pushed into the garage now, and now they go to work and fathom out why the car stopped. So at the moment, we, we, we haven't got a cause of why that car is in the garage. Well, that isn't good news. Uh, also, it obviously happened quickly, and Nick was advised to go to that recovery area, that isolation area. It's marked by yellow around the walls. The drivers were briefed on that from the GTPs. Um, carbon fibre conducts electricity. Um, we haven't explained this, really, because we haven't had to in IMSA competition in the past. Uh, carbon fibre conducts electricity, so um, if the car stops, and until they are absolutely certain that the hybrid system is safe, nobody can touch the car. There are very, very strict rules on what you can and can't do. We've seen it in the WAC, of course, for some years now, um, with... Uh, intervention vehicles turning up uh, with marshals with rubber boots and rubber gloves so they can't be grounded. And I think it was Spa last year when Johnny Palmer and I were doing the commentary on that. We had uh, uh, a small hatchback drove out with one of the technicians from Toyota Gazoo Racing with the, uh, with the briefcase of, uh, of redemption for the the car and the technician had to plug it all in, make it all safe. All of our rescue, recovery and marshals here have been given special briefings. Also all of the IMSA pit lane officials as well. And there is a colour-coded light system very visible on the GTP cars as to when the car is safe to get attention and to be touched from outside, so that's why Yellow League was sitting with the door open and nobody was going to push that car in because the car clearly wasn't quite safe. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there was a problem with the hybrid system, it just meant they couldn't uh, get through the system menus to make that safe to be allowed to be touched. So, at the front of the field now, the leader, mired in traffic, sitting at the International Horseshoe behind the number 78 Lamborghini, 
which is doing exactly the right thing and keeping to its line the Forte Racing powered by USRT machine. That's the Misha Goikberg, Loris Spinelli, Benja Heiss and uh, Marco Papelli car dealt with by Tom Blomqvist. Now coming down to turn six, extremely bumpy in the braking area for turn six. Number of drivers mentioned this to me. Turn six and seven, Porsche problem. And it's the seven of Felipe Nazek coming out of the international hairpin. Horseshoe, excuse me. That looks like that car is dead stick. He's He may still be on electric power. He's trying to get off the racing line, pulling to the right there. The lights are still on, white flag waving to show that there's a slow car on the track. An hour and 10 minutes in, and already two GTPs with problems. My goodness me, we wondered about the reliability of these cars, but this is early. This is very early indeed. Now, was there some contact, or is this a technical problem? Fraga came down the inside of the AWA LMP, and my goodness, it just stopped in the middle of the corner. Just yeah. cut out a really good driving by whoever was behind the wheel of that uh, prototype, not to just drive into him. All right, it's reset, three-fingered salute, control alt delete and Fraga is moving again and moving at pace. Heart-in-mouth moment for Penske Porsche Motorsport. And Alex Lynn back into the pit lane as well as work goes on for the 25 BMW M Hybrid V8, the side panels are coming off and investigation going on there in the paddock area. That looks like major work going in. Joe Bradley, uh, it seems two minutes ago that we had that Cadillac in. Yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I can't fathom that one. The O2 came in for only fuel, nothing else. A little bit of an inspection going on once they feel, of course. So I'll head down there and find out what that was all about. Because that, I was not expecting the O2 Cadillac in. That was the car that pitted for the very first, uh, very first of the GTP runners to pit. So that's out, that's not out of schedule, it's not on schedule, is it? No, uh, I, I, uh, did, uh, 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 did it take tyres there, Joe, from, from what you saw? Was no. that just fuel? No, 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 just just fuel. That's a trick. Yeah, that's what, that's yeah. what the baffling well, thing is. It's at half, because he, he was only in... Uh, uh, 11 laps ago. Right, OK. Thank you very much indeed. Were they expecting a caution, maybe, uh, for that? Not sure. Hello to J John Windsor in New Zealand. Uh, watching via Sky Sport there, John Windsor. And uh, hello to all of our world feed takers, including Sky Sport in New Zealand. Good to have you tuned in. IMSA Radio trackside with 24 hours of coverage coming for you. The start of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. 22 hours and 47 minutes and 26, 25, 24. Here in the States, by the way, if you're moving around and can't watch the NBC coverage, you can get our live feed on Sirius XM207. If you're not equipped with that, then pair your device to your car or get your headset on and get on to imsaradio.com, hit listen live, and RS2 is the home of IMSA Radio. Once again, this year, all of the IMSA events covered live for you. No blocks, no breaks for the audio outside the US, including Canada uh, and uh, pretty much the rest of the world. If you don't have a network TV deal, like in New Zealand, uh, then you can watch and listen via imsa.tv, our world feed, or imsaradio.com. Just click on the hamburger on the left-hand top of the page and hit live video. You can see that there. Also, in the UK, able now to watch on Viaplay on the Sky Satellite platform. It's a new affiliate for us if you're watching on that. Maybe you're a darts fan or a Scottish football fan. Well, that's part of your package now as well but you can still watch in the uk uh, flag to flag with no breaks via the world feed on imsa.tv and the video stream on imsa radio so plenty of ways to keep up with this season and this race at imsa radio if you'd like to get in 
in touch with us. Seventy nine Porsche in second place for G. TD Pro, which means that Mike Skeen has split the two. Oh, spin down at turn one. And uh, 51. that is the number 51 prototype. And who's behind the wheel of the Rick Ware racing car? That is Eric Lux. And that was uh, exit of turn one, two. Managed not to hit anything, just a bit of tyre smoke there in that distinctive white, purple, and green Biohaven car. And he has recovered. That would have got his uh, attention, I think. Another 15 minutes of racing has gone. Hopefully settling into a bit of a, pa a pattern. Still that 10 seconds between the two. Acura's at the head of the field. Seven seconds back to the chasing Cadillac of Sebastian Bourdais, who got uh, up to the sharp end of the field in a cracking start in those opening couple of three laps before we went yellow to start with. Then it's Tandy, another three seconds back. So respectful distances, Jeremy, between the top three or four. And those are the biggest distances we've seen. That 9.8 seconds on a single lap has been what has spread the whole nine-car field normally. Yeah, it has, certainly. Yeah, but uh, And this gap uh, between the two Acuras out front, uh, 10 seconds, so that's been the same now for... Uh, a long time, you know, since well before that first round of the pit stops. It's just that the uh, the cars that were in between them, or the car that was in between them, or car or cars, uh, uh, have now moved backwards. But uh, Sebastian Bourdais, having appeared to struggle a little bit on the uh, after his pit stop, now seems to be picking up his pace. He's maintaining the same sort of lap times as Ricky Taylor in the number 10 Konica Minolta Cadillac. Uh, so, excuse me, Acura. So the Cadillac of Sebastian Bourdais is running there in third place, quite consistently now ahead of Nick Tandy in number six. Then the number 31 car, that's certainly slipping back. Uh, Pipa Durrani in fifth position relative to the other cars. Then there's a big, big gap back to the uh, BMW of Philip Eng. Uh, 38 seconds it was this last time out, 39 seconds this lap. And then uh, behind him, the car that made another pit stop, that's Alex Lynn. Uh, and then Philippe Benazza, who seems to be back up to speed again. Last time around was a 137.2. It's within the second of his fastest lap of the race. So that car certainly running in the same fashion as it was before it ground to a halt out of turn five a little while ago. Rob Chalmers having been through a lot of HV, high voltage training at work over last year to a serious and grown-up level. I'm really glad to see provisions like the status light and recovery areas for the hybrid and at IMSA Radio. Oh, it's it's been taken very seriously. You'll be pleased to know, Rob. And uh, hello to Robert Bonza, who's tuned in. Cisco Scaramusa, all around Europe and the world. Matt Sparks, he says, will Porsche and Cadillac be a significant advantage going into Le Mans due to running at Daytona? Well, they've got competitive miles under their belt, but all of the manufacturers uh, have been doing acres of testing. So, and there will be plenty of WEC races, of course, including the 1,000 miles of Sebring before the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. The, on the Friday before the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. So, not sure, to be honest. They're all in roughly the same place. 7 a.m. in Australia. Good morning to Jesse Young. We'll be joining you, she and I, coming down for the Bathurst 12 hours next weekend to make up the 60 hours of race broadcasting that we'll have had on the Radio Show Limited network of channels in sound and vision in January to the first week of February. Good looking entry list for that as well. Steve Price joining us as well. Hello, Steve. Good to have your company at IMSA Radio if you'd like to get in touch with us. Uh, Nick Damon in the pit lane. Yeah, the uh, 21A, of course, uh, uh, Ferrari's come in completely out of sync. And 
just received some fuel. So I know who are playing tactical games at weather point, but they didn't. I thought the drive just came in, no obvious problems. Next door to the 21 is the Cetila 47 car uh, pit, and they are constantly oscillating about bringing the car in or not. When it goes past us at full speed on the banking going round oh. into turn one, it's making the noise like a. You go to, as, it, as, as something is banging against the floor, I think, as it goes down. So they're probably going to need to fix it, but of course, they sent it away without doing it last time. But there's a lot of, um, of argument about when they're going to bring it in. I'm probably they're going to try and make it wait until the, uh, the schedule stop. Thanks, Nick. Uh, it appears that there was a little assistance uh, for Eric Lux's uh, turn one. There was another car involved there. However, generally speaking, no harm, no foul. As it appears to be no damage. Our Porsche keys the race. Traffic management will meet patience earlier on. Try and break up the race into manageable chunks so you can get your head round at dusk. Midnight, dawn. We're in Gibbous Moon tonight, by the way. Uh, waxing Gibbous Moon tonight, excuse me. 13 hours, 16 minutes of dark. BMW RLL already having to adopt the we can fix it, adapt to survive mentality. Many laptops plugged in as we've just had a spin on the exit of the International Horseshoe for the Performance Tech Motorsport. Red, white, and black with a bit of yellow on it. Ooh. And uh, that car now pointing back in the right direction. John De Angelis. And we've not yet had to worry about the low temperature tyres, the 12 sets of SLT. They're not eligible to be used till 7 o'clock tonight, until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. You see the uh, HT tyres, the higher temperature tyres car, can be, uh, can be used any time. And we're seeing good longevity from these tyres into their second stint, and they have done qualifying as well, of course, at the front of the field, at the very least. Tom Blomqvist still leads. Don't forget, we'll be looking throughout the race, making notes for our BDO Nose Strategy Award. Announce that later on, so looking out for something that can turn the race in 24 hours. Joyous thing about 24 hour races, it's a bit like reading a book that's been written as you go along and you never know where the big plot twist is coming. So, Blomqvist, imperious at the moment at the front of the field, knocking out the lap times. Perhaps a, a little bit slower than what we might have expected. 135.6 is the best lap time. We're expecting lap times in the race around about high 35s to mid 36s. They've generally been a couple of seconds away from that in this second stint on the tyres. Yeah, they certainly haven't been as fast in the second stint as they were in the first. Uh, as you said, they, they were doing uh, uh, 35s and, and 6s through the first 10 or 12 laps. Uh, and then they fell down into, into the uh, 37s, and in this stint now, uh, no one's really doing any, any better than 37. So that's uh, certainly something to keep uh, an eye on. Uh, Wobble at 40 last time around for our race leader, Tom Blunkis. I think he had a bit of, tra tra bit of traffic on that lap, but it's still the gap from first to second between the two Acuras is around about 10 seconds. But certainly in third position, uh, Sebastian Bourdais, he's running a lot better now mm. than he was immediately after his first pit stop. Uh, and he's actually closing again on the Ricky Taylor Acura in second position. It's uh, less than six seconds between those two now. Uh, it was as high as 10. Klaus Backler in the driveway Faf Porsche. Still with plenty of plaid on it, you'll be pleased to know. It's a big crowd favourite. Uh, sitting in eighth in class and the best of the GTD Pro Porsches. 5 millimeter restrictor reduction for the new 992 on its predecessor. Costing that car uh, some drivability and top speed. Faf being entirely pragmatic about it earlier in the week when they found out there was going to be no further BOP adjustments. They basically did as little as they needed to to save the machinery and the spare parts for this weekend. Still very much a new car. 
from Porsche Customer Racing. The engine taken out to 4.2, which is as big as that flat six block could go. It's 4192 or one or something like that. But it literally cannot go out any further. A complete different philosophy for aero, etc., on that car because it's a new body shape. And the 992 versus the 991 race car having about as much in common as the 992 versus the 991.2 road car, which is nothing at all. Uh, I think possibly the only thing that is carried over are the racing wheels on that car. Uh, Nick Damon has moved down to pit in. Oh, and beyond pit in. Uh, I can see him lurking in the paddock. <laughs> You, you do a good lurk. I'm king of the lurkers, as you know. Yeah, I've come down to see what's going on with the 25 uh, BMW. And obviously what I was expecting to see was two or three computers plugged in and lots of people scratching their heads going, why isn't X talking to Y? What I'm actually seeing is a complete strip down of the rear of the car. Um, the floor has come off, the rear end's come off. This, the, the bits they're taking off, again, this, it's a new car, it's hard to tell, but the bits they're taking off look like it's in the middle of the engine, so not... So not the gearbox which is the back so i think it might be part of the hybridization which is where that would live but it's obviously a guess but it's a much more major strip down of the car i can see someone preparing a gearbox jack actually or what would be used as a gearbox jack would always be used to get the hybrid power out of course in that position um so this is a major strip down of the car it's not just a oh what, what's gone wrong control or delete what can i do They've lost some, I think they obviously lost total drive. There's two ways you can use total drive, as we know with these cars. If the hybrid goes, you can lose drive because it doesn't have other auxiliary power. But obviously the normal way you lose drive is a clutch gearbox or gearbox failure. But they're not looking at the drive shafts, they're not touching the gearbox. It's further ahead of that between the engine uh, and the passenger cell. Keep an eye on it, Nick. Thank you very much indeed. Hello to Dario Franchitti. Much missed here. I do remember many years ago, uh, in one of my trips here when I wasn't working, uh, sitting uh, with him and his teammates in the motorhome in the infield watching uh, the race unfold. Dean, thanks for tuning in. He's supporting Chip Ganassi Racing Teams as well. And he says, definitely a golden age for sports car racing. And there is a man who knows his motorsport, student of the sport. Dario, best to you and the family, mate. Hope you had a good Christmas. A new year. Back to Nick Damon, who's managed to find Nick Yellily, who was behind the wheel of that BMW number 25, when he had to bring it in to the uh, the hybrid recovery area. Nick, uh, simple question, Nick. It was going it was going pretty well. You were coming in and then you stopped. What happened? Yeah, so we were going to pit, I think, a lap longer than the 24. Um, and then a couple of alarms, and I got the call to go to the HV uh, centre. Unfortunately, so it seems like they, there's a potential hybrid issue. The engineering crew are now looking into it, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get things turned around sooner rather than later. And this is the sort of event that even if you lose an hour, it's still worth going out. You know, it's worth going out because it's a rolling test bed, then, isn't it? Yeah, that, and you never know. Every other car could also have issues. Oh, uh, have a go at the moment. Yeah, exactly. So everyone else is running the same kind of hybrid system. So yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. What's it like, you know, when, when drivetrains go wrong and it's a kind of a mechanical one, you can feel things going slightly, oh, that's not quite right, my gears have crunched. With this, it just works and doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. A, a red light comes on and obviously then you're not safe to continue running, so you have to park it and then there's analysis done by the engineers. Bad luck, hopefully you get some more running later. Yeah, thank you. Can I, can I get a point there for getting that right? It was a hybrid system. Oh, very good, mate. <laughs> Nick Damon. Uh, Nick Damon, who's... Uh, a keen, uh, a keen amateur me mechanic. He just loves tinkering with his old cars. And he has a penchant for old British Leyland cars. Uh, Triumph TR4A IRS uh, will be returning newly painted in uh, light blue to Nick in the next few months for him to tinker with a bit more. So electrical issues he's good with, in fairness, of course, of that era. <laughs> All joking aside, uh, new era, but new cars. And let's not forget, these cars, the, the majority of these cars have not been running even for a year yet. The Porsche was first on the track about this time last year. The other manufacturers coming in throughout 2022. Interesting. We may see a different type of endurance race here at the 61st running of the Rolex 24 Daytona.
coming down to another half an hour of racing completed in GTD Pro. It's David Pittard for Aston Martin and Heart of Racing, who leads GTD Pro and the GT class from in second by about two and a half seconds. The number 32 AMG GT3 of caught off and that is a standard GTD car. In P3, Jarrett Andretti now leads in the 36 from Gar Robinson in the 74. That's the Andretti car from the Ranch 74 bright orange car. And there is ooh, just half a second between those two, so they're having a bit of a scrap. That's good. LMP2, Paul Sutter, uh, Ben Keating's out, Alex Quinn is in. And they've got 21 and a half seconds between themselves uh, and uh, Francois Aveau in second place. Yeah, Alex Quinn's fast, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he, he's a uh, junior open wheel driver for, from, uh, from the UK, is uh, Alex Quinn. Uh, he's uh, been drafted into this team, which is 22 years of age, and from Truro and Cornwall, down in the uh, southwest. Uh, he, he's, he did one race meeting before in North America. He, he came across last year to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the road course event. Uh, had a one-off in the uh, Coupertage USF 2000 Championship, which he dominated. He won all three races. Really, really impressive. Uh, then went back to Europe, and uh, this is his... Uh, you know, he's ba back in uh, North America again now for his first sports car race. I think it's his first sports car race, certainly at this level. Uh, and uh, he has been uh, very, very impressive at the wheel of that PR1 Matheson Motorsports team car. And uh, Bobby Oradell, who is the team principal there at PR1 Matheson Motorsports, he's over the years brought on a, a, a lot of very talented young drivers. Scott Huffing, uh, of course, was part of that team for the last several years. He's now moved across with uh, Stephen Thomas into to TDS, but um, maybe Alex Quinn is uh, the next guy for Bobby Orgel to take under his wing. Joe Bradley with a quick update of a few recent pit stops. Joe, what have you seen? Yeah, LMP2. We've had a bit of a bevy of LMP2 pit stops. Uh, the EF Corsa Orica of um, Francois Perodo came in. He hopped out and handed the car over to his teammate Julian Canal. It was a pretty straightforward pit stop. And I did notice as well that the number 11, the TDS car, that also pitted. But I'm not sure what, what, what exactly happened there. I'm pretty sure they put tyres and fuel in, but I'm, I'm uncertain as to whether they changed driver. Stephen Thomas still in that car. Uh, Joe, thank you very much indeed. Joe Bradley and Nick Damon in the pit lane. Shit Adam, our third pit lane reporter. We'll have Peter Mackay joining us uh, on the fifth floor later on. He's been uh, doing some interviews. I talked to Hurley Haywood last uh, I saw him. The entertaining. Always entertaining. 50 years since uh, Hurley's famous victory, of course, for Porsche. Yeah, that's the Daytona International Speed, but 50 years. No, I mean, all right, it's before my time, but I, I can remember it being talked about in recent memory. Goodness sake. Mind. What was your first year here, Jeremy? 1980. 1980. Yeah, I'm a bit further behind you. 35 era. Randall Joost's team won the race. They were pretty good at that, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Reinhold always said to me, I remember him saying at Patina Bob when yeah, I'd rather be lucky than good. I said, it's all right for you to say that, Reinhold, because you've generally speaking been both of those things. Yeah. Very good preparation from Reinhold. So 22 hours and 27 minutes and three to one seconds to go. IMSA Radio live from Daytona International Speedway, 107.9 FM here at the track for the 61st Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. RS2 around the world via imsaradio.com and you can have us in your car as well if you Sirius XM equipped channel 207. You're moving around a bit, maybe you're a bit bandwidth compromised outside the US. If there's no TV deal in your country, and I, I do know that uh, the TV deal across some of the Nordic countries continues from last year, but if there's no TV deal, then you can uh, see our world feed TV via the live video tab on imsaradio.com or imsa tv on board cameras available on imsa tv as well 
in the UK, new for 2023 via play with the, the Daytona 24 hours, but that does not stop you following along without interruption on the world feed on the stream. Sky in New Zealand as well taking our coverage. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch with us. Tom Blomqvist just stretching out a little bit. It's around, been around about 9 or 10, now it's 11 seconds. At the front of the field. Yeah, but Ricky... Ricky Tate... Wait a minute. Sebastian Bordet now in second, second yeah, place. When, when that, so Ricky Taylor has dropped down to third. Well, that must have just to... happened. Well, no, I'm not sure. It was. It certainly wasn't on the last lap. I, I must admit, I missed that. Um, yeah, odd. That's odd because I guess it might have been on lap 50 because. That's weird because the, the, the gap between the second and third um, has been you know, reasonably constant for the last few laps. So I didn't see what happened with the number 10 car. Generally, I pay attention to things like that. I missed that one entirely. No. But yeah, so Sebastian Bourdais then in, in second position. He's certainly uh, been running really well in this stint because he was uh, five seconds behind or as much as eight seconds behind Ricky Taylor in the uh, number 10 car but the 0-1 of, of Sebastian Bourdais is now just 10 seconds behind the race leader so he has uh, relatively speaking been running really well in this second stint of the day and I would expect the leaders onto the, uh, they should be able to do another at least uh, three or four laps I think before they would need to come in having used all of their allowable energy uh, which is uh, a combination of e electric and uh, traditional fuel. And it's capped at 920 megajoules for those of you who know such things. I'm afraid I don't. 138.6, the lap time for the race leader, Tom Blunkis. He's continuing on his merry way. And again, the gap between first and second, just 10 seconds between him and zero one I reckon it must have been about lap 50 those, those uh, second and first place cars changed because on that lap the gap from first to second went from 11 till, till 12 and that's why I didn't put up a red flag for me because it wasn't that much but the gap from second to third went from nearly five seconds to two and a half so I think there must have been a problem maybe a spin of some sort on lap 50 for car number 10 with the Taylor also, yeah, he seems to be up to speed now also a moment for Alex Lynn the blue front at 02 at the Western Horseshoe a moment or two ago. He's rejoined. Still, these drivers getting used to this brake by wire system on the rear axle of these GTP cars. The thing that is most. So, for Alex Lindner, he's, he's now under pressure again from Felipe Nazar. That gap uh, was as much as 13 seconds. Uh, about 10 laps ago between the number zero 02 and number 7. It came down to about four seconds, and now, John, as you say, as a result of that uh, little... Incident at... Yeah, excitement for Alex Lynn. Uh, the gap's next to nothing. Meanwhile, the, uh, the, the, the remaining BMW is running pretty nicely now. Philip Eng, he's, he's... The gap uh, from him to the car in front, which is Pippa Durrani, really hasn't changed at all. Uh, through the life of this stint, so that, that bodes well for the BMW team. Uh, it was another uh, run on at turn one for Ricky Taylor that cost him that position, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, exactly as we saw early on when he lost the place to Nick Tandon. Oh, that one, yeah. Oh, that yeah, one, that's yeah. what you're talking about. You're yeah. Right, right, right. So he's done that again, and uh, thank you very much to those of you who have tweeted to say that. Quite a few of you sitting in the, in the grandstands down by there, more than a smattering of people. Look, it's, I'm not going to say it's a NASCAR crowd, but if we look out particularly to our right, there's a goodly set of fans and in front of us as well, furring down at the uh, braking area towards Turn 1. You can also see them coming out on the Turn 2 as well, uh, onto the uh, 
banking as well. Nick Damon, you have a Porsche in front of you. That's my first GTP pit stop, and it's uh, looking like it's a full service. The driver seemed to chuck. Well, well, I think it's the numbers of the 06 Porsche, the, the red one, uh, the 963. Now, they don't have full, they believe it was a full service with tyres. Weird thing was, I saw the driver, the driver actually got out, or just got in and got out again, like repositioned himself. I'm sure it wasn't, I'm sure it was a driver change. It was Tandy that was in it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously go back there and try and annoy him at some point if he is out the car, but it was a, a weird angle he got in, that's all I would say. But there it goes. It may have been another driver handing a drinks bottle over, so yeah, to do that just to confuse you. They're very generous, lovely people, aren't they? And if you look away and suddenly back, you can get very confused. That car's been uh, oscillating quite significantly on the banking. Uh, Nick Tandy did get out of the pit lane, and now Nick is on his way to have a, uh, a chat with him. Real compromise here, talking to a number of the drivers over the raw weekend, last weekend and again this week, about getting the car as low to the ground as you can, but you have a lot of vertical load on the car because of the banking here. And it's a real compromise to get that right. You don't want the car to be bottoming too much, but you do not want to give up any of the aero effect of the underbody on these cars. I'll just wait for Nick Tandy to get his race gear off so that Nick Damon can speak to him. So is that the first of the... So we're now into the first of the second round of pit stops with the 0-2 Cadillac and the 6 Jeremy coming in. Correct. That's right, and uh, a little bit earlier than I would have anticipated uh, for the uh, number six car, 27 laps. He did 30 on the first stint. Admittedly, uh, there were what, three laps of caution in that first stint. Um, but it, what's, what's another thing that's different for the pro top prototype class this year compared to last is that um, under yellow, they're still using quite a bit of their fuel to keep the car running. They're not using much electrical energy. Uh, so there's a bigger percentage of fuel versus electric of that total amount of energy that uh, they're allowed to consume between pit stops. It's confusing. I get, I get it. But um, but it's yeah. So it, it's it's pretty much an unknown, certainly for us, <laughs> even to some to some degree for the teams, as to how the yellows, the full course cautions can affect their energy consumption during a stint. There was a couple of people actually on Twitter at IMSA Radio having a debate about whether this is actually the most hybrid race cars we've ever seen in an international race. The only thing that would come close is the year when Nissan went to Le Mans with the GTR LM, um, where officially that, that would have been 11 that year, but the three Nissans didn't have a hybrid system bolted into them, of course, because it, it wasn't ready. So um, I think this ties it for sure. Uh, if you know different or better, at IMSA Radio, please. We started nine here. Uh, we should get some more before the end of the season. Thomas Loudon back was in the booth on... Was it Friday or Saturday? The head of Porsche Motorsport still targeting the end of April to get the customer cars to IMSA and WEC customers. It's going to make it tight for their customers. They won't get them before Spa, which was supposed to be the cut-off date for Le Mans competition. So it may mean that they won't be able to go to Le Mans. Sure, they'll get a waiver for that. They do have four-season entries for Hertz Jota Racing. And John Church, actually, running uh, the JDC car with my other car is a Porsche in on the side of that car. 
So Nick Damon has the 0-1 and the 1-0 coming towards him now. Get them the right way around, please. Well, the yellow one's the 0-1 and the blue and black one is the 1-0. Uh, they Ten are points. obviously having well a full service. It's driver change on both of them, so Sebastian Bourdais and Ricky uh, Taylor getting out. Also, we now have the wheel and engineering Cadillac that's coming in as well. That's a 31. So these three on very, very similar strategy. We won't get Alex Lynn in the other uh, Cadillac. Of course, he did a, a slash and dash. It's Jack Aitken getting into the car. Um, Pippa Durrani getting out, I can tell you that. The other's a bit too far away from his notice. Other piece of news, as the 01 came in, the Cessula 47 Ferrari 296 just drove in and went behind the wall. They've got a lot of bodywork to fix. Away goes the 01. So bad news for the uh, very attractive blue and uh, bright blue Ferrari. There goes the 10. I think that's Felipe Albuquerque on board, just to judge by the, the helmet being the colours of Portugal. A uh, little bit of a look at the front spitter of the 31. That was obviously where it had a little bit of an impact with the rear of Nick Tandy's um, Porsche. Uh, it is cracked, actually. The very front end of the spitter is cracked. As in comes the 7 Porsche. That's a 963. That's trundling into its stop. So, so interesting, everyone's only double into their drivers. I mean, those of us who are used to the uh, the, the previous hybrid era at, at Le Mans, we'd see five since we go, we see the, the three hours, 40 minutes uh, in the cars. But this is just uh, an hour and a half. It's quite warm, and of course, on the whole, your stints are more determined by tyre life, which isn't a massive issue. Uh, new set of boots on. Now, I don't, I don't think, and I'll take a massive gamble here because I, I came to it late, I don't think the 07 changed drivers unless it was the most lithe driver in the history of driving getting out of it. So I think the Porsche, so the 7, sorry, not the 07, I've got all American people, the number 7. Uh, so I think that stayed with the driver. And then there's this, this weird thing where the, uh, the fuel tank is attached to the uh, pump, but it's actually not pumping any fuel, it's just putting in virtual electric energy. It's very confusing, the new, the new refueling rules, but they're all just. Uh, but for, we had an hour and a half to explain what the point behind them, but they're basically sweeping everything up. And uh, in a minute, John, we're going to get the 24 BMW, which is the one of only two we haven't had with Alex Lynn in this major crowd of GTP pit stops. I'm very confused by that virtual energy replenishment thing. Uh, Renger van der Zander took over the 0 1. Uh, the 10 had Louis Delatraz in that Acura, and Jack Aitken has taken over Oops. the 31. A corner of car, which is leading GTD, is off at the Western Horseshoe, uh, and that was uh, the second best of the GT cars. Mike Skeen, uh, that's a, another unusual mistake for him. Now, did he jump or was he pushed is the question. Uh, he was. Oh, he's got damage to a little bit of a little bit of a damage to the right front. We'll watch that as Nick Damon has the leader, Tom Blomqvist, yep. in the Acura number 60. And Tom is getting out of the car again, many hundreds of yards away. So I can't tell exactly who's getting in at this moment. They're just cramming him in. The uh, full service uh, in front of me, right in front of my eyes, is the number 24 BMW. That uh, is had a full service. And now Gusto Farfus has got into that one, placing uh, Philip Eng. That's going away. That was a very standard stop. The BMW, which appears to have stopped hemorrhaging time now. The uh, leading Acura sits there, waiting to go, putting in pretend fuel or virtual fuel or imaginary electricity at the moment. And there it rolls. Quite a, a gentle exit. So they certainly aren't doing the, the full whoosh we used to see from the Toyotas a couple of years ago. But uh, they're safe and sorry. These drive trains, which of course, are heavily stressed and also very new. So the number 60 Acura heads out with, I think, Colin Brown think so. behind the wheel of that car. Uh, what a great thing it is, Jeremy, to see Colin getting his uh, opportunity with the manufacturer team. Long overdue, but my, what loyalty uh, he has had down through the years to the guys at court. So the court of car has recovered, and it was coming into the West Hairpin, Mr. Horseshoe, and he got a little bit sideways. He was sliding. I don't think he got hit, but it caused all kinds of consternation behind, including the leading LMP2 car with Matt, uh, with Alex Quinn behind it, the wheel of it, having to avoid, and the number 31 Cadillac with Jack Aiken behind it. Corvette had to go wide as well. The number three car had to take to the grass. 
just looked like it was a lazy spin, uh, to be honest. That's under review, but I don't think there was any contact there. Back to Nick Damon down uh, at the GTP end of pit lane. Pit yeah, lane. just uh, correcting my previous situation, obviously Felipe Nazar was incredibly lithe because he did jump out of the seven without me even noticing it. They're going to start doing mystery uh, changing of cut drivers. It's going to get very off my old eyes, I can tell you, before we end this race. Well, the left-hand front headlight, uh, the right-hand headlight, rather, is knocked out on the uh, 31. So maybe there was contact there. Or was that from the earlier incident with Nick Tandy? Well, let's find out. Nick Tandy and our Nick, Nick Damon. Yeah, it's just, uh, we're just uh, shuffling out to a bit of a... It's very packed at the back of the, uh, the Porsche Penske couch. Um, Nick, uh main talking point of that is when you got tagged by, uh, I think, by Peter Durrani. When we got ploughed into at Turn 1, you mean? Well, yeah, I mean, we'll say it was tagged. No further action. Did you have any, I mean, you were 97% past. How do you feel from your end? I mean, I just got driven into, you know. I'm, I'm, I, didn't blo I didn't defend into the corner. I drove my line and I turned into the corner on the brakes and just got driven into in the back. So, you know, if this is how it's going to be at the start of a 24 hour race and it's going to be an interesting interesting run but um yeah luckily we had no damage um got a bit of a flat spot on a tire but yeah it's an interesting start to the race of course it's tough with each age car and makes its lap time even though there's you know everything's supposed to be similar but honestly the variances between the cars is it's quite stark when you all run together so yeah can you expand on that? Is it, is it a case where what, what, one car's got better drive, one car's actually quicker down the straight? Yeah, exactly. And, and where where you make where you make your time, and where you make your time during the stint as well. It was like when the what was it, the zero one, I think it was, when they came out of the pits. Uh, I you know I passed him. We were, we came out of the pits together and we were quicker. And then towards the end of the stint, he reeled me back in and and took over. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was uh, lucky, yeah. The, the good thing is we, we didn't get in, into the wall down at turn one, but, um, and we're in the race. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, I can tell you, but it's fun. I was about to say, it's the first, the first stint of a GTP in, in competition. It's certainly delivered. You have one car break down, one car do a control lead. The rest you fighting like, well, vixens, let's break, say. Who broke down? Uh, the 25 BMW. Oh, right. See, I've got no idea what's going on. Your teammate had to do a control or delete. Did you know that? I didn't know that either. No, no. That's how much we get told. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be like this. This is the thing. It's like, why, you know, you don't have to smash into people on the first five laps of a race when we all got these kind of things that we're looking, trying to look after. But um, yeah, a long way to go, Nick. <laughs> uh, it's pretty obvious, though, despite everything, you're really enjoying the challenge, yeah? What you mean driving one of these cars around on a racetrack against other people that we're trying to beat? It's pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Uh, BMW penalty. Too many people working on the car for the 24 GTP. Uh, we've been able to uh, analyse that incident for the court off car. Uh, Johnny Palmer's been casting his eye over it uh, as well in our IMSA Radio race control area. Uh, definite contact, says JP. Uh, it's uh, not the number 31. Wheel and car's headlight out as well. So you can see the contact from Jack Aikens on board. So that's been looked at at the moment. People to Rani, forceful as ever. And uh, yeah, that headlamp is not working. In fact, it's, uh, it's been pushed back in through the wing and the LEDs are about to fall out as well into the pit lane for the BMW number 24. Yeah. That's not long been no, it, Jeremy. two laps ago only. Um, so the, we put Augusto Farfus in that car when it came in, didn't we? Yeah. But he's, he's on his way out that, again now. Oh, that's, just... his, no, that's his drive-through. That's his drive-through. Oh, oh, right, right, people right, working on the car. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. just mentioned yep, that. Thank you, well done. Yeah. Uh, and Richard, Richard Westbrook has just taken over the 0-2 on that car at IMSA Radio. If you want to get in touch. I did say it early on, I wondered if this might be a slightly different sort of endurance race. New cars, new technology, 
but perhaps a little bit more interestingly of a of an old let's get the cars through to a couple of three hours before the race so just one lap led then for the number zero two car of um it was alex lynn who, who took over the lead for one lap that's the first lead change in this race but he's just now made his third pit stop of the day in car number zero two uh, and actually handed over the, that car over to richard westbrook so that car running on a well it was uh, it's going to be interesting to watch that because it, its first stop was on lap 29 its second stop was on lap 40 so only 11 laps on that stint and only 24 on this stint. i wasn't expecting to see that car on the pit lane for quite a while yet so that's something i think we should keep an eye on the that most of the leading cars did 30 or 31 laps the zero one car did 30 laps on each of its stint and the, the second one was about, about 51 minutes. We're, we're expecting somewhere between 48 and 52 minutes for the uh, GTP cars on a stint before they've used up all their allowable energy. Uh, and that's a good bit longer than it was last year. Last year's stints were about, about 40 minutes or thereabouts. So they're going longer between stints now, uh, but uh, certainly the number zero two car, we don't have a field yet for what is going on there. Why? That only came in after, after just 24. One thing I would say about uh, what, we've, what we've seen here, that, that echoes what we saw at the Raw, and again in the early sessions here, and I accept people obviously are joining us for the first time maybe uh, for the race coverage here, is that these GTP cars don't break and turn like the DPIs did. They are, what, a good 100 kilos heavier. Yep. They've got this brake-by-wire system uh, that uh, works uh, ostensibly on the back wheels, uh, working with the hybrid. It, they are only two-wheel drive cars, so the hybrid only works on the back axle, the same as the internal combustion engine. And it does seem that we're seeing more mistakes, and I use the words mistakes in inverted commas, errors, whatever you want to do, but more issues, let's, let's say it, under braking than we have been used to recently in the recent past from pro drivers as the 23 heart of racing peels off into the pit lane from the gtd field uh, that aston martin uh, coming down for service still colin brown leading the motor race three seconds ahead of renga van der zander as we come through to another hour's worth of racing completed and before we do our vp racing update let's go to nick damon down in the pit lane with i think alex lynn is what you said she, uh, tim yep. uh, nick didn't you sorry from the o2 cadillac alex, alex it's a it's very very frenetic out there now you've made an extra stop uh, why was that uh, we tried to catch a yellow i think there was a porsche that was stopped on track and we were near pit road so we tried to to catch an early yellow it didn't it didn't work out uh, so anyway we're just having a play around with strategy at this early point and uh, getting a feel for uh, what we can and can't do and i mean how it's a great word what you can and can't do what have you discovered in this first hour you didn't know about the car um not a crazy amount i mean that was the first time we did nearly 70 laps on a set of tires so that's a lot of a lot of laps on a, on a set of tires around here so yeah we're just really again finding out what this car can and cannot do at this moment when you came in for that uh, attempt to to cheat a yellow effectively you took some fuel on but then you kind of got yourself back on the strategy of everyone else you didn't, didn't go the full distance why was that uh to be fair we're just trying to play around with, with strategy right now thanks alex thanks I, 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 Joe Bradley is further up the pit lane. I'll have a comment on that in a moment. Uh, Joe Bradley with some LMP3 updates. Yeah, just a, a quick update on LMP3. Pretty much everybody in LMP3 class has pitted now, the last one being just in there at the AWA uh, Dakin. Uh, Matt Bells took over the 13 car. Um, it, the 42 Lamborghini, the NTE Sport Lamborghini, uh, caused some consternation. Kerong Lee, who, by the way, uh, creates history here at Daytona, the first, very first Chinese driver, as far as we're aware, to race here at Daytona in the 24 hours. Uh, but that car caused a bit of consternation with the team. Couldn't quite get into his box and was so far away, they couldn't get the fuel hose to it. So they've lost a bit of time there, more time lost for that 42 NTE Sport Lamborghini. 
Let's take a look at the standings then with two hours completed. We'll start off in GTD Pro. We've just had some pit stops, but the 23 Aston Martin Hart Racing Car came in from the lead. David Pittard staying behind the wheel as he goes out. GTD Pro, Lexus number 14, Jack Hawks within second from in third, another GTD Pro, that is Jordan Taylor. In the standard GTD category, John Potter has just pitted the Magnus Aston Martin from the lead. Frankie Monte Calvo's taking over the uh, green number panel, number 12 Lexus, and then it's the Acura number 93 of Ashton Harrison for Racers Edge in third position. In LMP3, it's Gar Robinson just coming into the pit on the pit stop cycle now and Simon van der Helm has taken over the Duquesne number 85 and he's just pitted uh, or just come out of the pits in that JDC Miller Motorsport car that he took over from uh, Till Bechtelsheimer who started that car he will come out in a net third position Jarrett Andretti who was leading before this pit stop cycle will go back to the lead in the number 36, Jarrett Andretti staying in that car in the last pit stop. In LMP2, it is the P.R. Matheson's Motorsport, the wins car, that leads with Alex Quinn behind the wheel. He's been very quick since he took over from starting driver Ben Keating. Julian Canal for the number 88 eight off AF Corsa, a team in second place. It's the car that was started by Francois Perodo. And in third, the 044 now is the Matt McMurray driven CrowdStrike racing by APR. Ben Hanley, uh, Esteban Gutierrez, and George Kurtz, who, start, who are also in that car. And at the top of the field, the number 60 Acura has still not been headed for 69, coming around to finish 70 laps. It's, it's Colin Brown, I'm oh, sorry, one lap, I'm told. Jeremy has been keeping an eye on that. So it's that 68 of 69 laps then. We'll, we'll fix that when we do the post-production. Uh, Colin Brown now behind the wheel of that number 60 car. 4.3 seconds to the good. Ring of Zander in the 0-1 Cadillac. That's the car with the yellow front and the, uh, the full season IMSA car. Porsche 963. And 63 of Batu Jamine, the number six guy, he's taking that up from Nick Tandy now in third. And they are separated by about 17 seconds. Another spinner out on the circuit. And once again, it's at the far end of the track from us. Performance Tech Motorsport, number 38. Again. LMP2. Huh? That's John not the first DeAndres. time we've seen that facing the wrong direction. John DeAndres, another spin for the uh, Florida driver making his debut in the IMSA Web Tech Sports Car Championship this weekend. So that is your update with two hours gone, just over. 21 hours and 58 minutes to go. Colin Brown leads for MSR Acura. 70 laps completed in that number 60. Our in-race update at the 61st running of the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona with VP Racing Fuels, the official coolant of IMSA. That's stay frosty. Whether you are towing, tracking, or just driving your car, there's a stay frosty for you. Check it out on the website. Well, if you are just joining us, the news from the first couple of hours is that uh, the number 25 BMW had to go behind the wall with a hybrid warning. Nick Yellowly was behind the wheel at the time, went into the HV, the high voltage recovery area, and that is a specific place on the track just before the pit lane entry where you can park out of harm's way and try and resolve the issue. It was resolved to the point where it could be moved and taken back to the pit lane. The car is in a state of undress back in the garage area. 107.9 FM around the track, RS2 on imsaradio.com and the Radio Show Limited player. And we've got sound and vision for you there as well via the live video button. Our world feed available to you and welcome to all of our syndicated TV networks around the world as well. Let's pick up some pit reports again. 
Uh, Nick Damon, first of all. Uh, up at the 24 for Team RLL BMW with Philip Eng. Philip, um, well, you survived the first, the first stint, which is more than your sister car did. How is the car feeling? Car is feeling good so far. Um, everything is going according to plan. It was such a great honor to do the start. First official start of our new car um, at the biggest race of the year. It was great to see so many people on the grid. Um, yeah, but the car feels good and very early days. Um, it's a long way to go, but I'm fairly optimistic. Was that as quick as you could go, or were you running to a time, a lap time? No, I mean, obviously, you're always trying to get the maximum out of the car without taking unnecessary risks in the beginning. We just uh, said to play it safe in the beginning and uh, then build up on it. First of all, it was important to get a good read of the car, how the balance is, how the tires develop throughout the stint. So, yes, to answer your question. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just noting that uh, it is Ashton Harrison behind the wheel of the Racers Edge 93 car. Now, that's not a full season car, it is doing the Mission Endurance Cup, uh, leading GTD at the moment. Ashton was sitting in second or third for quite some time, and then, of course, when uh, there was the incident with the 32, that caught off car spun away, she went through to lead. Uh, we're going to get their full course yellow here. The NTE Lamborghini's gone straight on at turn one into the tyres. The tyres are there to stop you from going into turn six, and that's exactly what they've done. Robert McGuinness behind the wheel of that two-ton blue car. I would be very surprised if the yellows don't come out. And just waiting to see that car is still fired up. McGuinness working behind the wheel to try and find reverse, I think, at the moment. The tyres have done their job to stop the car going straight on at uh, turn number one. It's a fairly short run from turn one to the exit of the infield. The cars are coming almost straight after. And big spin for the performance tech as well a few moments ago. That's the number 38 at the far end of the infield section looks like maybe may have been attacked by the 33 yeah Sean Chris uh, motorsport car oh, time in Vanderhelm no no he's really, yeah Lance Wilsey yeah. yeah and yeah I think that was just a tiny little tap there we saw it earlier on with the court of Mercedes uh, and also contact at the international horseshoe uh, rather an optimistic lunge by the TDS racing car. And then a few moments ago, big lockup for the NTE. Lamborghini has uh, thrown us in to a full course yellow. This will bring everybody into the pits. Nick Damon, down to you, you've got the leader. Yes, you've had a number of people come in the pits. These 60 cars, you say, are just sneaking back past me, having uh, picked up a bit of extra fuel and carried on going. Uh, Pre-empting it was a number of the uh, LMP2 cars. The, uh, we had the, the, the Ben Keating 52 car, the PR1 Matheson. We had Proto competition. Well, both of those came in before it was actually called, but gained a little bit, because when they left, it was already happening. So they gained, like, you know, half a straight, but they, they had the fuel. And we have a car coming into a closed pit. Looks like one of the other uh, P2s. It's a 51 car of the Rick Ware Racing. Now, I assume that's because it had to come in because it's out of fuel, because it was. this is pretty much where they're going to do. So they're going to allowed to have five seconds of, uh, of input from the hose. Yeah, that's more than five. So they've decided they're going to just... That was, I'm sorry, that was more than five. I could count to more than five. Perhaps that was five seconds of actually flowing, but that was, that was on for about nine. So we'll see what the uh, officials say about this. And it looks like everything now is uh, clear, and we'll wait, obviously, the pits to open properly in a couple of um, yellow flag lap times. Uh, yeah, 51, Rick Ware car definitely entered a close pit. That was noted uh, by the race control. Um, with uh, immaculate timing, we have a guest here, actually. Hello to Penilla Lindbergh, who has joined us here in uh, on the... Uh, fifth floor. I didn't know you were a racing fan, Penelope. We know you from your exploits on the LPGA Tour, of course. I didn't realize you were a racing fan. Yeah, I, uh, I've become a racing fan the last few years. It's actually really thanks to Drive to Survive on, uh, uh, on Netflix. Uh, I have become a huge F1 fan over the last few years. 
and uh, went to a couple of F1 races last year, and then this is my first time here in Daytona now. Uh, a little bit different from what you've seen then, a couple of hours in the book. What do you what do you feel about it so far? A lot of cars out there, a lot of different classes to get your head around, but uh, exciting for you? It's very exciting. It's a lot louder than being at a golf tournament, that's for sure. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to learn uh, as much as I can about the different classes and, you know, the. Uh, I have a couple of teams that I'm rooting for here. The degraded team has uh, been hosting me this morning. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, it's always more interesting when you feel like you have a couple of teams that you, you're rooting for. Right, you're a professional sports person. You work and you focus for every tournament. Of course you do. How would you feel if your, your season started off with the biggest event of the year because that's effectively what we're doing here it's, it's an odd sensation yeah i i would say i will probably be um extra nervous a bit more scared because uh, it's it's nice to have a, a couple of smaller warm-up events but you know uh, when you're a professional athlete whenever they tell you i mean in a racing uh tell you to go or on a golf course tell you to tee off uh, whenever we get the chance we're we're ready to go uh it doesn't matter you know if it's a bigger event or a small event now we know you from golf, but when I found out you were coming up, I did do a little bit of research, and you used to be a bit of a speed demon because you were a skier in your earlier sporting life. You've done your research, exactly. I grew up in the northern part of Sweden, so uh, uh, golf uh, was something we did in the summer, and then uh, skiing was the, the perfect thing to do in the winter. So, yeah, I used to throw myself uh, down the ski slope at, you know, probably 75, 80 miles per hour, which... Uh, uh, this is still more scary to be in these cars. <laughs> well, okay, so coming from that area of the world, no thought to do any uh, rallying or motorsport because th there's a lot of similarities between skiing and rallying, setting yourself up for the turns, looking further ahead. Yeah, no, I, you know, back then I was really focused on, uh, it was skiing and golf. If you asked me as a kid what I wanted to do when I grew up, it was either be a professional skier or a professional golfer. And motorsport is not uh, anything that's really crossed my mind, mind until these last few years. But no, like you said, a lot of similarities. Not as many similarities between golf uh, and racing. <laughs> well, what's enough? Focus. It, that's exactly what I was going to say. Mm. Totally. Yeah, I know uh, a couple of the gradient uh, racing uh, team drivers, uh, Catherine and Sheena, they were actually out at one of our LPG events uh, last week. And uh, that's what they said. You know, the focus that we have on the course, uh, they could see, see similarities there for sure. Uh, so that was Orlando. How did you do down in that event? Actually, I did not play oh, okay. uh, in that event. No, that's okay. I, I'm getting my season started uh, in middle of March, so I still have a little bit of time off. What do you do other than pra uh, hit balls to practice golf? I mean, it's a bit like motor racing. There's not much else you can do. You have to drive on a track to practice motor racing. You have to hit balls to practice golf. <laughs> yes, uh, but golf is very complex. There's always something you can practice. I mean, you're on the driving range, you're on a putting green, you're in the bunker, you're chipping. There's always like different shots to practice and then we spend a lot of time obviously not just on the driving range but out playing on the golf course too well i uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the race good luck for the season thanks for we'll having me we'll be watching you on the nbc golf channel of course throughout the rest of the season we get the lpa uh, lp ga back in the uk as well so now i've got somebody new to root for thanks for coming to see us thanks for having me cheers cheers uh, Lindbergh is joining us here uh, at the race taking in uh, another sport full course yellow number two for us uh, here uh, and we're waiting for the pits to open and indeed with perfect timing uh, the open this time around no i i, I suspect that everybody is it a, a situation, Jeremy, uh, in GTP where they will want to come in? Um, yeah, I mean, the number 60 car, I presume it got in just before the it yellow did. came out. Yeah, right. So uh, they've stolen a bit of a march here. So that what car probably won't come in again. Uh, the other ones, yeah, they're sort of most of the way through. Well, not even barely a third of the way through this since, uh, but probably will come in. Uh, the um, what's, what's bizarre now is that there's a whole train of cars that stuck behind. I think it was number 55 car uh, that uh, was going very, very slowly uh, and uh, trapping the entire rest of the field, which is really bizarre. That's the sure Proton it's... Competition uh, yeah, MP2 I car. Think, I think that's which it, the car that, uh, that it was. Is it, is it, is it, or was it the 88? Might have been the 88, actually. Oh, uh, the AF Corsa car, the sort of sunburst yeah. machine, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the chrome colored car. Yeah, that's, that's the 88. So there's only sort of 10 or 15 cars, there's a massive gap 
to everybody else. So not quite sure what's going on there. So the, the entire field hasn't pa packed up. That's my point, yeah. yeah. So that, yes, and that, that means people are going to charge down into the pits where Nick Damon is waiting for the GTPs. Yeah, we've got a full well, we've got a full house so far. We've got the, the 60 did come in again for the 12 mega joules it was allowed to have after a lap behind the safety car. The big news really is the 31, the Wheeland uh, Engineering Cadillac, that's the car which had the coming together with uh, Nick Tandy's number six port, having a nose change. They've decided the, uh, the damage, and it had to actually hold the front of the splitter, uh, was worth changing. Now it's not going to cost me anything apart from a little bit of track position. So they've changed the nose relatively cheaply. And, uh, and our bright red one has gone in. We've also had one of the Cadillacs through uh, in the uh, GTP side, but uh, all of them just picking up those extra megajoules of energy, wherever they may be. And then Joe, he has a whole plethora of LMP3s. I have LMP3 and LMP2s. However, I am in LMP3 land. Just been with the leading team. It's the number 74, the Ranch Resort Riley. That car came in and only took on fuel. I'm now at Sean Creech. And it looks like everybody's doing the same. We almost had a coming together with a couple of prototypes further down towards pit out. But right now, everybody just choosing to take on fuel during this yellow. Very quick pit stops by everybody. Ah, red light at the end of pit lane. But you see, that, that, that's what Jeremy was talking about. Because the, there was such a, a big gap, uh, we did have a red light at the end of the pit lane, and that's really helped the Andretti Autosport car, Joe, at your end of things, because all of the cars that it's just joined alongside should have already been gone. Yeah, that really, really hurt a lot of people there because it didn't really matter how quick your pit stop was on the apron, you got held at pit out, so everybody, I think, has gone out the way they came in. Thanks, Joe. That was just really weird, though. It was. I mean, normally... We don't open the pits until everybody is packed up behind the safety car. Well, they weren't there, so that's created a fair bit of confusion down, th down there, particularly at that pit exit, with it then being closed with the sort of second string of cars. So, a bit weird, but anyhow, it, I'm sure it'll all sort itself out. The number 60 car did come in for, for a very quick splash of fuel, very quick splash of fuel, uh, and so has, has therefore leapfrogged from fourth, where it was, into the lead again. Uh, number zero two and number twenty four car. They were both a lap down to the other the other GTP car, so they did not make a pit stop. And before we go back to green, therefore they will be between the safety car and the race leader. Uh, and because of that, they will be allowed to go past the safety car, run around to the back of the pack because they had not been lapped by the overall leader. So they will, they'll be at the back of the pack before the restart. Having said that, after getting what is called the wave around, they will probably come into the pits, top off the fuel and get out again and hopefully beat the safety car uh, back onto the racetrack. In, the, in that case, they're still back on the lead lap, having made their... their uh, taken on service right gt's coming this time there are a couple of cars that aren't going to stop at the front of the field they're going to stay out as jeremy has mentioned uh including as the okay which of the safety cars have we got now that's the is that the nsx i think uh or is that one of the corvettes one of the corvettes excuse me uh, as into the pit lane comes the gts let's start with nick again and pit in yeah the uh 14 was the interesting one that didn't go by which is the um the lexus car that 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 troll part oh, the 23 aston martin we had the 64 aston martin as well uh i can see the 92 happy buddha it seems that like everyone else has come in they've just picked up fuel i can't see anybody actually at the moment doing a driver change i mean possibly uh, joe's it joe have you got any drivers being swapped driver change going on on the 21 AF course of Ferrari. It's in the midfield of the GTD class, full service on this 21. So the AF Corsa team uh, perhaps disagreeing with a lot of other teams. They're going to lose a bit of time. There's a lot of cars just taking on fuel. Paul Miller, the Paul Miller BMW for one, just pulls off the apron and overtakes the 21 Ferrari on pit lane. However, same scenario as before for the LMP cars. It's a red light, and as the 21 Ferrari moves off pit apron, it goes green and pit out. So he, he has lost places, though, changing driver. Thank you, Joe. And Nick? And I need to correct myself. Number seven car did not come onto pit lane with the other uh, GTP cars. So that now leads the race overall. Colin Brown moved up, uh, up into second place. He did stop, uh, but has leapfrogged the other guys because he needed only a splash of fuel. And the other contenders that are on the lead lap needed a, a good bit more fuel. So a much faster pit stop for number 60 
gets it back out ahead of the number zero, one, the number six, and the 10. But the number seven car, having not pitted at all, went past all of them. Yes. Yeah. And that's that, uh, you know, we were talking about this in case the race. Um, work the cautions. Sometimes they'll fall for you, sometimes they may not, Jeremy, but if you've got an opportunity to make it work for you, you've got to recognise that quickly, speak to your driver, and depending where you are on the circuit, you might have to make some fairly rapid decisions. That's what the 60 did there, and, uh, and got its service done uh, in the moments before the pits closed. Correct. So on Thinking on your feet. Yes, exactly. It's just as much a part of endurance racing, if you're new to all this, as uh, having the fastest driver in the car at the right time. All of those things come together. Still a little bit overcast here this afternoon. Track temperature 27 Celsius, that's uh, 81 Fahrenheit. 18 in the air is 64, as we're coming up to four o'clock. In fact, it's exactly four o'clock in the afternoon, so 21 hours and 40, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31 seconds to go. Sirius XM 207 here in the US. RS2 around the world. 107.9 here at Daytona International Speedway. And our world feed pictures via imsa.tv, imsaradio.com by the live video button. And of course, our syndicated TV partners around the world. Right, coming in this time around, as Jeremy said, the seven uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport Machine didn't pit. Well, Nick, well, they've come in to see you now. Who now they you? have, fuel only, uh, windscreen clean, a quick visual check. Um, so, We've got the 60 apparently. Oh, well, sorry, just look, look the other way. And the rear end, the rear deck of the uh, the 60, the car that's led the race from uh, from the start, is being changed. So whether that is a bit of damage, or obviously when you change the rear end, you do slightly change. You can also change the aerodynamics. So they're also putting a bit of fluid in there as well. But I'm actually standing right by the 24 pit for the BMW. That's going to come in a minute because they've they've managed to get their lap back, haven't they? They're just sort of sprinting around the. Uh, the uh, start finish straight, and they're going to basically uh, get their lap back. I don't think this is sinister, but still the 60s not moving. Um, yeah, Shay, what's going on your end? Absolutely nothing, Nick. It's nice and peaceful down here as everyone got their service done and managed to blend into line, line astern. That was one thing that they talked about in the driver's meeting earlier. If you happen to leave at a point when the red light is on, you just pull out and show intent. That is going to show where you belong in line and how you fall in. It's something that's been a question over years past that race control addressed, and people so far have been obeying the rules nicely. Uh, Nick Damon has the remaining BMW, the number 24 well, from RLL. Got the 24 and the O2, of course, have used this to get their lap back. The 24 getting a fuel, uh, fuel, a full fill of fuel, which is hard to say slowly, let alone quickly. Uh, and away he goes on uh, electrical power. So. That, this one's worked very well for BMW. So the 24 car now, just playing itself in. Um, obviously, the 25 car still behind the wall with that uh, hybrid change. Nick, if you could get down to the shank racing pit, the, the MSR Acura, see if you can have a quick look at the tail end that they took off. It includes the rear wing, and there looks to be... It's got out the back, actually. There looks to be a little bit of scuffage on one side, as if that car's rub the wall. I presume it's the right-hand side. Yes, it is the right-hand side. Uh, our intrepid camera people have got that uh, now, and they're working on it. It says accurate on the uh, right-hand pillar of that. It's at the, uh, the back of the uh, easy ups in the pit lane. And the other thing we need to find out is why that number seven car didn't come in the first time around. I wonder if they've got some communication problems in that Porsche. I don't see the tactical... I don't see the tactical advantage, Jeremy, of not coming in with the rest of the GTPs when they were still on the lead lap. Right. Uh, unless they were just too far down the line 
and they, and they were worried that uh, they were going to get stuck in the line or something like that. They did, there was a red light at the well, end of the Well, that's lane. a good point. That, that car was probably trapped behind all those other cars that were going slowly. Great point, John Heinoff. Yeah, well done. Uh, that, that, I'm sure that was it was what it was, because if it had come in, then they, there was, a, there was a, a, a danger, if anybody else didn't pit amongst the leaders, that they would have uh, gone a lap down, and that, would be, uh, that wouldn't be good. But now that's, uh, yeah, that could be, that, that's great, great thinking. Because that was at the tail end lead lap, it was a yes. long way behind everybody else. It was a, a, a full uh, 40, 46 seconds or more behind the wheel and engineering Cadillac. Yeah. Well, a bite out of that. Let's uh, go down to Sheer Adam, the era prototype, I think, was trying to get the pass around Sheer. Yeah, and dove into the pit lane to get a little bit more fuel for Ryan Dial. And even though that was down on Nick's end, I just noticed that he was coming back out, got stopped at the red light at the pit exit because they were still doing the pass around where all of the GTP cars go to the front of the field. And then all the remaining prototypes stay in line with the other prototypes, but pass all the GT cars. This means that Ryan Dial is going to be starting at the back of the GT field for this restart. He'll be fun to watch. Well, we like a bit of entertainment, it's fair to say. Uh, pits are still open, anybody can come in now. Colin Brown trying to get some heat into his tyres in that number 60 car. This is the car that was on pole position, put there by Tom Blomqvist on Sunday afternoon last week. Well, this week, actually, I suppose you would say. Uh, that car has now, for the first time, relinquished the lead. For the first time, bar one lap on the pit stop circulation. Uh, and that means for the first time we have the 01 Cadillac leading. Renge von der Zander, 01 Cadillac from the 1-0, the, the 10. That is the Conning uh, Minolta, WTR Andretti racing car. Louis Delatraz behind the wheel there. This is all behind the safety car. 31 Cadillac of Jack Aiken is the wheel and car, red-fronted car with the Cadillac racing rear end. Second of the... Oh, I missed out the six Porsche in third, sorry. That's Matthew Jaminet, that's the one with the white stripes. Seven Porsche is in fifth for Matt Campbell, the affable Aussie. Colin Brown in sixth place now in the pole sitting car. Richard Westbrook in the O2, the blue-fronted Cadillac racing car. And Augusto Farfus for BMW in the remaining BMW M Hybrid V8. If you weren't with us earlier on, the 25 car had to be pulled into the safe area with a hybrid problem. The car is being looked at in the pits as we go back to green with 21 hours, 34 minutes and 2, 1, 8, 34 minutes exactly to go now. And it's the yellow-fronted Cadillac of Renge van der Zander that leads the cars through into the infield for their 80th time. Gets a decent jump off the start. At Nimsa Radio, if you want to get back to us. Uh, Nick Damon, I think, had a quick look at the uh, rear wing on that number 60 car. Broken end plate, Nick, is that, was that the problem? A uh, light bit of damage. I think much is the same with the 31 car. When you've got a free chance of fixing it so early in the race, you may as well fix it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, you don't... Again, it is, despite what the drivers are doing, the teams are absolutely going zero risk at the moment. So uh, that would make perfect sense. Oh, I mean, we've lost a bit of track position, but it doesn't matter with 22 hours to go. Thank you, Nick. Did you find out what the uh, what the fuel was, the um, uh, fluid was that went into that? It was the big? Um, it almost looked like a fire extinguisher, but it had two hoses uh, on on it. Uh, That's something that the, the, on the Acura. Yeah, yeah. The, the, they are basically replenishing the, uh, the the oil in the engine. Uh, is, uh, yeah, we're going to see more of that than we have in the past. We've seen it in the past, but I think we're going to see more of that. And it's, it's um, I gather, it's something to do with the, with the fuel and the sort of the sediment sediments that's, that's passed through the engine and into the, the oil system on the on the engine. Yeah. Okay. We're going to see more of that this year. More penalties. Uh, running the red light at the pit exit, stop at 60 for the number. Is that, does that say 38 on that screen, Jeremy? Yes, it does. Very That's much, performance yeah. tech, then. 34 will also take a penalty. And that is... Uh, 34 car. 
10 minute speed violation for that car. And finally, I don't think we've got a 34, have we? So that's not quite right. I'll check that one back. I've confused myself there. Um, 87, we certainly do have. Uh, and that is the fast MB. Uh, and they pro improperly served their emergency service obligation. So that'll be a stop plus 10. I'll get back to you when I see another car come through, because somebody's obviously had a pit lane speed violation, but it, it isn't the 34. And by the way, they, that, those two cars I've just mentioned, the 38 and the 87 have just come along with Performance Tech and Fast MG. They have, they are already serving, or have served their penalty. The stop plus 60 is going on right now at the penalty box. The pit out. Yeah, that's costly for the uh, Performance Tech team. That's disappointing for them. They were uh, a lap down to the leaders as a result of those two earlier spins during that last. They're going to lose Bit another lap here. around positions on the GTP cars since the restart. The number 60 cars made up a couple of positions. And the seven cars lost a couple. That's Maddie Campbell, number seven Porsche. There's three three cars heading absolutely no still even side by side into turn one. In the order 10, 6, and 60, are they going to come out in that order? <laughs> yeah, just about. Possibly. Can we just remind everybody, please? I mean, it's great, we're loving it, but let's remind everybody that we have 21 and a half hours still to go here. Decent battle in GTD Pro as well for the lead of the class, the Chevy Corvette. Uh, leading the class with Jordan Taylor on board, having a cracking battle with Jack Hawksworth in the GTD Pro Lexus number 14. So he's just made that pass, because at the restart, the uh, the Lexus of Jack Hawksworth was just ahead of Jordan Taylor, so they've uh, exchanged positions. Uh, uh, and just behind them, Frankie Montecalvo in the other Vassar Sullivan Lexus, car number 12, he's just got past Ashton Harrison for the lead in GTD. Those cars are all, well, and now again, we're back to, to no tail in GTD pro or non-pro so the two pro cars out in front jordan taylor and jack hawksworth number three and 14 then the two non-pro cars thank you monty Calvert and ashton harrison's done a really nice job with that uh, uh, number th 93 car and then the pro car david pittard the heart of racing team aston martin car number 23 then kenton cook who's driving for the quarter of motorsports team this year in the mercedes car number 32 uh, the speeding penalty, by the way, was for the 64, not the 34. Uh, TGM TF Sports, Aston Martin Vantage. And that yeah. car has come in and out. Change of manufacturer for TGM for their, what is becoming their annual WeatherTech outing. All the drivers together from the two Michelin Pilot cars. Yeah. And uh, this year, Tom Furrier, TF Sport, running that car for them yeah and they're running in the gtd pro category uh is the number 64 car the people just, changed over haven't yeah they? it's to give them to more basically if if you're running in gtd the minimum drive time i think is four and a half hours correct in gtd pro the minimum drive time is two hours so that just gives the, the team a lot less uh, a, a lot more flexibility uh, Ted Giovanni's isn't going to be on the, on the pace of his other pro drivers in there. He's 77 years of, old, of age, for goodness sake. He does a heck of a good job, uh, all things considered. And he's still as enthusiastic as ever about his racing. It's brilliant. Uh, and ditto in the number 53 car, Mark Kawami there, who's got to lots of experience in all sorts of different cars, uh, but he, he isn't uh, on the same level in terms of pace as his more illustrious teammates, the likes of... Uh, Jan Magnussen, uh, Trenton Estep, who's a youngster who Mark Kwame has taken under his wing and uh, is a very, very fast youngster. Youngster is 22 years of age. And Jason Hart, great to see him have this opportunity to drive that car from Flower Mound in Texas. Jason's been driving GT4 cars for years and years and years. Uh, he, he, he's actually done a, uh, a couple of Rolex 24s in the past, but it's been a long, long time. Great opportunity for Jason. Uh, and super to see somebody like that, like that have an opportunity in that car. Yeah, did Le Mans this year with uh, Renga and Mark Kwame in a... Uh, oh, yeah, oh, and, and the reason he got the opportunity because Kevin Magnussen, uh, Jan's son, was going to drive the car, but then had 
some wrist surgery, which wasn't initially planned, but it was decided to get it done before the F1 season. And uh, that, uh, it, was a, it was minor surgery, uh, and it went very well, but uh, the recuperation meant that he couldn't take up his place in with this team as expected. But there is a hope that he might be there in the future. Uh, I, of course, I met them on last year, but I, my year doesn't go from January to December. It goes from Le Mans to Le Mans, so... I'm still in one Le Mans cycle, if you say what I mean. So, I'm sure you knew what I meant. <laughs> so Colin, Brown, Colin Brown did manage to get past Matthew Jamin. Ah. Up in the third place now, then, for number 60 car, the pole sitting car. Having made that additional, well, a couple of pit stops compared to the most of the other cars in uh, GTP. So, Colin Brown now, then, in that number 60 car with a bit of clear track ahead. How far up the road is the Louis Deltra, next not turn? Far at all. Well, for half a second, so no, there he is, yeah. Half a dozen car lengths. So just coming across the tri-oval now, and they're already in traffic. And the leader, in fact, is only just ahead yeah, as well is. by another three. To, in fact, they're not even that. They're about a second apart if that is to go through turn one. The yellow-fronted Cadillac then leads. Is, uh, Ferrari number 62 comes out of the pits. That was serving a penalty for Risi. And, uh, that was improper pit procedure. Nothing more specific than that. Uh, and Matty Campbell in the Porsche number seven, now up into sixth place, having passed Richard Westbrook last time around. Yeah, yeah. Porsche versus Cadillac. There, Cadillac, Acura, Acura, Porsche, Cadillac, Porsche, Cadillac, BMW. The remaining eight GTPs, nine seconds apart after the restart, and all on the lead lap. Seems some faster times coming in. Francesco Pizzi in the number yeah. 55 just turned that brought on competition. Orica's fastest lap of the race, and the places behind him and going a little bit quicker still. Still got Huffaker in the number 11 TDS racing car, 139.7, and also a fastest lap for the car that he's in for the car that's behind that, all in the LMP2 class, the number 35 TDS racing car. That's young Josh Pearson behind the wheel of that car with a 140.8. Yeah, and Francesco Pizzi. It, it, it probably isn't a name with which many people are familiar, as I wasn't, um, until, coincidentally, I saw his, his name uh, added to the, the driver roster in number 55 car in LP2 for Proton Competition. And funny enough, that same day, uh, I got a notification that he's going to be driving this year in the USF, two th USF Pro 2000 Championship, so on the, uh, the, the open wheel ranks you know, aiming towards uh, Indianapolis and the Indy 500. Uh, friend, he, the, the young man, Francesco Pizzi, from Rome, from Rome in Italy, just 18 years of age. He's done a, a fair bit of racing in uh, open wheel ranks in, Itali in Italy and in Europe. He's had some success there as well. Uh, and he's given a good account of himself at the wheel of this guy, his first time in a prototype. And the other youngster, there, the English youngster, Alex Quinn, just a couple of, uh, couple of seconds ahead of him. Question coming in here from Jerry C, who's on the grounds, come up from further south in Florida this weekend. Why does IMSA only have the one 24-hour race on the calendar? Is it too expensive for the teams? So yes and no. What no, IMSA? Yes, what, yes. Well, I mean, we could have another 24-hour race, but it would take up the three or four other races, wouldn't it? it what, when we've talked to John Doon and pre the president of IMSA in the past about longer races, they talk about balancing how much competitive running cars have to do during the years. Because uh, during the year, it, it costs an amount per racing kilometre or mile for cars, and that's what it's balanced out at. Meanwhile, at the front of the field, we've got that battle starting to hot up a little. Louis mm. Delatras has caught Renga van der Zandra down at turn one. They've got a little bit of traffic ahead of them, and the leader's going to go down the inside into the International Horseshoe. Oh, a little bit of traffic, what am I talking about? Looks like I-95 on a bad day, as the third-place car, which is Colin Brown, in the white and pink Acura, is also there. Top three together now, carving their way past the 
Wright Motorsport Porsche, EO Porsche ahead of that. Then we've got uh, the and then we've got the middle of the GTD pack in there as well. Top four prototypes now as the best of the Porsches is coming through. That's Mathieu Jaminet. I was having a chat with him just a couple of hours before the start of the race. Oh, wow. magnificent stuff by Colin Brown. I think he's made up a position there. Yes, he has. He's gone past Louis Delatras, who was slightly stymied, then goes all the way up to the wall to get a run on the leader. This could be Colin Brown going from third to first in the space of a lap. He goes down below the double. Oh, movement, moving around by Renge van der Zander there in the braking area for turn seven. That was sketchy from the Dutchman as Colin Brown had a wonderful run out on speedway one and two. Absolutely caught Delatras napping. Delatras caught in the traffic. Brown went in the middle of the track and then up to the top, really close to the wall, had a fabulous run. Now drops back a little bit as the leader's flashing his lights, goes by the Paul Miller Racing BMW. Well, you get the feeling that the Mike Shank Racing guys have been set to stun a day, Jeremy. Saw it from Tom Blomqvist last weekend in that one and done qualifying effort. He was awesome in the early part of the race. And we've got Delatraz right there again now with the MSR car. Traffic giveth, traffic taketh away. Well, there you go. I mean, the previous lap times, the previous two lap times for the race, 136.5, 137.9, then at one minute 40.4 for Renko van der Zander on that last lap. But Colin Brown, wow, what a great effort that was. He was weaving in and out. He made up uh, one position, almost two. But I don't know how many, pass, how many cars he passed in that little... Uh, is this a, it's a replay I think we're looking at here. It's just fantastic to watch. He was, he had that car absolutely beautifully placed, uh, and he had to make some decisions there uh, to go around one of the LMP3 cars, who I think was a bit taken by surprise. <laughs> but you know, what you're supposed to do is keep uh, to the to the low side in the slower cars, and let the faster guys go around you. And he, the the LMP3 car there kind of waffled a bit, uh, but there was no waffling from Colin Brown. What oh, never has been. Um didn't he set a speed record around here in a DPI? Um, with Shea, was that with was that with the team he's driving for now? Yep, they're back when they were Michael Shank racing in a Ford DP at 222.791 miles an hour, I think it was. Just off the top of your head, thank you. I always defer to Shea on that. Big dive down the inside from Colin to try and take the lead, but Renga managing to defend again. Traffic, allowing the two leaders to get away. And once again, we're into police chase <laughs> as the leader. The leader, of course, hits the traffic first. I mean, that's an obvious thing to say. Why does that matter? Well, because the guys are battling between themselves for position. These aren't guys just cruising around on a Saturday afternoon. They're all having their own scraps and going through at the moment the GT battle between Andy Lally and Daniel Morad. They're fighting for fifth and sixth in GTD, and respectively, the uh, number 44, Aston Martin, and the 57, WeatherTech AMG uh, GT. Uh, excuse me, no, 57 is the uh, Windward. Windward car, excuse me. Yeah, that's a good effort by Daniel Morad. That's a car that was uh, driven over from Texas from uh, Thursday to Friday after the, the, the original car was was destroyed yeah. uh, with that nasty accident for, for Lucas Hour. So that's a really good effort by that team. There was a fair bit of work needed to be done on that car, even after they'd driven it from Texas. Yeah. Uh, and the team, I think, they were up till 4 o'clock this morning getting that car ready Help for the from race. one of the Lamborghini teams as well. Not yeah. even the same manufacturer they turned out to help as well. Actually, that battle that they were going by, and in fact, Colin Brown was held up a little, was Brendan Areeb in the McLaren 720 and Cooper McNeil, that was the, the WeatherTech car. Yeah, and I saw Bryce Ward delivering, hand-delivering several cases of beer for that team, uh, for them to consume after the race. Well, he probably hopes they could see it before it, but <laughs> Whatever. I'm sure he said, but he was so grateful, uh, as he was telling I, us a little earlier, it was so cool. I, I, love the, I love the family atmosphere that we've got here. Everything, look, before the race, you know, here, they know how much work had to go in there. It can happen to anybody. And so they were there, they were there with their comrades, effectively. Not even the same manufacturers, as I say. Um, 
They'll be fighting tooth and nail out there on the circuit now. As we've seen many, many, many times down the years, the, the respect that these teams, the drivers have to have respect on the track. Well, the teams, even perhaps even more so in the pit lane and in the paddock, particularly this year when the pit boxes themselves are down as low, as small as I can remember them. I think it's just on 20 feet from, well, from line same, to line. Same as last year, isn't it? But what's interesting, John, is... Yesterday was 23. Well, same number of cars as last year. Cars, cars, uh, more cars than last year. No, there were 61, 61 last year. OK. Uh, well, cars are longer, though, aren't they? Well, that's what I was just going to say. Well, the, the, uh, the GTP cars, yes, they're, they're almost two feet longer than the other cars, so they are a lot less manoeuvrable. Not, you know, the, the other category cars are still pretty much the same. Well, they are the same uh, as before. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the prototype cars, they're a lot less manoeuvrable on pit lane. A bit of gathering cloud to the west end of the speedway. Not forecast for any precipitation uh, over the next 21 and a half hours. Also, temperature overnight, uh, quite temperate if the forecast is to be believed, staying in the... Uh, and why would one not? Weather forecasting is an odd science, yeah, well, isn't I can tell it? You what, it's changed uh, regularly this week, uh, the forecast. Let's have a look, see what it, what it says nowadays. Uh, yeah, the, right now for... Mid-50s mid uh, overnight, isn't it? So they're expecting yeah. it to be somewhere in the 13, 14, 15 Celsius. Uh, Shea Adam uh, in the pit lane has made a way down to pit in and has just called in to have a look at the BMW M Hybrid V8, the number 25 car that had that uh, hybrid warning earlier on. How's it looking down there, Shea? Not great. Uh, still in quite a state of undress for the car. No indication of them putting body panels back onto it either. And there were about seven mechanics standing around fiddling with various things in the back portion of the car. Uh, no drivers around in sight either. So it's going to be a while yet before we see the other BMW come back out on the circuit. OK, thank you, Shea. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. What's it say for tonight, uh, Jeremy? Are we low, going to get some decent sleep? Low, low, of six, low of 60 now, and that's oh. 11 o'clock tonight. Uh, midnight, 61, 2 a.m., 62. So uh, that's a lot better. I mean, it was, we were talk, they were talking about that's 40s. That's far off where we are now. Uh, no, that's exactly. what we're, that's we're talking about 16, 17, 18 yeah, Celsius now. Yeah. No, incredible. Yeah, I better put my shorts on before I go to sleep in the front seat of the BMW under the undercroft tonight. 74 is the ranch Riley car, and that at the moment is second. It's a battle between Ligiers and Duquesne. Gar Robinson's been doing a cracking job. Has Gar been in since the start, Jeremy? I think he has, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he has, yeah. And so he's clearly super glued himself to the seat there, is ignoring any pit messages to get out of that car. Sits in second position in that distinctive bright orange and blue colour. Get his, get his stint done. Stint's done, his time, minimum time done, and then handed over to the professionals that he uh, has alongside him in that number 74. Um, and what's the drive time in, in LMP3? Uh, is four that and a half four and a half as well, right? Yeah, OK. I thought it was. Yep. LMP2, LMP3 and GTD, four and a half. Right. Well, what's he in already? He's already over two hours, so he's done half of it nearly already, hasn't he? Yeah. Came for three, actually, aren't we? Now, of course, he couldn't do all of that in the first six hours because you're limited to four hours in any six. Uh, I don't think he will. Here comes the number 60 to go by down in turn number one. Keeps out the way. That's a perfect illustration. Clip that up. Perfect illustration of how to let a faster car through and how to overtake a slower car without nosing up and making a whole legs of both of your laps. Guard just left a car's width at the entrance to the corner. We're still able to take a late apex out of turn two. Cost himself next to nothing in time. No stress for Colin Brown, who's close to 
back to within eight tenths of the leader, Renga van der Zand, after he was challenging a couple of four laps ago. Number of people out seeing just how extraordinary it is watching the GP, GTP cars navigate through the traffic, including Nick de Groot. Good evening, as it will be for Alex Brungle. Tuned in. We look for your season, uh, Alex. Here's his take on it from RSL Race Control, one of our commentary voices in the past. We'll have it back any time. Acura looks planted. Caddy, uh, possibly more drivability and torque. Porsche is shared behind, and can't see. He says, can't wait to see what happens when they crank them up tomorrow. Thanks, Alex. I hope you're going to be around for that, watching and listening. I presume you're back in the UK, but uh, he could be travelling. He's a professional racing driver, as well as a professional broadcaster, which is somewhat unfair, because that's two jobs he's taking now. It's two Brundles taking commentary jobs at the moment. <laughs> He does uh, F2 and F3 for, for fun. Which we see and hear on Sky in the UK. Also should say hello to our good friend Phil Anson, who's the voice of Formula One, and it will be Formula Two and Formula Three for the English language Middle East broadcast. Some 30 million people tuning in to Phil. I know Phil will be lending us his ears and his eyes at the moment out in Dubai. Good luck to you, Phil. Thanks for all your help in the last few weeks when we've been over there. A couple of laps ago, Richard Westbrook in car number zero two for Cadillac Racing uh, got ahead of Matty Campbell in number seven car. That's for sixth position. Our Porsche keys to the race, race get to dusk, midnight and dawn. You've got long, long, long night, but it's not dark here. And a new leader in GTD standard, that's the green door panels coming down to the International well, it, horseshoe. Yeah, the same order. Sorry, thing, but those two, they're, they're still very close together. So it's Frankie Monte Calvo in number 12 ahead of, ahead of Kenton Cook in number 32 Mercedes. And it's a battle for the lead in uh, GTD heading around turn six. And they are yeah, maybe a couple of three seconds ahead of Daniel Morad in the number 57 car for Windward Racing up to third place then, Daniel. Uh, and he's pursued by Brendan Ereeb, who's driving the Inception racing McLaren, that's car number 70. Ashton Harrison next up in fifth position in the race's edge with Wayne Taylor Racing, Andretti Autosport and everybody else under the sun. Number 93, Acura. She's got a train of cars behind her, actually. Yeah, Andy yeah. Lally and James, Andrea Calderelli, Axel Jeffries, Mark Miller, all in one long train. That's what we, that's what we uh, get used to in GTD. Sunset tonight, officially 5.59 and 7.14 a.m. sunrise. So 13 hours, 15 minutes. And when the moon comes up tonight, we had 53%. It's a waxing gibbous moon this evening. It's a bit cloudy tonight. Uh, we've also got a SpaceX launch, I think, as well during the race. Uh, um, there was there was one. There was supposed to be night, one a couple of nights overnight, ago. Overnight, but, but, but I don't the, the one at 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm not sure it happened. So I think, it, but I think the, it did. I, I saw something somewhere. There was a, there was a launch a couple three days ago, but I wasn't sure what it was. Uh, I did see Starlink. something. Starlink. Uh, said there might be one during the race. Maybe uh, we've got our dates wrong. So, that battle that Jeremy said, the court of cart, well, that's right there now. Had been leading, of course, that uh, number 32, Mercedes. He's got a little tap from people to Rani in the 31 car, didn't it? And spun him at the western end of the infield. They're heading into the braking area for turn seven. They've got a little bit of a distraction in that they've got the Andretti 
machine right with them. Uh, a bit of drama for the number 74, Grant Robinson, in the pit lane. Yeah. And it was dead stick when it passed Shea Adam heading up towards Nick Dearman. Yeah, from second place in class, the 74 in uh, P3. That is, I think he's got the clutch. It's going to make it. it uh, it's interesting because he came in uh, and he, a massive puff of smoke came out from the rear right. And I thought, oh, he's just really desperately trying to uh, hit his mark. And he's, he's locked the tyres. He's probably like something worse. But unless he has actually run out of fuel, which is... I would say it's unlikely because none of the other P3s have come in. So they're starting off with they normally do a piece of new tyres on. Um, but yeah, let's see what happens this one. Change of lead in GTD whilst Nick was uh, reporting on that issue for the number 74 Riley. Branch 74 car, that's the leash here. Was in second in the pit lane, we'll keep an eye on that. And Kenton Cook has overhauled Frankie Monucalvo, so it's the dark grey and black 32 car on the infield now heading towards the high banging that leads from the bright yellow and black the bumblebee colours of the Lexus. New car coming for Lexus. Let's believe that might already be in development. Likely to see that car possibly before the end of this year. Not sure when it's going to debut Cadillac on oh, Cadillac action coming out of the international horseshoe and this is the battle for fifth and sixth position Richard Westbrook's on a bit of a, a charge he overtook the number seven Porsche just a few laps ago and now closed right up onto the tail of Jack Aitken in number 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac and Nick Damon is watching I'm afraid some quite extensive work required on that Riley run uh, LMP3 car. Yeah, they came in, they did the full service, uh, took off the rear deck, and what happened then was after the deck came off, they, uh, the mechanic looked in and they did the universal side of it, it's going no further, the hands across the throat, either nip in, and there is a load of engine oil sitting on the under tray. So either a union's come off, which is the good news, or there's a hole in something where there shouldn't be a hole. And this is the car that's won the last two years. Well, winning really is going to be difficult. I'm not even sure they can get back because if that's a hole in the engine, it ain't going no further. We have had engine problems with these P3s this week. Oddly, yeah, Sean Creech Motorsport had an issue as well, didn't they? Had to change an engine. So there will be, this year, a new LMP3 winner at the Rolex 24 hours because no one else has won it since the P3s uh, came along. Uh, that is very, very bad news indeed for that team. To quote the great Hugh Chamberlain, the only good news is they'll be able to get packed up and leave before the pubs close. Scant consolation, I would suggest, for the team who have taken home a couple of watches in P3 in the last couple of seasons. You're listening to IMSA Radio, live from trackside. We're on the fifth floor overlooking the... Trioval right next to race control, 107.9 FM around the track. Nice to have you company. Further afield, here in the US, Sirius XM 207. And of course, RS2 for audio on the player. Imsaradio.com, it's also a live video there if you're outside the US. One or two countries. Well, you can't get it because you've got uh, network TV coverage. We'll give it a try. You'll soon find out. And the audio is never J.O. blocked, and we never ask you for any money either. So if you are outside the US and uh, somebody's asking you for money for it, please don't pay it. Go to imsa.tv or... Imsa Radio and pick up the feed. Here in the States, of course, Lee Diffie leading an extensive and experienced team of 14 broadcasters to cover this for NBC this weekend. Our TV partners again here in the US for the 2023 Imsa season. You see the pit stop for the second place car in LMP2. Francesco Pizzi brought in the uh, number 55 car, that is the Proton Competition entry, the Black and blue coloured car. I'm not sure who has the car's back out of the track again. It's still shown as the Italian at the wheel. Be doing a nice job there, hanging on to the tail 
of, uh, of uh, Alex Quinn, really not losing much ground at all. It's still number 52 car that leads then. Scott Huffaker, uh, who previously drove number 52 car, now driving for TDS Racing car number 11, is pursuing in second position. Uh, fuel only in that pit stop that we're talking about. No driver change, no tyres. Fuel mm -hmm. only. Yeah, for PT. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, coming round to another racing hour completed, down to 21 hours. Let's get this in before we start another pit stop cycle. Uh, Alex Quinn leading LMP, second in LMP2, has just put... Check that again, it's got Huffinger second in LMP2, has just put in that car's fastest lap of the race. That car being the TDS racing car, 139.7. 08. He's second in that class to Alex Quinn, Josh Pearson third for the number 35, and that is the fastest lap of the race in LMP2, Jeremy tells me. Renger van der Zander leads Colin Brown by now 2.2 seconds, Cadillac versus Acura. And the bad news in the PGTP category is we've lost the 25 BMW. Has uh, had hybrid problems and most recently Another casualty with, uh, we think, an engine problem, oil coming out of where it shouldn't alter. For the car that was second, the number 74, Ranch Resorts, Riley. That leaves in LMP3 now, Matt Bell leading for AWA. It's Matthew Bell, UK Matthew Bell, from the northeast of England originally. In second, the number 85, Timon van der Helm, driven JDC Miller Motorsports bright yellow car. It's the car with my other car as a Porsche on the side, isn't it? And which is a little in joke because they're waiting for their 963 customer car. Uh, 33 is in third position. Anybody's ever ordered a new car knows that, you know, it's one of those things. You just wait for it. 33 in third is the Sean Creech Motorsport car. Three GTD pros at the front of the GTD field. Corvette with Jordan Taylor by just three quarters of a second from Frankie Montecalvo in second. Sorry, from Jack Hawksworth in second and David Pittard in third. It's about another second and a half back. Second back now. So 3, 14 and 23. Three different manufacturers there. Chevy Corvette C8R, Lexus RCF GT3 and Aston Martin Vantage GT. The new Corvette GT3 car, the purpose-built GT3 car. Remember, this car here is the, the GTLM car, which was engineered to LMP3, GT3 pace, sorry. And that car was revealed this week to uh, some applause and aplomb. It's uh, been very well received indeed. In GTD itself, Kent Cook by three seconds in the court of Mercedes from Daniel Morad. Drafted in to the Windward Racing team, running in a strong second place in that car that has made uh, their mechanics and a couple of teams as well a bit weary overnight. Completely rebuilt into a new shell, that car. Frankie Monte Calvo in the GTD Lexus, number 12 in third position. Mercedes, Mercedes, Lexus. McLaren actually, we should mention Brendan Arib doing a pretty good job there in that uh, number 70 car. This is the uh, Inception racing machine that he sh shares with uh, Frederick Schandorf, Ollie Milroy, with a new, new old helmet design actually. He's gone back to an old helmet design, but it is a new helmet. And Mar Marvin Kerkhofer in that car sitting in fourth position. Brendan will be pleased with that. And his lap times have been pretty steady as well, around about the uh, mid to high 148s. Holds on to fourth position in that category. And that is your VP Racing Fuels update. VP and Stay Frosty, the official coolant of the IMSA Championships. More details at the VP website. Nick Damon can give us a quick update uh, from his end of pit lane. Yeah, it's been quite busy. The P2 is obviously coming in. The, uh, the, the, the dance of the limited pit lane uh, happening with the 11 and the 35 with the two TDS uh, 
entries. The 11 came in first, so the 35 had to come in at an angle because it's pissing further towards pit out. It stuck that on the dolly jack to get it straight, but then of course the 11 couldn't leave. So it has to be said that the pit boxes are actually too small, so I'm not sure there's anything that IMSA can do anything about. You can't really make the, uh, the pit lane longer for Daytona, but they are too small. These cars can't avoid them. We've also had the, uh, the Iron Dames in for a full service. Uh, we had the uh, Lamborghini, the NT Lamborghini that caused the, uh, the yellow flag a while ago. That came in as well. It's, we've got Mark, we undamaged, I think, on straight on at turn one. And a plethora of P2s, not all of whom I could see, because some of them are a very long way away. Alex Quinn, fresh out of the Pier 1 Matheson wins machine in LMP2. Welcome to IMSA. That was an initiation by fire for your opening stint, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, it all went to plan, really, apart from one moment when I had, I think, two or three GTs spin in front of me. We had to take a void in action. And I was like, well, if there's one way to welcome me to sports car racing, that's the way. So um, certainly opened my eyes, but I think the pace is OK. Um, we'll keep working. There's a long way to go. So yeah, it was, uh, once I got into the rhythm, I was feeling more confident, and the car feels good so far. So, Do you get much of a break now before you have to get back in? Uh, yeah, I think we've got a couple hours. Um, ben done a great job in his first stint. Um, so, yeah, I'll jump back in. Hopefully, we'll still be up there and um, try and do the best I can. So if this is your initiation into sports car racing, does that mean tonight's going to be your initiation to night racing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've done a couple testing at the uh, Raw and then earlier in the week, but I enjoyed it in the night. We were quick again, so hopefully we can keep it up. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> what an initiation in the sports car. So, uh, you fancy doing a multi-class sports car racing, yeah? Done it before? No. OK. Uh, it's the Daytona, the Rolex Daytona 24. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, welcome to the fifth floor, to Peter Mackay. How are you, sir? I'm very well, John. I've uh, been absolutely gripped to this fantastic motor race so far after three hours uh, of running. And uh, I think, what, you know, obviously it's a shame to see the BMW M Hybrid V8 uh, have to, to go behind the wall for, for a little while, but they're back running again. But all, all things being uh, all things being equal, some great racing at the front, <coughs> excuse me, but particularly with the, uh, the GTPs, which is great. Uh, a bit earlier on, uh, you uh, having a word with Hurley Haywood, big, big uh, uh, anniversary for, for Hurley and Porsche, 50 years since that magnificent win for him. Yeah. And I bet he remembers it as if it was yesterday and could oh. tell you every lap of every race and every gear change. Uh, oh, the recall is incredible. No, it, that was a real privilege to sit and, and have a conversation with Hurley in the uh, Porsche house. And uh, uh, his co-driver, Peter Gregg, um, of course, sadly no longer with us, but his son, uh, actually drove their winning car this morning in the historic parade, which was quite quite an emotional moment, it must be said. Uh, um, so, no, that was a real privilege to, to see that, and great to, to see him here, still part of the, the Porsche family and still here. And, but I tell you what, when it came to 10 minutes before the start of the race, he was made sure he was absolutely at the front of the uh, front of the queue to get a good view of the, uh, the, the, uh, the action. It's the uh, Corvette. Number three is into pit lane from the lead of GTD Pro because number 96, Turner BMW, uh, that is the GTD car. Uh, number 96, driven by Patrick Gallagher, stopped at the Western Horseshoe, just on the left-hand side of the entry to the Western Horseshoe, and that car is, doesn't appear to be going anywhere, and we have a full course yellow for that. See, look, we were doing really nicely, Peter, before you uh, turned up. Is this up. my fault, is it? It is. Uh, OK, Ash sorry, Ashtag folks. Slim P -Mac. Sorry, folks. Turns up, and we get our... <laughs> so third, Jeremy, or fourth? fourth third. 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 Thank you. A uh, couple of cars anticipating that share, Adam, uh, down in the pit lane. Yeah, Corvette nailing that stop. Looks like they did a data stick change. It's too soon for that. That has to be done between hour five and seven of the race, um, for the first one at least, and then there's uh, three more instances, but also making it into the pit lane. The heart of racing, the number 27, I, that definitely was a driver change. There was a gold-ish helmet going in, so I'm going to guess it was Roman DeAngelis taking over the car. Those were the two cars down to my end who made it in before the yellow lights came on. Oh, and by the way, Jordan Taylor, thank you for that wonderful burnout leaving the pit lane. That was a nice smoky exit. Burnouts are uh, discouraged in uh, in some form of sports car racing. Um, however, they I think they're mandatory for everything bar the GTPs. 
here in IMSA, and long may that be uh, be the case. It is uh, one of the things that I really en enjoy about it. That uh, Liquid Molly 96 BMW is uh, looking like it's, it's had a bit of oil coming out of its uh, side exhaust, the side of that car looking a bit grimy. Is quite it, it has been has been like that for most of the race. Uh, it, it, we saw that last year on that BMW when it debuted. So it's maybe just a feature of it. Um, but yeah, something not right there for Patrick Gallagher. Uh, losing power, pulling it up, and yeah, just waiting on some assistance at the moment. But that's a, a real shame for the for the Turner team. Such a powerhouse in uh, the Emsa WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. They have two cars in the field this year. One in the GTD class, which is this car, the 96, and one in the GTD Pro for Daytona um, with a full factory uh, top pro lineup in, in there at the moment. Uh, the other car the <coughs> is, uh, dude, oh, it's been a little bit, little bit down the, the order, eighth in GTD Pro at the moment. So not, not the best of days for Turner so far. So the uh, AMR safety crew uh, giving the 96 Turner BMW some assistance, taking it back off the circuit as well. So hopefully we won't be under to yellow flag for too long. Uh, let's go to Nick Damon in the pit lane. Yeah, just having a bit of a, a look to my left, and there was the 79 uh, WeatherTech Mercedes-Benz that had come in uh, under a closed pit lane, so it must have come in for a bit of an emergency service. Um, you know, you were talking about you would know it's a good for emergency service and five, five litres of five seconds of fuel you come back round again. Um, you know you talk about the marvellous black lines. They can be overdone. I'm, I'm currently outside with the TDS pit with the 11, the 35, couple of, and there's about now about four mil of just rubber on the middle of the middle of the uh, the exit part of the pit box. So much so that when I came up here a while ago, they were actually trying to clean some of it off with brake fluid. They got so much <laughs> of the stuff. So you know you can actually. Hey, but that's fluid. precision. I mean, if you're going to put down the 11s, then you know that's precision. If you've done two or three pit stops and it's just the two yeah. lines. Right now, it looks like the um, the the the, uh, the art of a three-year-old. You have to put in the fridge. You've got no choice. And that's you, mummy and daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Nick Damon, down in the pit lane. Johnny Palmer keeping an eye on what's going on. We'll hear from him and Bruce uh, between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. East rooftop rail duty then as well. That's uh, Night Owl's night shift powered by Sacred Coffee. And he reckons the uh, Cadillac 01, the Acura 10, the number six Porsche and the number 31 Cadillac were all due for a stop as the yellow came out. So we've got to do the pass around, which is happening now. The Renger van der Zando is 55 minutes into his stint, as was Louis Delatraz in the number 10 Konica Minolta Acura 01 uh, Cadillac for Renger van der Zander. Uh, 55 minutes for Mathieu Jamini in the number 6 uh, Penske Porsche, likewise Jack Aitkins. Johnny, uh, Johnny Palmer, unsurprisingly, is absolutely spot on right on the stint length for the uh, GTP field. Colin Brown's the one who's... Uh, been, been out for the kind of lowest amount along with uh, Richard Westbrook in the 02 Cadillac racing car as well. So yeah, They all pitted uh, under yellow. Yes. So they, they did uh, a couple of, a couple or three or even four laps of yellow uh, and then, counted and then in then that 50 Ah, okay, yeah. So, ah, so they maybe were just a wee bit earlier than Jeremy, you think? What? For their pit stop. Yeah, well, right, yeah, just, yeah, 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 it's about right. Yeah, 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 about yeah nice, it, nicely yeah. timed yellow. Yeah. yeah. Maybe send some send some tacos down to Turner Motorsport as a thank you for the nicely timed let yellow. They've not had the best weekend, uh, have they? They no. had a very no. un Turner uh, race yesterday for the BMW um, endurance event, the, uh, the four hour race for Mission Pilot Challenge. Uh, at one stage, both of their cars were given uh, a pit lane uh, penalty because one of them, one of the crews left out equipment and the other one ran over it. And that's not normal for Will Turner's team. So maybe they're getting all of their foo bars out of the way the start of the season. Uh, hearing from spectators over at the far side that uh, that number 96 Turner car 
Driver has stayed in the car. Who was it that was in that car? Patrick was it, Gallagher. It was Patrick Gallagher, was it? Okay. He's, he's trying to fire it, but there's just a faint clicking noise. There's still electric power to it because the number panel is still illuminating and the light is still on. Thanks to Jake Parrott, who's been uh, eyes and ears uh, around a number of parts of the circuit, listening in on 107.9 FM, of course, around the track. And if you are uh, staying close by, you've got your RV here, and you're going to peel away for some stage. Uh, stick your FM radio earpiece in, and you can hear what's going on. I'm reliably informed that you can hear it uh, quite a wee way away, certainly enough to go over to one Daytona and grab uh, something to eat. All right, stand by your beds down in the pits, or at least stand by your wheel guns. Shea Adam, to you first, as we have the leader, the yellow-fronted Cadillac comes to you for service. With all the other GTP cars, we've got the Meyer Shank Racing Acura hitting its marks first fuel, and... No, yeah, no tires going on the Meyer Shank Racing Acura. We've got tires for the wheel and Cadillac, though. Both of the Porsches are in. The number six is getting tires. The number seven is not. Seven overshot its box by quite a bit, actually. It's needing to be pulled back. Driver change for the 24 BMW. That was Augusto Farfus getting out. Marco Fitman, I believe, that was with the all-black helmet getting aboard that one. We also have the driver's side door open for the 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac. I did not see a driver change going on there, so I'm wondering if maybe that's a water bottle, but keep an eye on the name just in case as they leave the pits. New tires for the Cadillac, still waiting on any one of these cars to be able to leave. First one to leave is the MSR Acura. That's the pink one. They're pulling back the six so that it can leave because the seven was still in its box of Porsche blocking Porsche, but the number six managing to get out second. Then we have the number 10 for... Uh, WTR and ready, and then all the rest of them. The last one off the lane will be the number seven, Porsche, the one that overshot its box. It, it, it did overshoot its box, and it had to, actually, because there was no choice. It couldn't get turned in any tighter. It was almost a full pit box too far. The Zero One Cadillac also had an issue because they couldn't clear the Zero Two car, and they had to get pulled back. The Porsche number six had to get pulled back as well. So that that is not perfect through there. And that's cost the Porsche number six a position, actually, Shea. That went out in, uh, it was rolling. Um, it should have probably got out second in the line, but it, uh, with that pullback, it, it had to drop in behind, I think it was the Koninka Minolta Acura that got around it. So I think it'll be third in the line. Nick Dearman, what was going on at your end? Well, we had the, the entirety of the P3 field come in. That's the entirety of the P3, P3 field losing. The key thing really is we didn't get many takers in the P2s. They just come in. So we did not see uh, the leading P2s come in or didn't go past me. In fact, I think I only really saw um, I think the 18 did come in and then the 8s come in, but that's the recovering tower car. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it was a P3 fest, um, but not P2. Noticed that the uh, wind dealer racing with Andretti Autosport, Konica Minolta Acura, did take tyres, unlike some of its uh, GTP counterparts there. So watch out for that number 10, Konica Minolta Acura of Louis Delacraz to, uh, to be pretty racy uh, as this thing progresses. Maybe not immediately because they maybe have a little bit less temperature in compared to those who kept their existing cosy tyres on. But Colin Brown in the lead of the motor race after. Uh, those pit stops. So, I tell you what, John, it's fantastic to see Colin Brown getting this opportunity. Totally He's agree. had so much success. Uh, him and John Bennett have just been such a dynamic duo. Um, but we've always, always known just how fast uh, Colin is, and this is just the opportunity he needs to show and uh, what exactly what he's uh, made of. Exceptional loyalty shown by John Bennett oh, yeah. to Colin and Colin to John Bennett like, yeah. to the point where when Colin got the opportunity, John said, do you know what? I'm not sure I want to race with anybody else, which I thought was wow. was really interesting. Uh, here come the GTD. Shea Adam, you've got a couple of the top runners with you, first of all. Part of Racing is doing a pit stop change for the number 23, and Alex Riveris is jumping aboard, so that is one driver change. We've got Mike Conway, yes, that Mike Conway, world champion, jumping aboard the number 14 Lexus. Fuel and tires for both of these cars. Fuel and tires as well for the WeatherTech Racing Mercedes that came down and received emergency service, and it is now Jules Gagnon aboard them. Well, Dick. 70 Inception McLaren, that's his friend in Uribe getting out. Oli Milroy getting in after playing with a tennis ball for half an hour to get his reactions up. Cover two nights. The 42 uh, NT Labby comes in again. That was in quite recently. They decided to top up in doing so. They've kind of semi blocked the uh, McLaren, which is going to be very unpopular. 
Uh, beyond that, we have uh, the, uh, I can see an Aston Martin, I the numbers have gone through, but there's a, yeah, a good take on the 57 Wimbledon is going, but I've got the 32 team Korkoff, uh, the same thing, two of the Mercs, the harder race of the 23, as they all now move. We also did get the, uh, the number one, the Paul Miller Racing uh, BMW M4. Daniel Morad on board the number 57 windward uh, Mercedes, a, a late end, a late addition to the team, of course, after uh, Lucas Auer's unfortunate uh, accident a couple of days ago. It's good to see that Lucas has had a successful surgery and uh, hopefully we'll make a, a speedy recovery. We wish him all the best, but great opportunity for, uh, for Daniel, of course, former winner in the GTD category, don't forget, five years ago with Allegra Porsche. Um, so great to see him, but he's become more closely affiliated with the Mercedes AMG brand over the last uh, couple of years, and quite a bit of that's been driven by uh, Daniel's virtual, mo virtual motorsport. He's a, a Mercedes uh, simulator driver uh, as well, and that's kind of brought him into the cockpit uh, in the outdoor world as, as well, which is which is great to uh, see. I have to say, I've got to get used to this Mike Conway's helmet inside a, a GT car. This is just bizarre, actually. You get so used to a driver being in a certain environment, and. Mike's been with Toyota for a long time well, in, in their a, prototypes. Still a Toyota brand, isn't it? Uh, of course it is, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it means he hasn't had to get a new helmet uh, painted up for the uh, just the change of visor strip. Um, but then you always find when drivers come from to one style of racing, one style of car, excuse me, to one that they're not familiar with, it doesn't take them very long to get used to it. G give it, give it a, a little bit of mileage, and, and, and they're right there. You, you just see that good drivers are good drivers. Jeremy, uh, we did get an emergency stop. I think we uh, we briefly mentioned it. It was the 14 Lexus. Yeah, which was running uh, in the second place right behind the Corvette uh, uh, in uh, GTD. Uh, so I think that... GTD Pro, excuse me. I think that car made an, uh, would have made an extra stop then because it, it needed yes. service. The number three Corvette, however, that was leading the class, that came, didn't it? I think right before the caution came out. Uh, yes, that's correct. There was another emergency stop as well, uh, which was the number 79, I think, Shears just said in my ear. That was the WeatherTech Racing Mercedes as well. Thank you, Shear, for reminding me about that. Uh, I had sort of put that to one side to try and remember to say, and then I got distracted. Odd of that. Uh, so, back to the front then, after their tail change and uh, that... Uh, precautionary change of the tail after a, what looked to have been a brush on the wall for the accurate ERS 06. I wonder if that was when Colin went onto the high side uh, and made that massive move uh, earlier on. Just brushed the uh, the right-hand wing end plate uh, on that, uh, that number 60 car. So a tail change uh, and a couple of pit stops ago, which dropped them down because they did two pit stops in quick... Uh, succession, their pit lane team are absolutely on fire tonight for MSR and they've got Colin Brown back into the lead as we are under full caution here behind the safety car, 20 hours 39 minutes exactly to go What's interesting is in the medium centre earlier they had a, a press conference with all of the GTP team principals and you sit there with Roger Penske, Chip Ganassi, Bobby Ray Hall, Michael Andretti, Wayne Taylor, etc. Mike Shank, bear in mind, he won this race last year, won the Indy 500 in 2021, and he, he's so modest. He said, I just can't believe I'm sitting here. The fact that I'm sitting here is like an out of body experience sitting with uh, Bobby Ray Hall and Roger Penske, etc. And he, 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 sh he didn't feel that way because he's, he's <laughs> he is here on merit and they've really shown some fantastic pace with that team. And as you say, the uh, the pit crew have been magic for, for MSR so far in this race. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, seventh lead change then, with uh, Colin Brown now taking over at the front. Uh, quite a shuffle of positions there. They came into the pits in the order 0, 1, 60, 10, 6, 31, 7, 0, 2 and 24. Number 60 car then leapt up one position into first. Number 6 car up two positions into second, number 10 car remained in third position, number 02 car went from seventh to fourth, number 31 car remained in fifth place, number 01 car, however, fell from first all the way down to sixth, uh, and then uh, behind that, the uh, BMW 
kind of 24 made up a position at the expense of the number seven Porsche. So uh, the loser there was uh, not the 0-1 car. Scott Dixon is now at the wheel of that car, taken over from Renko van der Zander, who took over from uh, Sebastian Bourdais, who started that car. This is, uh, is this Scott's, this is a big number for Scott, is it his 10th successive race or something like that? Did I read earlier on the day, have I made that up? Might even be more than that, actually. Um, successive race, uh, I can look that one up, he's, he, this, this is uh, Scott Dixon's um, 20th, 20th, race. 20th race. Yes, I knew it was a that was a big number. Joe Bradley uh, down in the pit lane. Before we go back to green, time for a quick driver interview. Who have you got, Joe? Yeah, the number 16, right Motorsports Porsche has just uh, come in. Zach, Zachary Rubichon has just got out. Zach, how was that stint? Um, you Porsche guys have had to come into this race with a different mindset, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, right now. Every year at the 24, the first 18 hours is about making smart decisions, and this year it's even more important because uh, you know we just we just want to make it to the end, and we want to make it there with a, a car that's intact. That for whatever may happen before then and, and until then, that we we have a car at the end, and I think that's the best way for us to get a result. So you know these restarts can get pretty hectic out there, so it's about making the right decisions and and making it to the end. Any issues there? You mentioned your drinks bottle. Describe that one, will you? Yeah, I, my little chew thing fell off, so I was leaking all over me. I was like, at first I thought I was sweating a lot, and then I realized what was going on. Uh, that's that's uh, yeah, as if the job's not hard enough. Is that distracting? Uh, it is at Daytona because you got so much time to think about stuff on the banking. Normally you wouldn't even realize, but here you're kind of just twiddling your thumbs going through the banking, and you're sort of thinking, what is what is that going on there? But uh, once once you're in the infield, it's it's no problem at all. Thanks, mate. I'll let you dry off. Thank you, Zach. So uh, we should are looking at the the last of the cars getting uh, the wave around the number 91 Kelly Moss with Riley Porsche. That's uh, Julian Andlauer uh, at the wheel of that car again. One of Porsche's top young drivers just hurrying to get back to the uh, end of uh, the line before we go back green again. Also the uh, FAF uh, Motorsport Four. Porsche, the red and black plaid machine last year's GTD Pro Champions and GTD Champions from the year before with Zach Robichon and Lawrence Van Tour, Zach we just heard from there with the interview with uh, with Joe and uh, he hasn't been there weekend um, but it's a long long race and there's very very good at executing strategy and as, as uh, I think also the right motorsport crew as Zach mentioned there too really know how to uh, how to make the absolute most out of a 24 hour race as well Pace car lights are off. Oh, are they? Yes, they are. So Pace car is in, about to go back green, John. Safety car comes into the pit. We have four different safety cars representing the four GTP manufacturers. There were four wide coming to the start of the race, which was uh, rather impressive on its own. Bit of weaving uh, around from the leader there. Colin Brown trying to break the tour, coming on the tri-oval with Matthew Jabonet, dives down into the first corner, there's a decent gap there. Second of the Porsche is going really deep into turn one, and Matt Campbell's gone by at least one car. Caught Marco Vittman rather unawares there as Campbell comes through. Big lot of one car further ahead. That was the 31 Alex Sims driven, Alexander Sims driven wheel and engineering Cadillac. That was into turn three, the International Horseshoe. So things getting pretty feisty very, very early on. And clearly, Matt Campbell feeling the opportunity to make up some positions while everybody is lying astern after the restart. Running the red light at the pick exit has been spotted. And that will be high-class racing coming back in the pit lane and standing still for a full minute. That is a really painful uh, penalty there for high class racing at the moment. They're sitting uh, ninth in class with Ed Jones at the wheel, a few a few laps uh, behind. Uh, Era Motorsport showing as leading in LMP2, a lap ahead of everybody. As a change for the was that a change for the lead? Yes, yes it uh, was. Yes, it was. With well, a yes, Porsche, the Porsche the two Porsches coming off. If the... for second, for second, uh, Braun, he's uh, Colin Brown's gone. 
<laughs> He's checked out. Uh, ah, this right. is a battle for second position between Chamonix so and Delatraz. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. in the in the uh, so Porsche versus Acura on the high banks and Colin Brown. He's he's checking out. He's like, see you later, guys. Side by wow. side with the number ten Cunningham and Aldercar and the red and white striped number six as they go down into turn one now and turn in. Still side by side and still with the Alexander Sims driven number thirty one. Cadillac behind them, so Jamine must have lost second place and then regained it going into turn seven. WeatherTech car is going to be back in as well for a drive through. That was spinning the wheels whilst off the ground. I tell you who else is pretty feisty as well, and that's Matt Campbell looking at two Cadillacs, three Cadillacs ahead of him. Scott Dixon, Richard Westbrook, and Alexander Sims all ahead of him now. And it, there's been a change there as Scott Dixon's gone ahead of Richard Westbrook and now Richard Westbrook coming under pressure from Matt Campbell and that is the battle for fifth sixth and seventh position looks like Scott Dixon now is setting about the 31 Alexander Sims wheel and Cadillac as they're already starting to catch cars that weren't right on the back of the safety car train when we went back to green flag Absolutely no doubt about this that that number 60 Acura in clear air, in particular, gentlemen, is quick. Yeah. We saw it with um, Tom Blomqvist earlier on, and Peter was seeing it again with Colin Brown, able to seemingly pull away, particularly from restarts. Absolutely, restarts is, is the thing that we're on that when the tyres are not quite at their absolute maximum. Uh, uh, the absolute optimum, excuse me, temperature and pressure, uh, whether it be Colin Brown or uh, Tom Blukefist, they're really mastering these restarts. And I tell you what, when we come into the crucial final couple of hours tomorrow, uh, late morning, early afternoon, that's going to be such a vital attribute to have uh, in their locker. Don't forget, they've got Simon Pagano and Elio Castroneves sitting, waiting to come into that car as well, so the depth they have in their driver lineup as well. They're in a really good position right now, number 60, yeah. Marshank Racing Acura. Uh, uh, yeah. Elio and Simon told me they had a really complex jigsaw to finish before they wanted to get into the uh, <laughs> into the car. It's not true, by the way. Uh, potential gearbox issue for the Liquid Molly Turner BMW that uh, has been towed away, actually, from Turn 5 down at the western end of the infield. It's on its way back to the pit lane so brown having cleared off to around about two seconds ahead of the field from chamonix in second then delatraz alexander sims still holding on in third position um, jeremy you were spot on you thought the uh, number 18 car had uh, been a little uh, ambitious on the Wave by, and in fact, uh, it has so that now that'll be a very punitive penalty. I'll see it in motorsport, it, yeah. It, it, I did think it was bizarre that they'd gone a lap ahead of everybody, John, but uh, yeah, improper final wave by procedure. Caritin here in motorsport, Dwight Merriman is the car owner. Uh, in, in on board at the moment. He's been able to get quite a bit of his driving time out the way. Ryan DL took a single stint uh, earlier on, but uh, Dwight just uh, taking that away. But stop plus three minutes, 20. That's at least two laps he's yeah. going to lose, maybe even three, depending on how it falls. It, it's always a, a, a function of the, the lap time. Let's go to GTD, check out what's happening there. Roman De Angelis leads for Hart of racing in the 27 car, his team car, the number 23, the pro car, Alex Riveras uh, is having a look round the outside of one car and now diving down to the inside of another, that's the number 57, Daniel Morad driven machine, that is the GTD third position car, so at the moment, Hart are racing first and second in two different classes in GT Daytona. What uh, what a fight back from the number 57 oh. windward Mercedes crew. They had to start very near the back because they they brought a new. They had a, a big a big accident earlier in the week. They had to fly uh, they had to fly their mechanics back to Texas, load the spare car into the truck, drive it here, and they had it ready to go middle of the next afternoon. 
and the fact that they started near the back of the pack, they at the moment are fourth of all the GTD cars, third in the GTD class. Uh, Daniel Mora doing a top job at the moment at the wheel of that car as well. It's got a slightly different livery on it. It was white, blue and red. It's now black, blue and red. I think that's due that they uh, happened to get it stickered up. The car, of course, and it's, uh, um, should we say, closer to what it comes from the factory uh, like as well. Richard Westbrook, that restart hasn't quite got to plan for, for, for Westy in the 0-2, just dropped back to a couple of positions. Uh, he's in uh, seventh uh, uh, overall at the moment behind Matt Campbell and Scott Dixon, but the pff, GTP absolutely on top of each other. All of the cars uh, that haven't had, apart, obviously, with, with put aside the number 25 BMW that's had the, the issues earlier on, all the GTP cars right on top of each other on the lead lap, it's fantastic. But Colin Brown, opened up the gap of 1.7 seconds uh, to Mathieu Jamini. Mathieu actually brought half a second down of that gap last time around, so the French star, um, relatively inexperienced in prototype machinery, an absolute demon in GT machinery, won the GTD Pro class last year here at the Rolex 24 in the most dramatic circumstances. If you've not seen it, well, wait, wait until Monday and watch it on the, uh, the, the MZ YouTube channel because it's one of the finest finishes to a motor race ever. Yeah, uh, that car was uh, looking pretty pristine um, until uh, those last couple of hours. <laughs> there was a bit of paint that got changed. Uh, at Nimsa Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, 20 and a half hours still to go. John Hindorf and uh, Peter Mackay on the fifth floor. Jeremy's going to uh, step away for a moment and uh, grab a bite and uh, a bit of a pit stop. <laughs> He's glued to his lap charts as well. I, this is a, I, it's an, I'm, I don't know which I'm in awe of more, these incredible drivers or Jeremy doing his lap charts. My brain just could not work that quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid uh, as, as well. Gap again as it comes and goes through traffic at the front of the field. Colin Brown opened up now back to 2.2 seconds. So the half of a second that Jamini took, Bron, uh, Colin Brown is just taking it straight back again. Now, the Aero Motorsport car is still at the front. They've only got a few laps to serve their penalty, four laps to serve their penalty. They can't be far away from that now. So well, and, and, and the uh, high-class car as well. Uh, that is definitely... Is it in, oh, they've just they've, uh, they've just, just come served and gone. it. Yeah. yeah, they've just served it in the nick of time. I guess four laps gives you. Is that enough time for an argument? I guess it was. It is. <laughs> Three times across start finish before you've got to answer the penalty. Otherwise, yep. it will uh, mean that you get additional sanction applied to it. Like Collins like pulled out to two point two seconds and has stabilised at the moment from Matthew Jaminier. 36-9 last time around, 37-4 for, for the chasing Porsche. Interestingly, the Acuras are the only cars to break into the 35s in this race so far. 35-6 uh, as the Era Motorsport car comes in to serve that three-minute and 20-second stop penalty. In the library book, you can read a couple of chapters Absolutely. while he's sitting there. Well, Dwight Merriman, he can maybe, uh, maybe check his stocks ticker. He's, he works in the uh, financial industry as an entrepreneur investor. And, uh, yeah, he might be able to get a little bit. Maybe he's got a ticker in the car telling him how, he's, how the stocks and shares are going. But uh, is, uh, that's a shame for the Era Motorsport team. But they'll fight back. They'll fight back for sure. Uh, and of course, by the, uh, in that uh, improper way by procedure, of course, they did, there was a gain, and this is why the penalty is as punitive as it is. Of course, all penalties are served right at the end of the pit lane. There's a penalty box where the teams have to drive along, stop there under the supervision of the IMSA officials. who stand there with a handy stopwatch, make sure that the penalty has been served uh, in full. So, in, it's incredible, in GTD, the mixture between the GTD cars with the green number boards on them and the red uh, number boarded cars of the GTD Pro is completely mixed up uh, between them. Uh, we've seen three out of the four practice sessions, a GTD car was top of all of the overall GTD cars, including the Pros, so quite amazing. One thing that stood out to me is the Corvette have been quite quiet all week, just generally going about their business, but they've really surged to the front here in this race. A great starting stint from Antonio Garcia and his teammate Jordan Taylor coming in now and up into second position in all the GTDs, top of the class as well. So, 
number 31, Alexander Sims, just on the fight of the podium. Fourth in just out, just outside the podium positions at the moment as the Porsche is in a great battle with the Porsche number 963 in the car number seven has just gone by Alexander Sims once again so Campbell and Sims are trading positions back and forward again Matt Campbell an incredible driver will never forget his pass to win the Bathurst 12 hour in 2019 quite inexperienced in, in prototype machinery you'd never know those Porsches have been pretty good since the restart. Uh, chatted with Mattia Jaminet early on. He thinks the cars will come to life uh, in the evening hours. They haven't done enough, they believe, time on the low temperature tyres, but they feel that the night time is the right time for the 963, and certainly they're picking up pace at the moment as they uh, head into the darkness hours. It is, uh, we're, what, 40 minutes or so for official sunset. And then, of course, 7 o'clock is when we can start thinking about putting those low temperature tyres on. 7 tonight till 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, sun up uh, is 7.14 in the morning. The Aero Motorsport machine still sitting there, soaking up that three minutes and 20 seconds. It'll feel like an hour down at the end of pit lane. There's the, gap, the, lap is, the gap is coming down at the front of the field, 1.1 seconds between the Meyerschank Acura of Colin Brown and Mathieu Jamini, who gets a little bit of traffic as they come into the braking zone for turn one, and it's down to eight tenths of a second now, so Jaminet is on the move for Penske Porsche Motorsport as well, but, whoa, he can maybe, he looks like he's catching Colin Brown, but to be able to pass him, that's gonna be another matter as well. It's top class GTP racing at its best here. Well, this is setting the standard, isn't it, in this first GTP race. Traffic on the infield for Colin Brown. A couple of Lamborghinis he's had to deal with there Ooh, doesn't quite get the line through the western horseshoe but the fortunate thing for him was that behind him matt campbell had exactly the same problem uh, with the blue lamborghini that he'd gone past two corners before now heading out onto the high banks and does the porsche get a clean run not bad just had to pinch it down a little bit for the second of those lamborghinis now the Porsche gets the run. Seems to run much higher than the other GTP cars, even when it's sitting on its own. The leader into the braking area, down towards the Le Mans chicane. This feels significant to me, Peter. It feels like we're seeing something now that we've not seen in the first couple of three hours of the race, where people are beginning to pick up. They must feel confident that the cars and the pace of the cars could go a bit quicker. We're down into the 36s and the high 37s, we were running 38s and 39s earlier on. The track is cooling down to 73 Fahrenheit, which is 23 Celsius. That's come down quite a lot from the start of the race. As the leaders once again complete the lap down into turn one, another huge amount of traffic, and this time it's the Porsche that loses out, and in fact is being closed down on by its teammate, the two Porsches now, with the uh, Acura number 10 in between them, Oh, they're all it, together. Yes, they are, yeah, so Matt Campbell is caught onto the back of Louis Delatraz in the in fact, number they, 10, Konica Minolta He's Acura. gone by, he's gone by, he's gone uh, by, Campbell. Uh, OK, um, so Mathieu Jamini, though, right there as well. Brown just got a little bit of a better run through traffic. He opened the gap back up to 1.5 seconds. It's going to be quite a bit more, I Sorry, would think. Sorry, he's gone back Delatraz. Yes, yes, exactly. So, yeah, brilliant, uh, brilliant the stuff. The front, yeah, <laughs> brilliant stuff. Extraordinary brilliant stuff. stuff. So, second place there, changed twice in half a lap. Delatraz had got by the number six car, and the number seven almost made it, going into the international horseshoe, and then the positions swap back round again as they go down to the high banks. Well, in the, in the GTD category, <laughs> it's equally uh, equally exciting. We've got uh, a GTD car with the green number board, Roman De Angelis leads all of the GTD cars with the GTD Pro leader, 
Jordan Taylor for Corvette Racing. They've announced their brand new GT3 car, which will compete in competition uh, in 2024 for the first time as well. Uh, but their current CAR uh, pegged back from a GTE spec, but whoa, it's, a, it's a proper machine, that. Lots of work going on to get that 57 Winwood car on the grid. Uh, what they haven't got on that car is any headlights at the front. There's the blue marker oh. light. And, oh, as, uh, no, they haven't. I thought they'd just gone on there. You must have at least one headlight and one tail light. They've got marker lights on the front. Now, what I haven't, I'm going to have to have a closer look at that and see if they're just blue coloured headlamp covers, but I don't think they are. No. So we'll have to keep it. There's none at the back either. That. There's no, there's um, no tail lights either. Let's have a look to see if the tail um, lights are on. No, they're not on the front. Uh, it's yeah, yellow. It's, just, it's just the blue lights in the lower grille oh. of that car. So you would think they'd be on by now. Is that yes? It's only 25 past five here local time at Daytona, but the, it has been. A, there's been a cloud cover sort of creeping over all day, so uh, the visibility is coming coming a little that, bit less. And that is third place in GTD for Daniel Morad. Yes. Now maybe he just hasn't flicked the switch. Maybe. So no, but somebody needs he to get. He is Canadian. He's used to being uh, in the dark. Maybe. It'll be fine. Know. It'll be fine. <laughs> Oh, change in the GTPs, the number seven. Uh, Matt Campbell goes past Delatraz again as they come into the Le Mans chicane as well. So now it's Porsches two and three. So Delatraz no, no. is back. No, there's two Porsches, John, two second and third. Masha Jamini followed by uh, the number seven uh, of Matt Campbell. As they come and, around and the And then it's the, uh, the, the 31 Cadillac, the other red yes. fronted car yes. that's coming up next those very distinctive light signatures at the front of the Porsches which go to uh, purple for one of the cars and blue for the other when uh, they come into the pit lane Corvette goes into the lead uh, car number three Jordan Taylor then leading in GTD Pro leading all the GTD cars Roman De Angelis though still leads his class of course reigning uh, champion as well such a strong driver line up there uh, in that harder racing car car 27 of course, they've got their pro car, car 23, just a few positions back with Alex Riveras at the wheel of the Spaniard. Uh, don't forget the big story early on was the loss of the BMW M Hybrid V8. Conor de Philippe completed just 39 laps before it went into the pit lane with hybrid problems. Now, that car has rejoined, uh, but uh, is, has now... Uh, has now just completed 39 laps. The leader is on 121, so they're the better part of 100 laps behind on the circuit. But learning, yeah, learning, and that was a big strip down that had all the bodywork off. They were taking some internal components out of the side pods, and depending on which car it is, some of the uh, hybrid battery components and uh, converters are in there. Of course, you've got a very clever asymmetric design that Multimatic put together. Uh, balancing the car out side to side. Great, uh, great thanks to, to John, Johnny Palmer in the in the studio. Joe Barbosa is charging in LMP3. He's hit the front in the number 33 Sean Creech Motorsport uh, car. So Joe into the lead of that class by 5.4 seconds at the moment from Jarrett Andretti's machine. Joe's a four-time winner of this uh, race, including back in 2003, where he won in class in a Mosler. Remember them, the Moslers. Um, so he's had a long and illustrious career, uh, has shown. It's great to see him. Um, I saw him leaving breakfast this morning. He's got some very colourful race boots as well. So he's uh, very jazzy, uh, lots of colours all over them as well. So uh, great to have Joe uh, still in the paddock, and he's not lost any speed whatsoever. Leader in LMP2 is the car number 35, TDS Racing. Uh, Josh Pearson leading by just three tenths of a second from Scott Huffaker in the other TDS car, number 11. So it's going really well for TDS at the moment. The 35 is the red car with the light yellow accents. Uh, so red on the top, yellow on the bottom. The 35 car, excuse me, the number 11 car is the highlighter yellow on top and red on the bottom. But TDS Racing, slightly different look this year. They ran the they ran the, the Racing Team Netherlands car, yes, they did. Um, but uh, not, not here this year. Um, and, uh, yeah, TDS showing just how, how good an operation they are. Some great drivers in those cars. Well, they've got a lot of history yeah. uh, in running all kinds of things. Uh, and then PCs uh, originally, and uh, P3s and P2s over in Europe. Good to see them back over here in the States, flying their training at the moment. 
bossing things with Josh Pearson and Scott Hall uh, uh, Josh going back to United, of course, uh, later in the year to continue running with uh, Richard Dean and Zach Brown's team. They are, uh, they, it's, uh, they are quite an operation, aren't they? I'm surprised we haven't seen them paired up with a, a manufacturer for GTP yet. I think the key word of that sentence is yet. Um, I, I don't have any information to anything, but I, I, I can imagine that it can only be a matter of time before they're paired up with a, a top manufacturer because the way, look at this, just look at their record over the last few years, the amount of achievement that they've, they've had. And to have somebody like Josh on board, it's just 16 years old. He raced last year as a 15 year old on special dispensation with PR1. So great to see him back in uh, leading the race at this point. Daniel Morad must have heard us on 107.9. Turn your lights fine. on. <laughs> he, uh, he, um, he found the light switch on the 57 car and that they are on uh, right now. I don't think it was a dispensation, actually, Peter. Peter. Oh, was it not? Oh, my apologies. I thought it, it was a special permission. Yeah, no, they, they actually got his birthday wrong. They got his date of birth wrong. You're joking? No. Oh, no. OK. <laughs> right. It was an administrative <laughs> mistake. Right. My, mis my, my mistake. Do apologise, Josh. And uh, he's at the, the right age of, of, of 16. Uh, hello to Dario Franchitti, tuned in. Um, and he's just tweeted the perfect two-car garage. He's got a, a red Porsche Carrera GT and a, I think it's a blue Lancia Delta Integrale. He's a horse. Uh, what a I collection he has. Is it dark grey? Yes. I can't, I can't uh, remember. Yes. Um, I've actually seen him running around in Scotland in that red Carrera GT, GT before. Um, very jealous. Very, very jealous. But great to have him tuned in. Of course, a driver who's a lot of experience at, at this race as well. And I don't think there's any prizes for guessing who he's cheering for with his affiliation to Chip Ganassi Racing. There are uh, three cars that are, uh, two cars, excuse me, that are running in the race. Interesting to see Darius down. Darius just down to two cars. I presume he's still I doubt that very much. Uh, Has he not got a singer? He's got a. Uh, well, he just ordered. He, I think he recently took I, a delivery of a singer. I, I want to know if he's still got his motor house. Uh, he had an AMG C63 that he didn't want to get rid of. He used as his daily driver for very many years. Uh, Joe Bradley is in the pit lane. Good evening to Joe, who is down at the. Now I'm going to give them their full title here. Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Autosport. That's been a bit of a change since the last time we raced uh, uh, in IMSA competition. What hasn't changed is that the man at the top, the man at the top of the stairs, is still Wayne Taylor. Yeah, what a collaboration, eh? There wasn't already a powerhouse win. Um, I kind of like what we're seeing so far from GTP. What's your thoughts? Yeah, very impressed, to be honest. Um, I didn't expect to get to four hours with so little drama. Take the top, uh, well, eight cars, separated by very, very little. And um, looks like there was one car that had a problem, but I think everybody else, I was expecting most cars to be sitting in pit lane or maybe back in the garage by now. So I think everybody's done their homework. Um, all the manufacturers done a good job. And um, pretty amazing. I hope this carries on like this. Um, we're not really pushing the car that hard. Um, uh, just trying to stay in, in, you know, on the lead lap, figuring out stuff that's going on with uh, tire degradation and stuff like that. And obviously we've got uh, two new drivers here, and we've got them in the car, and we're going to put Philip back in the car now. Is, is that why we're seeing an increase in pace win? Because people are becoming confident and they can eat a little bit more? Yeah, I think so. I think I think everybody got more confident with the cars and got more confident with uh, some of the stuff that's out of our control. There is still stuff out of our control. We don't know, but so far so good. And um, looks like everybody's done a good job. Uh, what's the uh, what's the element in the fact that that and the considerations for the low temperature, softer tyre for later on this uh, when we get into the small hours? Yeah. It's going to be very interesting because it's the first time we've been at Daytona for many, many years where we have two, two different tyres, one for the night, one for the day. Um, I know the tyres are pretty good, but I, I do know also from the drivers that uh, if it does get cold, it's extremely cold on the outlap and stuff. And the, your outlap and inlap nowadays is, is probably the two most important laps of the race. So we've got to look at pressures and stuff. And quite honestly, 
it's a it's a real thing to say, but we're still testing. Do you know do you know enough about the tire to make those decisions? No, I don't think we do yet. <laughs> I can tell by the the the, uh, the, the pause. I, I need to be politically correct, but I, I'm not sure that we're 100% sure yet because it's so related to pressure, so related to tire. I mean, to temperature. I just don't think we we are 100% on top of what's going to happen. Thanks, Wynn. No doubt we'll talk to Wynn Taylor later, John. We always do. Oh yeah, great stuff, mate. Well done, uh, and thank you to Wynn Taylor as ever for being. Uh, oh. as open and honest huge moment for the leader of the race colin brown who's trying to get round some of the slower traffic well i, I used that uh, advisedly and the traffic and the pace of Mathieu jamine has allowed that number six porsche to close up into a challenging position top three now within a second and a half top four within two seconds top five within four seconds and we've not just come off a caution this is racing to this the Porsches seemingly seemingly coming alive at this 16 laps since we went green after the I think fourth intervention of one of our safety cars as we're live from trackside six minutes to go to the end of another hour we'll give you a VP racing Stay frosty update at that time as we will have completed four hours of the race. And there's a milestone, one of our Porsche keys to the race. The milestones, four hours into the race. And we can fix it, we said, adapt to survive. Well, Team RLL have done that with one of their cars. The tyres, certainly the low temperature tyres, which they can only use between seven and at p.m. and 8 a.m. They can use the standard tyres, the high temperature tyres, any time. But the 12 sets of SLT Michelin slicks can only be used from 7 to 8 tomorrow oh, morning. Up, oh, and there's a big mistake for Colin Brown. He's locked up and he's almost lost the lead again under braking. This time at the western end of the infield at the horseshoe there. These cars really difficult to stop and we've got all four of the leaders line astern now as they go onto the banking. Now let's see how strong this Acura is because it does seem to punch out of the corners better than anyone else and it does seem to see to say that it is quick in a straight line even when there's a draft behind it and here comes the the second of the Acuras, Louis Delatraz. That car is super quick in a straight line and even quicker in the draft. The Acuras are strong here. There was he punched out of that corner. How they're using their hybrid might be different. We've heard a number of people saying that the cars make their lap times in different ways, Peter, but it was visual there. You could absolutely see Delatraz. It was almost like he had a, a, a different gear Somebody had put him on fast forward the way he punched out of turn six onto the high banks. I think it, I think it also shows how well these GTP cars are racing, uh, as in uh, collectively as a class, because Delatraz was able to pick up a really good slipstream from the back of that number seven Porsche of Matt Campbell, and that he got a really good run, timed the slipstream well, and made the run. And they got with that little mistake there from Colin Brown, uh, the field's really bunched up a little bit more. I mean, the Brown and Jaminé uh, have just been spellbinding, just by battling through traffic, not taking crazy risks, looking just so decisive and firm, but without uh, taking crazy chances as well. It's really impressive to, to watch here at the, the Rolex, the 61st Rolex 24-hour at Daytona. But as Wayne Taylor says, just keeping on that lead lap, keeping in the fight, his guys are there right there in third and keeping an eye on all this as well. It, it, oh, was, right, it wow. was right at the end of the retardation event that the, the left front just just snagged on Colin there. Ah. And, and I remember he was he was passing another car, but yep. he was still kind of on the racing line. But the, the thing that I've got to keep reminding myself that the brake by wire is only brake by wire on the rear wheels. That's the bit that the hybrid is activating as well. They can do some clever bits and pieces with that. The front wheels, the front wheels are still on a pressurized system with friction brakes. So they're not 
they're not controlled as easily. The slip angle, the, the slip control is, is not there on the front as it is on the rear. You're not allowed ABS on these cars, and that's why I'm speaking very carefully. You're not allowed ABS, but ABS, and we had a change of lead there for about 10 yards, but Brown again punching off the corners. Just finish this thought. You're not allowed ABS on these hybrid cars, same as you're not in, in LMH, and you haven't been in the top class of WEC either for quite some time. However, ABS is defined as, as something as quite specific with the switch, an on-off switch. What you can do, what you can do is program your electric motor to assist with slowing down. And that can help stop the wheels locking. I'm trying to be very diplomatic there because I'm not suggesting that anyone is outside the rules, but no. Toyota have done it for years in a very sophisticated way um, with LMP1H, and I'm pretty certain they're doing exactly the same thing with the TSO50. So that th there is precedent for what that's going on. The thing is that when you don't have the four-wheel drive, that's only working on one axle. So that what we're seeing is fronts locking up at crucial times when the drivers are losing the downforce in the last part of the braking event before they turn into the corners. And that's why we've seen Ricky Taylor in this race already run, run long twice in, in turn one. Turn three and turn five and turn one is where it's happening. Top two in LMP2 in the pits, Peter. Yeah, yeah, the uh, number 11 and the number 35 TDS racing cars in for their pit stop as well. Also the number 55 Proton competition, the LMP2 as well. number 11 TDS racing car. This, different to the sister car, has done fuel tires and driver change. Scott Huffaker out, and it was uh, Mikkel Jensen who jumped the board. Number 35, Josh Pearson brought that car in and out. No fuel, just to clean the windshield. A lot of fuel, and then they also did something different. The lights to identify the car for the spotters on the roof have to be integrated into the car. They were not functioning. On the number 35, a mechanic came over, unscrewed the top, made sure that the purple would flicker onto life when they wanted it to, and then screwed it back down. So they lost a couple of seconds there on a slower stop, but it was necessary for their spotter throughout the night. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. That's a, another race out completed. So four hours of the race completed. Let's take a VP racing in-race update. Brilliant battle at the front of the field. Now the two Acuras have established themselves ish at the front of the field. It is the 60 MSR car from the number 10, Conningham and Alter in second by about 1.4 seconds. The two Porsches sitting line astern. Six, uh, number six from number seven, Jamonier from Campbell. Uh, they're eight tenths away from the leader and half a second between them. Then it's the three Cadillacs. 31, Alex Sims, Scott Dixon in the 01, Richard Westbrook in the 02. Uh, they start at four seconds away from the leader, but right on the tail of the Porsches. And Mark Fitman seven seconds further back. Pierce picking up on that number 24 BMW in this stint. We've just had stops at the front of the LMP2 field. The two TDS cars came in uh, from the front of the field. Right now, it's George Kurtz who's leading uh, in the 0-4. That is the CrowdStrike Racing machine. The Josh Pearson 35 car should go back through and take its position. They're in a little bit of flux at the moment because of the pit stop, so we'll jump to LMP3. Jared Andretti uh, is uh, in second place, but uh, it is the Sean Crease Motorsport, the number 33 car, the Stars and Stripes, that leads. Uh, by a decent margin, about seven seconds at the moment. Daniel Frost in the number 43 in third position for MRS GT Racing. GTDs, it's the Corvette that leads uh, with, in second place, the GTD. Uh, that's a GT Pro car, of course. Then the GTD cars in second position in GTD, leading their class. 32 is the court of car with Kenton Cook. Daniel Morad in the rebuilt 57 Winwood car, and Roman De Angelis in the 27 Aston Martin 
from Heart of Racing, the second of the GTD pros. He's next up in what is effectively fifth position of GTD. Uh, and that is the number 23 Heart of Racing, Aston. Third in the class, another two positions further back is Andrea Caldarelli uh, in the number 63 Lamborghini. And that is the Iron Lynx car. That's how it stands with uh, 132 laps completed. At the front of the field, it is Colin Brown who leads the second of the Acuras by not very much at all, just on a second. And whilst we were doing that VP Racing update, Matt Campbell in the number seven Porsche has gone past his team bit. In race updates from VP Racing Fuels, the official coolant of IMSA is Stay Frosty. There's one for your car. Check it out on the VP Racing Fuels website. Peter McKay. Just a final point on the talking about the braking. I had the opportunity to have a chat with Dane Cameron yesterday, and I asked him, you know, over the course of the development of the Porsche 963, what has been the biggest kind of step change? Because obviously developing uh, a new race car can be really tedious for one word, or it can be really frustrating, but you, sometimes you get these eureka moments where you really make that leap forward, and I asked him what that was for them, and he said definitely the braking. He said it's been a lot of, of work to get used to the brake by wire system and try to get the pedal feel for the driver to be a little bit more natural feeling, to be more what they've been accustomed to throughout their career, and that we see, that's where he said we really made a big step with uh, the braking there and, and getting it to feel more natural as well. So it's really interesting, though, that some of the drivers just taking a bit of time to, to kind of adjust their driving style as well. The Acuras have really made a break after Delatra has got past the Porsches. He's really managed to reel in Colin Brown and actually going to make a lead move for the lead here as well. Colin Brown defends as they come out of turn two down towards the International Horseshoe, going past the Brule. Kelly Moss, number 92 Porsche. That's the one with the Buddha on the front. And Delatra, I tell you what, well, Wayne Taylor says we're going to go easy. He says, oh, we're trying to stay on the lead lap. Well, we're going for the lead of the race. The Conor and Minolta Acura hunting down the uh, Sirius XM uh, Meyershank Racing with Kurt Kar Bagajanian car, Colin Brown. And two drivers here that really deserve this top level opportunity. Colin Brown, his father Jeff is, is here, uh, part as a uh, supportive dad, but also as uh, crew chief or, or working on the pit wall with actually the car that leads LMP2 at the moment, the 04 CrowdStrike car run by APR. Ian McCarthy makes a good point at IMSA Radio. All right, we've had three uh, full course cautions, not the four that I tried to uh, give us earlier on, uh, but we have got fantastic racing at the front of the field. So what, have, what on earth are the two hour 40 minute races well, going to be like later? 100 minutes at Long Beach. Oh, oh well, my word. 100 minutes at Long Beach <laughs> is. I, I, I can't even begin. We've got the 12 hours of Sebring to come, of course, for the 36 hours of Florida. Uh, that is the week of St. Patrick's Day, 17th of February. Excuse me, 17th of March. And we'll be bringing you that again live and exclusive. Also add in the WEC there at Sebring as well, where we'll uh, bring you all of the action from the WEC, every single session live and free. Are we, are we, are we watching the end of the race here? <laughs> Blue Teletrans trying to hang it around the outside of Tom... Uh, There's a Tom, point Tom, Colin made Brown. He's made it work. He's made it work. Louis Delatraz has just gone right around the outside of Colin Brown at no traffic involved, going around at the International Horseshoe. That's a stunning move there. Unless somebody's been on the Ford. And, uh, tell him, uh, and tell him, telling him not to fight at this point. Uh, possibly, possibly. Uh, I think the Louis Delatraz might get a call oh, now. Also, <laughs> the two, that one. also the two Porsches have swapped as well. Swap position seven. Now ahead of eight, Matt Campbell ahead of Jaminet. Jaminet just had a ran on a touch at turn one, and that gave his uh, that gave his former teammate, of course. But they were both champions together for FAF in GTD Pro last year. Matthew Jaminet just ran a little bit long, and Campbell got underneath him, uh, and they gave each other good good racing room, of course. Don't be, uh, don't write, don't really uh, uh, underestimate these Cadillacs, though, as well. Alexander Sim and Scott Dixon, they're just uh, lingering a couple of seconds behind the Porsches. I wonder if they're going and uh, they're doing maybe a bit of fuel saving game because if there's one thing that Scott Dixon, uh, of his incredible repertoire of skills, fuel saving is where he's just absolutely a demon in that zero one car or indeed any race car he gets into. Tom Parker makes a good point that at the 
early part of that run when uh, the number 60 got caught. Colin Brown was caught and was seemingly fighting a little moment as we've got the six Porsche in. Remember, he didn't take tyres at the last caution and the, la and the two Porsches did. And in fact, we've got a Porsche in the pit lane with Shea Adam. Yeah, Matt Chapman bringing the car in. He will be staying in because Dave Fairman taking over for this car. And they are giving Dave four sticker tyres. So clearly they like him to give him the new Michelin. Waiting on the fuel to be put in. The tyre change is done. The car is dropped off the air jacks. Driver change still being completed, but they still have the fuel probe attached. So no time being lost as of yet. Cleaning off the windshield, not doing a tear off, not taking one of those precious ones away as of yet. Again, still waiting on the fuel probe though, so no time being lost as the brakes are steaming. They've been working hard out there. And let's see, out goes the fuel probe now. Dane wasted no time getting back into this race. He hasn't done a race since uh, the 12, 24 hours of Le Mans back in June. Welcome back to racing, Dane. I have to say, those purple uh, day notice lights at the front of that Porsche look absolutely brilliant when it comes into the pit lane. And they have a very recognisable headlamp design and placement on those cars. They are very low down uh, and they are doubled up uh, to be able to see forward and, uh, and throw their light forward. Now, here they don't need the light. Uh, at Sebring, they will. Um, they will need the light at Sebring when we're there in March. Haven't put your tickets yet. You should be thinking about doing that. And next time, next time around, I another pit stop and Shea Adam, that's... Oh, I thought that was going to be the other Porsche, Shea. I'm, I'm slightly disappointed. Yeah, it's actually an Acura and a Cadillac. The yellow 01 has come in for Cadillac Racing and the Wayne Taylor Racing number 10. That is the blue one. Sorry, WTR Andretti number 10. The Conic Minolta Acura is also in is the BMW. Uh, that's one with the purple in the grill, so that would be the number 24. Waiting on the fueling to finish for the 01. I did not see a tire change for the WTR and Ready Mobile, so I might be wrong about that, but I don't even see any old tires being brought around for that car. As first going is Louis Delacras with the number one on the side, still waiting on the number 01. And yes, as John rightly reminds me in my ear, they took tires during the caution, so they would not need a new set of Michelin. Let's see who's going to win out this one. It is Scott Dixon leaving well before the BMW as we also are anticipating the 02 for Cadillac Racing and the 31. The other Cadillacs in the field are due this lap. So all the action at uh, Shea Adams ends. Uh, also plenty of pit lane penalties. Uh, to report for you today as well. JDC Miller Motorsports and Ed Decane. Pit lane speeding 13 kilometres. That's not just a drive through, that will be a stop and go. So stop through the through into the pit box uh, and the penalty box and then restart down into turn one. The this, two Porsches. No, this uh, the, is the, uh, the car number six. This could this is to put Dane Cameron a lap down. Okay, Colin Brown is going to be due a pit stop any moment, but Colin Brown is right behind Dane Cameron here. Dane Cameron just hanging on to the lead lap after that stop runs a little bit wide. Of course, his tyres will still be coming up to proper operating temperature there for Dane Cameron. Yeah, and also we have a stop, of course. Just this is this is absolutely what we were expecting because coming out of the pits. Matt Campbell overtook Colin Brown. The, the 60 car hasn't stopped yet. The Matt Campbell has just gone through and taken the lead for Porsche. Porsche leads ah, at yes. Daytona International Speedway. Porsche leads at Daytona International Speedway for the first time. One of the Porsches uh, has led, uh, excuse me, they led one lap earlier on on the pit stop cycle, but that was a pass for the lead on pace for Matt Campbell in that number seven car. That's really interesting. It's my, my, completely my mistake there. I didn't notice the number seven had gone past as well as uh, Dane Cameron trying to stay on the lead lap as well after his stop. But Colin Brown should be in any moment, but uh, interestingly, with a little bit of clean air in front of him, Matt Campbell just push hit the afterburners and Col Colin, really chased Colin down. Colin Brown's on the end of a double stint. Matt Campbell's on the end of a single stint. Uh -huh. yeah, so exactly. let's remember this, this tire disparity yep. there. 
uh, and Shea Adam will watch them both come into the pit lane as they do, well, the Porsche's in. Oh, and the uh, Acura following it in, Shea. The Acura is a driver change. Simon Pacino finding the word. Have to say, watch the Cadillac stop. They're very cumbersome to get in and out of the Cadillacs, whereas Simon Pacino just slipped right in like an eel to the Acura. Colin Brown getting out uh, so, sort of reluctantly by his body language, but the old tires for Simon. Further up the pit lane for the Porsche, it looks like Matt Campbell has stayed aboard. They've done fuel. I uh, don't see any new Michelin tires or any old ones, I should say, around the side of that number seven Porsche just waiting on the refueling. And then he'll be sent back out. Is the Acura going to get moving first, though, because they hit their box first? Yep, there we go. Acura is going to fire to life. Now, couldn't care because of the traffic, but the Porsche is well and truly ahead. 31 lap stints for Matt Campbell and Colin Brown last time around. They are the longest GTP stints of the race so far. As the, the, there was a few laps of yellow in that. They did 30 laps full green earlier on. The number seven car has stayed out three laps longer than its teammate and so a little bit of uh, trial and error here uh, by the teams not trying to be too clever huge amount of wheel spin coming off the uh, pit lane speed limiter which is uh, on the run down to turn uh, number three the international hairpin and colin brown now trying to get up to speed matt campbell uh, beat him out of the at pit lane and it was the Porsche who laid down the Michelin rubber now that's Simon Pagino now behind the wheel of brand new tires now Simon and Elio were telling me in the cold of the night if it does get cold don't think he, 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 I actually said what am I going to see he said you're going to think we've got a problem on the outlap you are going to think we've got a problem we're going to be going that slowly that will be getting passed by all kinds of things. And Pagino now is going to have to keep an eye in his rear view mirror as he gets up to speed. He's on the banking now, trying to get some heat at the Michelin's, but you don't want to overwork them early on. He's got to at least double stint these tyres to get into the evening. We are heading towards official sunset in four minutes' time for over 13 hours before sun comes up. It's uh, almost a quarter past seven tomorrow morning. Peter McKay. Cor Corvette racing in from the lead of GTD Pro. Jordan Taylor hopping out of that car. It was Antonio Garcia that started it um, as well. Full service, of course, is with the driver change. That was Joe Bradley's uh, end of things, is it? Not shit. Shea Adams uh, ends things. Sorry about that, John. I just hopped over the wall to uh, chat with Colin Brown, and then he went up to debrief, so lost him. Uh, yes, it is full service for the Corvette as they are doing fuel tires, and Tommy Milner, birthday boy, installed behind the wheel of this number three Corvette. Boy, that's funny to say after so many years of... <laughs> That was a better burnout than what Jordan had done earlier. I really appreciate the Corvette racing boys doing uh, good burnouts to try and entertain us. Let's go down to Joe Bradley. He's just had the LMP3 leader in. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all very close in all of our classes and equally so in the LMP3 class. We've just had the number 33, Sean Creech car in, followed very, very closely indeed by the 36. They're kind of uh, garage neighbours and uh, both cars uh, were serviced very, very readily. Uh, we saw a driver change on the 33. Jabba Bosa got out. I couldn't tell who got in. Uh, they both left pretty much uh, very synchronised, so that battle continues out on track for LMP3 honours. Thanks, Joe, down in the pit lane. Great stuff from Joe and Shea getting all of the scoops as well. Nick Damon will be down there as well throughout the uh, throughout the race. Corvette racing, well, Tommy, Burn Tommy Milner, that was a spectacular burnout, a birthday burnout uh, for, for Tommy. Many happy returns, and uh, great to see him still at the wheel of the Corvette racing number three. Car going slowly out there on oh. the bank, going underneath us. I think it was the windward car. Oh, no. And let's see gone past the pit entrance that number 57 machine so it's coming out of the international horseshoe at the moment what full racing speed looks like well so whatever it was it was brief yes 
number of car 57 going through the kink now. Yeah, I see. Wayne Taylor Acura going through. Wayne Taylor with Andretti Acura, excuse me, uh, going through the kink. Well, so whatever that was has cleared. So, few. A few for everybody. <laughs> Sorry if I panicked anybody there at uh, Winwood. Maybe he was just slowing down to uh, get his dinner order in as he went through. After those pit stops, the, the order in GTP is completely shuffled around. Louis Delatraz leads by 1.8 seconds from Matt Campbell in the number seven uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport uh, machine. So it's Konica Minolta Acura from Porsche Penske Motorsport. Then in third is Alexander Sims in the Whelan Engineering Cadillac, but he is 10 seconds behind second place. So there's a little bit more of a gap at the front. Uh, for Meyer Shank Racing, Simon Pagino, uh, 19 seconds off the lead in fourth at the moment with Scott Dixon right behind him in the 01 Cadillac Racing machine. That's a yellow car. Uh, in fifth as well, so that those pit stops really kind of shuffled the order, but I do feel it's going to come, it's going to come back and forth. Of course, Simon Pagino had a little bit of time to take. Uh, Louis Delatraz, our leader, did not take tyres. He was on, a, he's now onto his second stint of tyres, so therefore he didn't need to warm them up. Therefore, could get back up to speed quickly. Did, no, did, he did not. Um, having a reporter from the pit that he did. No, because they they took tyres at the yellow flag. Okay. So they're double stinting. So this is the second stint for Louis Delatraz. However, Pagino has put on new tyres and the getting up to pace is, uh, has caused well, him Pagino to, to drop in, back. therefore gets the, the new boots. Deep, yes, deep fight. and is uh, taking time to yeah. get them up to order. Yeah. Right, let's catch up with some drivers who've been driving recently out there on the high banks in the infield of the Daytona International Speedway. Joe Bradley is down with Ollie Milroy. Yeah, Ollie, the McLaren, uh, the Optima McLaren number 70, they're brought in in fourth place. So, you know, that's pretty good at this stage. Yeah, yeah, we're, you know what this race is we like. We don't see anything <laughs> here, do we? We're going to exit. Yeah, to be honest, I, I, I didn't know I was in fourth until you just told me. Um, yeah, you know what this race is like, it's survival. Um, I, you know, I probably could have been a bit more aggressive at the restart and we could be second or third, but what's the point at this stage of the stage of the game? We just need to survive, keep the car in one piece. Um, so that we can attack tomorrow afternoon, hopefully. We've seen issues across practice, etc., uh, with overuse of kerbs. Is that something that's not a consideration at all during the race? Um, I don't think so for us. We seem to be pretty, pretty good on the kerbs. We've compensated a little bit for ride height to protect the front splitter. So ultimately, I think from a performance point of view, at this stage of the race, I don't. It's not a, you know, it's not going to help us definitely. But hopefully later in the race, we should have a. A front splitter in one piece, and tomorrow it will, it will make the difference, hopefully. Ollie, I think while you've been in the car, the temperature, the ambient temperature, track temperature has dropped dramatically. Is that something you could tell? Uh, I'm, told, I'm told that's not, I'm told it hasn't. It's uh, it's just the ambient. I'm pretty hot, so... <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> um, no, no, not, not really. We'll probably see the effect through the night. The track rubbers up as well so much. Like last year was my first year at Daytona and I really started to understand how the track evolves. You know, a bit like Le Mans, you know, it just grips up through the night. Um, the temperature drops, the new tyres start going on the car. And uh, so, you know, we should see it get a little bit quicker. And with the characteristics of the McLaren, that should come to us a little bit, hopefully. When, are you, when will we see you back at the wheel of the McLaren? Um, I think Marvin's in for a double now and then I think, I think I'll be back in. We, we want to try and get as many points at the six hour mark as we can. So, we're, although obviously ultimately we're trying to win this race, we're also trying to win this championship as well. So the six, 12 and 18, make, it really matters. Thanks all. James Collado, fresh out of the racing Ferrari. You've been driving not one, but two new Ferrari race cars this week. You must be the luckiest boy in the world. Yeah, absolutely. No, it was great to, uh, it's firstly great to be here in America. Um, yeah, the, the LMA chest was, uh, was a nice test. Um, I must say it's a special car to, to drive and Ferrari have obviously got one ambition and it, I can see them working super hard to um, get outright wins and championships, so that's great. And then, yeah, going to here, uh, it's a new car, obviously, and um, yeah, we're struggling a little bit, to be honest. Um, in straight line speeds is where we miss. Um, but, you know, I'm not really bothered. I think it's just a good test of reliability for this car to see where we are uh, for the future of GT3 racing. And, um, you know, this is just a warm-up for us. Um, 
you know, uh, it's just nice to be driving and getting some exercise, that's all I can say. Greasy Competizione won the Michelin Endurance Cup last year. You did three of the four races, yeah. not coming away with the prize. It was Daniel Serra and Davide Rigon. Have you gotten in Rick Mayer's ear at all this week and said, hey, I'd really like to get that this year. Could we aim for it? <laughs> I actually told him I think this year we're going to be buying the watch uh, <laughs> and not winning it. So, uh, no, I mean, um, it's a learning curve for everyone, of course. And uh, like I said, I'm just driving around having, having a bit of a laugh. I'm, uh, I'm not really bothered. It's, uh, it's just good fun to be in this car. Thanks for the right. chat. James Glado there, uh, for Ferrari factory driver, and uh, I'm sure he's, oh, you can hear how excited he is there to get on board the uh, uh, the Ferrari hypercar, which will debut at the Sebring 1000 miles, part of Super Sebring, along with the uh, Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring here in the Weather WeatherTech Championship. In GTD, we've just gone through the cycle of pit stops, so good time to have a look at that. I mean, you got to have a big props to uh, the number 32, Team Kortov Motorsport Mercedes, driven by Maxi Goetz at the moment as well. That's in the GTD category, but right up there, fighting with a lot of the pro cars as well as they come through to complete uh, another lap for those GTD machines. So Maxi Goetz actually goes up into the lead just ahead of... Uh, Tommy Milner by 1.7 seconds. Tommy Milner leads the pro category by 6.9 seconds from car number 23, Alex Riveras for Heart of Racing, Aston Martin. Uh, at the front of the field, the GTPs, well, Louis Delatraz has just stretched the gap out a touch to two seconds from Matt Campbell. Uh, so car number 10, Konica Minolta Acura leads from the Porsche Penske Motorsport number seven uh, machine. Uh, Alexander Sims, uh, car number 31, Cadillac, Action Express, 13 seconds. Oh, car off, car, uh, number, uh, car stopped, excuse me. It's the Kelly Moss number Racing 92, Car. Number 92, Lamont Chicane. On the back straight, they've gone straight on there. Yeah. And that is the Happy Buddha car. Yeah. Uh, who's behind the, the wheel? Through Brule Skincare Back Machine. Uh, so he's got going, that's good. 19th position, and it is David Brule behind the wheel of that. I uh, didn't, uh, didn't really have much choice, actually, as the... I think that was the... Uh, 88 uh, LMP2 car that's of... That's the F Corsa uh, car. ...Francois Perodo going yeah. up the inside, and uh, I think it just... Uh, I think it just unsighted David Brule a little bit um, in that uh, machine, the Kelly Moss uh, Porsche. He... Uh, uh, it I was think three he, wide into there. I think he took the lesser of two evils in, mm. uh, in pulling it out. Uh, and going through that, not uh, he had to stop because he would have been told by the marshals there to wait mm. until they said it was time to go. So excellent fighting at the front of the field. Yeah, Simon all the way through. Simon Pagano is reduced now that his uh, new Michelin tyres are coming into temperature and pressure. He is flying. Simon Pagano has such an amazing history with the Acura brand and sports cars. I think he really made his name in the United States at the wheel of Acura, particularly 2008 with, uh, uh, to the, with Deferrin, and, uh, 2007 with Deferrin, and then with the Tequila Patron Highcroft team as well. Um, and uh, yeah, showed what he was worth and has gone on to fantastic things uh, in the IndyCar Championship and keeping his sports car uh, stuff going on as well. So he is now, Simon Pagino, just three seconds off the back of Alexander Sims in third, and he's now only 16 seconds from the lead. He was 20 when he was coming out of the pits on that outlap. So Simon Pagino on the charge, and this, of course, will come back to him when the number 10 Konica Minolta Acura has to fit tyres at the next stop. That will bring them back down a little bit when they're, of course, having to get back up to temperature. So Simon Pagino and Elio Castroneves, they were absolutely right, John, telling you that those in and out laps are going to be really important. Don't forget, you don't lose any time by putting on tyres uh, in the pits because you can fuel a tyre at the same time. This is not the WEC, it's not Le Mans. It is one of the few things that I disagree with him sir, about, actually. I don't think Ooh, you should be interesting. putting... Okay. I don't think you should be putting the car up on jacks when you've got a fuel hose in it or dropping it down when you've got a fuel hose in it um, I think it should be done separately and also what that does do it gives an advantage to those people who manage their tires better so if you don't need to put an extra set of tires on if you double set a set of tires there's an environmental benefit to it I think you should get a racing benefit for it as well 
So if you can make your tyres last where other people are having to throw extra tyres on, or you're having to let people make decisions. Shall we put a new set of tyres on? Yes, but it'll cost us 25 seconds. Can we make up 25 seconds before the end of this stint, the end of the race? Just, I'm just putting that do, out Do there. we open it up to the collective? Yeah, do you think? do. <laughs> We've got uh, Patrick Long uh, joining, well, not joining us, he's the other side of the glass. He's in race control at the moment, uh, having a chat. Oh, off, crash in GTP. Zero one, zero one Cadillac, one driven by Scott Dixon, off. Oh, multiple car incident. Car number eight, a Tower Motorsport LMP2, off as well. That is at the Western Horseshoe. And that's not the first time that John oh, Ferrano has been John. involved in somebody else's accident. What a bad ah. look for him. Now, it was the fifth place car at the front of the field. Scott Dixon. And we also did, Cameron had to check up as well. Now, how did that all start? It was the usual kerfuffle. The leaders had got ah, it was oh. it was the 60 car that started all that. That was a hip check. Oh, the Orlando backed uh, LMP3 rammed into the back of Scott Dixon when Scott Dixon's trying to slow down to avoid the spinning John Ferrano and then whack it's the 13 LMP3 the AWA car. Or it's car. Crans AWA, thank you. Sorry, I forgot the team name there. Oh dear, Scott Dixon didn't. didn't That's do all what he down can. to Simon Pagino. Uh, in the number 60 car, that was the start of that. That was the hip check that uh, started it all. Yeah. Thankfully, we stay hadn't, green. Hadn't cleared John Ferrano. Uh, John is uh, absolutely blameless on that one. And there's damage to the rear of the Cadillac on the right-hand side. The number one car, the zero one car of Scott Dixon. That's the yellow car. That's the that's the IMSA car for the whole season. Let's not forget mm -hmm. the blue too. Uh, it's not. It's got something odd on the side. CA on the side, rather than its position. Uh, I've not seen that before. Oh, um, well spotted. So, th does what does that mean on the side panel? Um, uh, I can't think of what that would uh, stand for. Well, I think... Come around, I, come I, in. I, I, there's lots of things it could be, but... It, uh, it actually just might be the fact that the number panel is damaged. Yeah, well, so I think Scott Dixon might have to pit here, you yeah, know, because there's it's a, got, it's a got lot the, of rear damage bodywork. It's got the number six on the other side, so I think there's something uh, awry there. So that car is going to have to come into the pits because it's trailing a huge amount of bodywork, and that's a danger if that gets thrown onto the track. We'll keep a look at that... Joe Bradley has got the AWA car that was caught up in all that as well. Again, a blameless from the AWA machine. Yeah, a victim, a victim of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The 13 car taking a new nose section on the front of the car. So that's all that's mattering here. He's been able to top up fuel, and now we get the thumbs up to release the car. Ah, a little bit of a uh, tear off on the windscreen coming off. And now he gets back underway, and considering uh, what could have been. Uh, that's pretty, uh, he got away with that pretty well. Thanks, Joe. Well, Scott Dixon is staying out at the moment. Uh, race control will be looking at that incident and what started it, and also uh, how long can Scott, it's going to fall off, that's going to fall off. We're going to have a huge piece of carbon fibre from the back of that Cadillac falling off. That needs to be in the pits now. That's a danger to other people. We need to see that car into the pitch. Now, they won't call it in unless they have to. They're sitting, they've dropped the position, by the way. Dan Cameron picked his way through there rather nicely and managed to pick up a position. It's hanging on by a thread at the back. I think it's a piece of the under tray, the diffuser from underneath the back of the Cadillac of Scott Dixon. He got rear-ended. Again, not his problem. All started off with contact between the number 60 ARX06 of Simon Pagino and John Ferrano in the tower car. Simon Pagino had not cleared the car he was trying to pass and turned down on him. And that's what spun everything into life over at the Western Horseshoe. It's interesting to see what this next lap time is. Last time it was a 1.41, which is about three seconds off the ideal pace. Let's see what this one might be for Scott Dixon. That's if he doesn't come in. We, we haven't seen uh, anything come up on race control calling nope. him in uh, for uh, the black and orange flag, the mechanical warning flag. We haven't had that yet. I'm um, looking down onto so the starter stand to see if there's anything in hand down there. We can see it. That from there, they'll put the number up as well if it was to happen. Nope. And that's the old school way of doing it. 
of course. Good luck being had by the starter there. That's Preston down there on the starter stand at the moment. So he's obviously reporting back to race control about what's going on. Um, the, the, the old school way of putting is putting out the flag and putting up the number board, an illuminated number board nowadays. But of course, the teams are in contact with race control and their driver. So it, you'd get it coming in. 18 laps or so before Dixie's next scheduled stop. So yeah. if he was to come in now, it would put him off kilter. And well, but he's let, he's lapping at one, it was 140 last time by, so he is losing time while out there. It's very hard to determine how much lap time he is losing uh, as a result of that. I, would, I mean, not, nothing scares Scott Dixon, now you can ask for sure. It won't have really rattled him too much, but yeah, certainly the last couple of laps a couple of seconds off the pace so he'll be in he'll be in direct communication and being you know with his IndyCar experience I mean a huge amount of IndyCar experience he'll be so used to t talking back and forward on the radio hugely experienced in uh, endurance racing as well so he's maybe gonna kind of run it to the end of the stint as, it, as it he's might coming seem. in the, the team okay. have made the same um, workings out as you and the same deductions as you PMAC and Scotty Dixon is coming in this time around. I think he has to. Uh, there's a danger of doing more damage mm. uh, uh, as well, of course, to the back of that car. It may have been they just kept him out while they grabbed the right pieces that they needed to bring them to the mm. front of the garage. Mm. Uh, I'm led to believe that spare parts are not endless for these cars. No. It is very early in the, li in the life of this car. Shea Adam is down at that end of the pit lane and waits for the Cadillac of Scott Dixon. He's 20th appearance at this race. As he jammed on the brakes, part of the carbon flared off from the right half of the back and is now sitting in the well, deceleration lane, but on the fast bit of the pit entry. So that might have to go to a full course caution to retrieve that bit. It is a rather large piece of carbon. They pulled off the old wing and thankfully it looks like all of the damaged bodywork bits were attached to that old wing so this could be a bit of good luck for this 01 Cadillac if you will they're putting the new piece on they've already finished with the refueling giving it a little bit more energy to go for the next stint now they're going to tighten up the wing and then send Scott Dixon back out that take of the fuel that car as well when it first came in here did they yes they did uh tires no tires okay <laughs> Shea Adam down in the pit lane. That's coming up to nearly a minute in the box at the moment there for Scott Dixon. The lap time here for the GTP cars anywhere around 136 to 138 in the race thereabouts. So uh, you'll be looking to try and stay on the lead lap here if they can absolutely help it. But that's going to be a, that's going to be difficult. Car number 10, uh, Konica Minolta Acura is your race leader at the moment. And yeah, Scott Dixon, there, that car has dropped off the lead lap, uh, the 0-1 wow. Chip Gas Canassi Racing Cadillac. God, what were we saying about how, oh. the, how the cards but fall for you? you have, your, have your issues early, though. No, ab absolutely. Yeah. Easy uh. to get a lap back, yep. relatively speaking, in IMSA competition. Uh, you wouldn't get that at, uh, at Le Mans because you, you don't get the wave buys, etc. Long, longer circuit, different uh, safety car rules, uh, slow zones, etc., etc. But my goodness, mate, just goes to prove. I'm waiting to see if there's any action uh, taken for the cause of that incident. So I'm going to just spin over to the race control. It is being looked channel. at at the moment, uh, that's for sure. Uh, the race control team, the hardest working team there is, um, uh, just glued to the screens all the time, making sure the race runs smoothly and safely. And they do an unbelievably good job of that. Uh, let's touch on the GT cars. Um, at the moment, it is uh, Maxi Goats uh, still leads the, the, f the factory Corvette by two seconds. Remember, Maxi Goats is in the number 32 Team Korthoff car, which is a GTD car, green number board. So they have to run a mixed driver lineup. The GTD Pro cars with a red number board, they can run all pros if they wish. Shea sure, Adam knows these things. I've seen it written down somewhere, but I can't remember other than, other than Johannes van Overbeck, who are the two of the driver standards stewards this weekend? Oh, just a couple of guys who have a couple miles under their belt. Uh, that would be Johannes van Overbeck, joined by Christian Fittipaldi, uh, winner of this race multiple times, and Johnny Unser. Right. Oh, OK. Well, yeah, OK. Well, I did, You're not going to argue see. without any of those, are you, really? No, I did see jo Johnny's uh, Johnny's daughter, uh, Lonnie, um, uh, a, few, uh, a few hours ago. 
uh, who had had a very successful run at Pikes Peak last year in the uh, Porsche Cayman GT4 in horrid weather, it must be said. Delayed, Absolutely delayed, horrid. Delayed, oh, was, yeah. And then shortened, the run was shortened yeah, uh, last year. The uh, year before. Ah. Yeah, but they did run the full run, but it was there were so many cars that could have had a great record run, but didn't quite get the chance. But next, that's Pikes Peak, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But Scott Dixon back up to what appears, yeah, full speed now as well on the 0-1 uh, Cadillac. He's on his... Uh, uh, on his outlap now onto his first flying lap of what will now be he'll be they could be out off kilter for a while now the 01 Cadillac well it depends what happens in yellows doesn't yeah, it one it does, of our, it our Porsche keys to the race was make the yellow work for you be mellow for the yellows work those cautions full lap down now and they've got a bit of work to do and remember as I said that is the full IMSA series car so that's the car that's uh, Scoring points in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. The O2, the blue, blue two, yellow one, is the WEC car, which will be making its debut in that competition on the Friday prior to the, in the thousand miles, on the Friday prior to the 12 hours, the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. Just one point that was brought up earlier on, actually, that I meant to mention at the time. Uh, we normally mention it in our Porsche keys the race as well. Um, it was uh, it was one of the drivers actually that Joe was talking to mentioned the points at 6, 12, and 18 for the Michelin Endurance Cup. Now that is a championship within the championship. It was Ollie Milroy that was talking about that. And Inception won the MEC, the Michelin Endurance Cup, last year. We've also seen uh, Riley run teams be very good at winning that championship as well in their categories. So if we see any funky stops just before 6, 12 and 18, we must try and remember that nothing's gone wrong. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very true. Because Jeremy and I <laughs> have to keep writing ourselves notes. Now you might say, okay. what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is it's a championship and you're going to get a trophy at the end of the year. And it just requires a little bit of outside of the box thinking. And particularly here, when you've still got six hours of the race to run, it's not as if you're messing up your strategy to the end of the race. No. So it's it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting thing that happens. There's there's points obviously at the end of the race uh, as well. So those interim points um, have been what's what made have, the have made the difference in the championship yeah. uh, in the last couple of and. And there are teams that are doing just the Michelin Endurance Cup races as well. Uh, that might, that, you know, that that's worth uh, taking into account. Um, there's several in the GTD field uh, that are like that as well. So that is very much their main championship. As Simon Pagano has run down Alexander Sims, he's right on the rear uh, tail unit of that number 31 Action Express uh, Cadillac. So the battle for the, sp uh, the final step on the podium provisionally is very much and truly on. And Pagano has definitely definitely found the, these uh, manuals, the uh, Porsche, for example, Hurley Haywood was telling me earlier that just the steering wheel has a 30-page manual in the Porsche 963, but Simon Pagino has definitely found the headlight flasher button in that number 60 Acura ARX 06. For the most point, that is exactly the same steering wheel that was in the RSR, and oh. exactly the same steering wheel that came to the RSR from the 919 prototype. There are a couple of extra things, 14 different switches on that 963 steering wheel, six different sets of paddles. But based, the, the, the GT guys are very used to it now. Lots of thumb wheels, different paddles at different areas for shifting, for brake balance, uh, brake bias, etc. The GT guys are exceptionally used to it because it was a very similar steering wheel. Uh, in fact, lifted from the prototype 919 that went onto the last versions of the, the RSR. Some really clever stuff on there. Just you know, a, a simple thing of having a couple of uh, a couple of paddles for your forefingers to change your brake bias front to rear going into each corner. Instead of having to, lots of race cars I've driven, you've had to reach down to the transmission tunnel or play with something on the dash in front of you. So you set it and you kind of leave it until the tyres are wearing out or unless you get rain, you don't move it. These guys are used to fiddling with things. Big, big grounding from the number 31 coming into first corner the wheel and Cadillac was on the ground and defending against Simon Pagino and big sparks love this time of night well past official 
sunset now and we'll not see the sun again till after seven o'clock on Sunday morning. 18 minutes past seven here at Daytona International Speedway. We're live from trackside, the opening of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, the 61st running of the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. It's uh, Peter Mackay and John Hindoff on the fifth floor, Sheer Adam and Joe Bradley down in the pit lane for this particular part of the race. Don't forget, coming up, the Night Owls Night Shift, powered by Sacred Coffee, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Eastern, and that will be Rooftop Ray with some uh, fantastic views from right above our heads where the spotters are, and it'll be Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones who take that shift in the early hours of the morning, taking you through towards that sun rise at a quarter past seven tomorrow. Plenty of racing to go before them. With, uh, I, sorry, I give, I said 17 minutes past uh, seven. It's actually 17 uh, minutes, 19 hours and 17 minutes to go. It's actually coming up to half past six here uh, in Florida. The uh, number 88 AF Corsa LMP2 uh, has just come in for a pit stop with uh, Francois Perodo hopping out of that car. And uh, Julien Canal getting on board as well. Great to have Julien back, a driver with so much uh, so much heritage with Labra competition at Le Mans and, and many more. But uh, Francois has uh, is just a quite, he's got an incredible collection of both race and road cars. And uh, he's having a wonderful chat with him yesterday. He's, he's uh, he bought himself a Toyota GT1, so uh, we're look looking forward to seeing that back out there. Well, we've had the LMP2 leader in, that's the number 11 TDS Racing Orica, in for fuel only. Just fuel and tyres, no driver change there, but the sister car, the 35, Josh Pearson, got out of that car and handed the car to a teammate. Not quite sure who got in the car. So both kind of synchronised TDS cars, uh, coming in, following one another in, but uh, the, the leading LMP2, Mikkel Jensen, I'm being told, has got into the 35 after Pearson has got out. We'll try and get a word with Josh, the youngster. Uh, that was his first stint in this race. Kenton Cook, it's always a good day when you get out of a Mercedes and there's a number one on the side of it. That's exactly what you did for Team Cawthorpe, but there was an off-track moment earlier with Mike Skeen. Was the car damaged at all, could you feel, when you got behind the wheel? No, the car is strong, and thankful Mercedes built a very strong car to take a hit. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it was it's always nice to come out with a number one on the side. But it's early days; uh, everyone's kind of taking it easy. It seems uh, the Corvettes uh, in, in the other class obviously feel saving quite a lot. So when I was behind it, it was just yeah, it's hard to take any risk uh, there. But uh, yeah, we're just kind of kind of circulating right now, trying to do the best we can to keep the guys behind us while not taking too much risk, and yeah, the Korthoff Mercedes is going pretty good. When there is no weak link on the team, what does that mean for the driver rotation? You're not saving anybody because no one's stronger than anyone else. I would say I'm the weak link, <laughs> but no, I, I feel pretty good. I, that It was nice to finally get like a solid, you know, stint in the car to fully kind of get used to things. And um, yeah, I feel good now, uh, but it's nice not having uh, someone who's uh, a major weak link, you know. Um, these guys have been really helpful to get me up to speed, so I so I can feel good now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 nice when when there's four guys in the car that can go out and put the car on on uh, and rip, rip one that's the best of anyone. So uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully we keep uh, keep it going here. Uh, Maxi's in the car and. Yeah, DTM champion is probably not a bad person to follow up after me, right? Yeah, definitely not. Now, I've got to ask about the GTP cars because we've been marveling at the speed at which they're passing GT3 cars. What's it like from behind the wheel? You know, it, it's, it's nice. They're actually uh, quite respectful. Um, so, yeah, so long as you, you're always consistent where, where you position the car and you're predictable, they always commit to one side or the other. Um, it's when you start to be un unpredictable where they start to question their moves. Um, yeah, so far, I mean, even com I would say compared to last year, uh, the, the GTPs are, you know, like they're they're fast in a lot of areas, but there's a little bit slower in others, I think, just because of the weight that's behind the car. Maybe the mechanical grip isn't quite as good. So they're not like just rolling the outside of turn three and five and six 
uh, like they like they were last year. Um, so in some respects, it makes the traffic management a little bit easier because you're not having guys go go by it three times on the outside of five before you even get to the exit. Do you get much of a rest now before you have to get back in? Yeah, I think I have a few hours. I think I'll get in for the fireworks. And I'll say it's pretty funny. Like literally, this is my fourth year uh, doing the 24, and every single year I've gotten the fireworks. So fingers crossed that the fireworks turn into a win, but um, I'll be uh, peeking through the smoke on the back straightaway. Uh, but uh, yeah, it should be fun. We'll keep an eye out for you in the car at that point. Thanks, Kenton. Good luck. Yeah, thank you very much, Jay. A couple of good points uh, coming in on at IMSA Radio. We try to keep on everything, and uh, which is uh, is fine, of course, but we can't have eyes everywhere. So thank you, and please feel free to, to let us know if you uh, notice something and we uh, don't mention it. By the way, I should just say that damage to the back of Scott Dixon's car, that what he... I, I don't think he was hit, actually. I just he think was. He, he, uh, he, he was just run off the track. No, he was thumped from the rear ah, by right. the LMP3 okay. car. Yeah. Um, who, in fairness, had nowhere to go either. And that, and that's uh, taken a big chunk oui. out of that. Again, neither of those fault. Uh, Tom Firth, hello, Tom. Thanks for getting in touch with us at Nimsa Radio. Uh, just pointing out, Jules Gounon up to third in GTD Pro, slowly pulling the WeatherTech car back into contention with regular fastest laps for him. Uh, and Kevin Welling, Kevin heard me talking about the uh, slightly funky, um, slightly funky tactics potentially at 6, 12 and 18. Um, I was talking about the front of the field in GTP. LMP2 and LMP3 are only getting MECP, MEC points this weekend, Michelin points this weekend. This is not a round of the regular championship for them um, in in consultation with the P2 and P3 teams, they didn't want to feel that they, quote unquote, had to do the 24 hour race because it's a big expense, but they still wanted it there uh, if they could make the business case for it. So no regular series points here, but it is a part of the Michelin Endurance Cup. Uh, a good business opportunity perhaps, put another driver or two uh, in the cars, but for LMP2 and LMP3, not a part of the championship. For GTD, GTD Pro, and GTP, part of all the championships, including the overall IMSA WeatherTech Championship. And Kevin, thanks for making that point. It, it's a uh, super it's point. Good point to make. Super point. Also, I, I think it, it really works from the financial side because you're you're dealing with a customer uh, a customer program. Uh, but also I think it helps with competition side as well because, you know, if you're a full season entry and there's lots of one-off entries come to, say, just the Rolex 24, uh, you could think you had a great race, but then you've had cars that aren't in the championship taking points away from you. So I think it works all round. I think it's a really good piece of work by IMSA and the teams working together. Uh, and I think, yeah, it really works with, with LMP2 uh, as well. The gap at the front has stayed remarkably steady despite the amount of traffic we have out there. Well, Louis Delitras for the Konica Minolta Acura just leads by 1.9 seconds from Matt Campbell at the moment. The driver who is charging is Simon Pagino. He was 20 seconds off the lead when he was just, just completed his outlap. He's now only eight seconds off the lead. That's what we saw early on in fairness. It stretched out to eight or nine seconds and then it stayed pretty much at eight or nine, 10 seconds when the 60 Acura uh, was in the lead. Uh, interesting uh, warning there for Hardaway Racing Team in the uh, number 23, failing to adhere to tyre usage regulations. Now, uh, we've Have seen that the before. Low temperature tyre on too early. The, no, they don't have it. Oh, it's, it's the GTP, GTP, excuse me, sorry. Um, so uh, that might be a wrong set of tyres, or it might be the wrong pressures in those tyres. We'll, we've seen it before. We don't normally get any uh, information about that. Down at turn one and two, we've got a spinner. And it is the Sean Creech Motorsport number 33 in second place for Lance Wilsey in LMP3. He's got it restarted. Turn one again being a bit of an action area coming down off the the banked infield, uh, banked trioval onto the infield. There's quite a, a sharp transition there. And if you get half a car's width 
to the wrong place or miss your breaking point slightly, it's very easy to have a swapper there and go off into the runoff. And that's what looks like what's happened there too. Lance, he's fired the car back up and he's moving again. Yeah, it, 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 it can easily happen. We've seen some of the best drivers in the world spin there uh, over the course of this week. Now, an uh, update on that incident between car number 60, Simon Pagino, and John Ferrano in the number eight uh, Tar Tower Motorsports car, car number 60, Smarshank Hankin, of course. Um, it's just a warning. Incident responsibility was handed to the car number 60 of Simon Pagino, Marshank Acura, but just a warning. But of course, that's then hanging over. If something happens again, they're, you know, that's taken into account. So race control saying wow. the incident responsibility was Simon Pagino's Marshank Acura. Wow. That, there's no but, doubt about that. But no penalty. Okay. But they might but count no themselves fortunate there. I would say so. But that's a bit like. That's big get, like getting in football in soccer, getting a yellow card in the first 10 minutes of a really, really feisty game, and you're playing centre half. That means every every single tackle after that's got to be absolutely clean. Every single overtake now has got to be clean. Yeah. Um, they don't add up here, so every incident is taken on its own merits. Um, but they will have to be very careful about what they do in the future cannot be cavalier the drivers meeting this morning saying as it always does it is the responsibility of the faster car to make the safe pass you are not obliged as a car that's being passed even if it's a gt3 car being passed by a gtp you are not obliged to pull over and let them by it's for them to find their way around safely you shouldn't be weaving around stick to your racing line and let them find the way around. They've got more downforce, more power, and probably more experience than you. So they are the ones that have got to make the move. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch with us, coming down, well, we've almost got another hour, so we're coming up to another VP Racing Steer Frosty update. As the time ticks around to 20 minutes before 7 o'clock in the evening here. Gap it's, sorry, Peter, still the Acura of Louis Delatraz leading by about four or five seconds. Yeah, it's, it's stretched out quite a bit just after, just as I think pretty much as soon as I said, oh, it's staying steady at uh, just under two seconds. So Louis Delatraz said, oh, you think so, do you? And stretched it out to 4.7 seconds to Matt Campbell. But we've got three manufacturers in the top four of GTP, Acura, Porsche, Cadillac in there as well, which is fantastic uh, to see. And... Simon Pagino continues. In fact, Simon Pagino is going to be on the back of Matt Campbell pretty soon. There's just two seconds behind them, and at current rate, Pagino is the man with the speed at the moment. Yeah, it was a slow lap a couple of laps ago by Matt Campbell. Lost a couple of seconds and more. Mm. Now, that could have been traffic. We don't, we don't want to... Well, it comes and goes. <laughs> well, we, we don't... Yeah. I said earlier on, and we said many times, traffic gives, traffic takes away. You don't want to jump on something and say, oh, there's a problem. Uh, and we're also going to have to, particularly later in the evening, be very aware of what is going on regarding cool tyres. Pagano has got past Matt Campbell. So the, the change for second place has happened. It has happened. Yeah. So Pagano has got past Matt Campbell. So our Matt, is Matt right. Campbell struggling on tyres? They've been, yeah, they've it's been, a out, been. Yes, he's, uh, he's in the last sort of. 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes of his double stint, Matt Campbell. But, you know, his, his missions are just coming alive right now. And we saw that ex exactly reversed yeah. at the end of the stint of the tyres for Colin Brown when he, before he came in to give the car to Simon Pagino a stint to go. Remember, he lost the lead and we couldn't understand why until we realised that uh, Colin was struggling for grip in the last two or three uh, laps. He managed it very well, he I did. thought, because he didn't drop off a cliff. No. He just, just just a tiny feedback, and no, very well managed there. Uh, I would think uh, Mike Shank could be very pleased with now his Alex, so far. Alex Goldschmidt is asking on IMSA Radio with regards to the two tyre compounds, and as yet, we have not been... None of the teams have been allowed to put the low-temperature tyre on. They're still on the high-temperature tyre, so they have got another 20 minutes before they can put the uh, LTs on, the low temperature tyres on. However, at the moment, if the HTs aren't lasting, um, is that because they're sliding around too much? 
or is that because they just can't keep them under them? Two Porsches in together this time, Joe Bradley. There was a three-lap gap last time around. Uh, Nick Damon is at that end of pit lane. No, no, it's me, John. OK. Uh, it's me. Uh, yeah, the number seven was in first, then followed quickly by the number six. We're having a driver change on the number seven. It's going to be Michael Christensen who's going to jump into the number seven. The number six, however, uh, no driver change going on on the number six. No tyres being changed either. Um, and no tyres being changed on the... No, tyres going on to the number seven. It's just no fresh tyres on the number six. So completely different strategies here from the Penske Porsche team. Up at the other end of the pit lane, we've had a stop from the AF Corsa GTD Pro 21 Ferrari. Um, yeah, we heard from James Clardo quite recently. That there's, there's kind of a, a let's just do some laps feeling about it. As they all feel they're suffering from... Uh, they say development woes or possibly rules woes, but either way, it was a very good stop again. And uh, oh, looking back down the pit lane, I can see the seven's lights are still shining in my eyes, Joe. Yeah, the number seven has not moved. We've got a laptop plugged in with a very long lead. The number seven Porsche, the 963, is still on pit here. Pit here and its sister car, the number six, has left a long time ago. We've got an overheating, uh, an overheating rear right brake that's smoking merrily, but uh, there's a problem on this car that's within the the brains of the operation on this right. car because we've got something plugged in, downloading data to see what the problem exactly is. Uh, Charlotte Lumley is tuned in uh, from uh, Saudi on the IMSA stream. And Preston gets through the firewall there. Uh, half past two in the morning, though, over there. Lummers, we wish you all the best. Thanks very much for tuning in. Um, I have to correct myself. It was the uh, Triazi Competition GTD Ferrari, the 023, not the 23 GTD Heart of Racing Aston in the Pro Class. Um, so the, Tria G the Triazi Competizione GTD Ferrari. Same things apply. There's not two different compounds in that category. So uh, there must have been something a little odd, either out of their, either out of their allowance or out of spec in terms of the car, uh, the, the, the starting pressures on that car. And meantime, whilst I was seeing all that, the number seven Penske. A Porsche Penske Motorsport car has rejoined, but it's dropped now well down and indeed goes out behind Alexander Sims. So has it now dropped off the lead lap? Oh. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. So there we are. There's another longer pit stop. So that's two of the leading cars that we were looking towards, being the 01 Cadillac after that bodywork change and the 7 Porsche that has had have had issues in the pits. Joe Bradley will be um, asking the difficult questions down that there at uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport to see if we can find out what the issue was. As into the pits comes the number ten. That again is at Joe Bradley's end. This is the Conning and Minolta Acura, the leader of the motor race. Joe. Yeah, I'll pop back out. I was on a, a bit of a mission there. Uh, I've also got the 24 BMW that's in in between myself and the current and along the Acura. And as I say that, it bursts into life off its pit apron and uh, is straight back out. I am assuming, John, that that just took on fuel. What car are you talking about, Joe, sorry? Number 10. Uh, sorry. I, I, no, no, I, I think I, they're due, unless this is, they're doing a treble stint, they were due a tire change, uh, was the uh, number 10. Conica yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a little bit further up the pit lane. I'm still down with Porsche, trying to uh, Pen Porsche Penske, trying to fathom out. Um, I'll check. I'll check out to make sure that that uh, car is on uh, on that schedule. The number ten, that is. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Joel. Uh, great work uh, from all of our pit lane reporters down in the lane. The, the hour has gone by. Here's your VP Racing in race update. We'll start this time in GTD and in 25th position overall is the first of GT cars. It's one of the GTD standards, the caught off Mercedes-Benz AMG GT3 with at the moment Maxi Gertz 
behind the wheel. Second in GTD is a pro car. It's the number three Chevy Corvette C8R, one of the, the, the converted GT Le Mans car. It's replacement for next year, shown off yesterday and sits opposite us in front of the Chevrolet unit in the pit lane. Third is the number 23 Aston Martin Vantage GT, Alex Riberas behind the wheel of the Heart of Racing Pro Car. Next up is the second place GTD with the green number panels, that's the 27 Aston Martin Vantage GT. That's another Heart of Racing car, Roman De Angelis behind the wheel. The top six uh, made up by the GTD Pro third place car of Jules Gounon, who's just been bringing that WeatherTech AMG up through the field. And he heads a number of Mercedes actually uh, the sixth place GTD, uh, GT car rather, is third in GTD normal. That's the 75. That is the Sun Energy One Mercedes Luca Stoltz. And Russell Ward is behind the wheel of the fourth place GTD. We're keeping an eye on that windward car. That's the rebuilt car out on the high banks at the moment. Uh, at GT uh, LMP3, still led by the number 36. That is the Andretti car. Lance Wilsey in second after one or two issues, but holding on to second place in 33 stars and stri stripes. Uh, Sean Creech Motorsport and the top three that is all Ligiers as the 43 Fast MD racing car is third with James French behind the wheel. In LMP2, TDS number 11, Mikkel Jensen behind the wheel of that. It's James Allen in second in LMP2 behind the wheel of the number 55 and in third place the number 35 of Jupp van Oetert uh, in LMP2 and that is the it's a 35 car in LMP2 Peter it's got, uh, the, the, the 35 is the uh, oh no it's that is the car right that was I think was involved in no it wasn't it was the 13 it's car the second TDS involved. car well yeah in LMP2 you threw me you threw me <laughs> LMP2 number 35 TDS racing yes uh, by the way uh, that's our VP racing fuels official coolant of IMSA update it's stay frosty all the details on the VP fuel website Zero grip for Albuquerque in the number 10. Uh, in the number 10. Uh, so they think they did do tyres. Joe Bradley, you can give us the update. Uh, can I refer to my notes? You can. Yeah, um, they did take on tyres, confirmed on the number 10. Uh, also got an update on the number 7 Porsche for you. And that is a, a shifting problem towards the end of the stint. So they've uh, they've plugged the computer in to see if they can get to the bottom of it. Uh, it remains to be seen whether they have, and as we saw, the car is back out there, and hopefully without a shifting problem. Also getting an energy alarm, and the chap I spoke to, he said, I don't even know what that means, and I said, oh, right, okay, I know somebody who might. Uh, just a couple of bits and pieces from uh, the notes yesterday. I'm, I'm I'm not sure whether I meant to mention this, but uh, yesterday afternoon, I've had a couple of people asking various questions um, on Twitter that I've, I've been sort of leaving aside. Um, Eagle-eyed people uh, around the circuit spotted yesterday, and I have to say I did as well, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer with an entourage of people here yesterday. And um, he doesn't do things without a reason. He's big in his cars, of course, um, but a potential for him to be involved in a major motion picture that has been put together at the moment. And if you are into those sort of things, if you put two and two together, you do not necessarily have to make anything more uh, than that. Uh, penalty for the number 60 car. The, that is the my Shank Racing Machine. So that was a penalty for that car doing a drive-through, Peter Mackay. Um, or was that a very quick pit shot? No, that would be a pit stop, I think. Uh, Nick Dierman? Just a uh, it looked like a drive-through to me. I mean, I, I, I was popped out of the, and it was trundling along. I know it comes right from the end, and, it's, and it is Joe's, Joe's end. But I would say that was more likely a drive-through, but you will have the lap time and you'll be able to tell me in about a minute. They didn't, they didn't see anything come up on the race control for a penalty. 
uh, and they were due a pit stop. They were 31 laps, that yeah, was. Yeah, they were right on a pit stop. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. We'll try and find out. Uh, with nothing on race control uh, well, list as well, so we'll see. What uh, I don't have on the screen is a time for the pit stop, unfortunately. Uh, I'll just have to scroll through. So the last pit time. Uh, no, it doesn't have that. I'm sure the, the folks down in pit, pit lane will get uh, get on top of it as well. Uh, so number seven, Team Penske Porsche Motorsport uh, machine back going again after some, uh, the mechanics looking just to the right-hand side of the driver, opening the right-hand door yeah, of the car. Yeah, that was ages ago. That's, no, I know that, but that's, yeah. where the, that's where a lot of the battery and the MGU uh, is going on. That car is obviously back going again, as, as John said. And we've got um, 25 BMW in. Joe Bradley's there, and he has news of that number 60 stop. No, I'm afraid I'm not at the BMW pit, but I am at the Mayashan Acura pit, and there was no baffled looks when I said, have you guys just had a penalty? No, is the answer. That was a straightforward pit stop. Just sneaked in uh, without us noticing down to our left hand side amazing watching the, the the gtp cars coming out after having the difference of having putting pit uh, putting tires on if the tires are going on of course no tire warmers here in imsa and when they're going out of the pit lane it is incredible how little how little grip they have if they are double stinting the tire they go out and they've really got a big advantage but of course then it comes back when the tire wears away at the end of the second stint. So this is gonna be fascinating. Great work by Michelin, IMSA and the teams to get a product that really provides exciting racing, really interesting strategical stuff. Um, so yeah, really, really cool uh, to see that. And we'll see that play out over the course of the night. Remember, we're not into the cooler part. We are expecting the minimum temperature to be, to be relatively high. Nick Damon is with the leader of LMP3, Rasmus Blind. Yeah, it's number 36. Now, interesting, they've, they've, they've given uh, Storms a problem because they've had to come at a, a, a jaunty angle because they were avoiding the car that was ahead of them. Uh, so they're going to have to get themselves moved around. I'm not sure the lot's going to make it happen. Full service, tyres and fuel. The, the driver may have stayed on board. It's a long, long fill. There's a lot of cars waiting to come. The, the P3s are very much all in a line with each other. They, they come in within a lap or so. Uh, but that was a very good stop, and he did actually manage to give it just enough right foot to kind of swerve, swerve the rear back in to get out again. So uh, no time lost on the uh, strange positioning in the pit box. Don't think it's going to be long before uh, our pit lane reporters, Nick Damon, she Adam, Joe Bradley, get to see a lot of GTD cars, a lot of them approaching the end of their stint in the next few laps. Uh, they run to just about 55 minutes, between 55 minutes and an hour, depending on their strategy. Uh, we heard um, from uh, Ollie Milroy saying that the number three uh, Corvette uh, appeared to be doing quite a lot of fuel saving uh, as well. So you know for sure that Corvette racing, whatever there's, whenever there's a strategical game, whenever there's an execution in the pit stop game, they are absolute demons at it and uh, they know how to maximize a race operation they've won this event so many times can you imagine corvette racing their first ever race as a team was here 24 years ago 1999 yeah uh did they not do petit le i don't think so i think this was their first uh, their first race as a as corvette racing as we know it uh, today well we can, ask, we can ask our guest actually oh i will get uh, found out then if i've Doug got it wrong <laughs> is uh, going to join us in a little while two heart of racing cars coming in together that's uh, i think that's nick damon's end of things is it uh oh no that's joe's not close enough to see that so let's uh, see if we can pee, pee it up the top oh no joe's there go ahead yeah i'm, I'm just maybe we're down there and trying not to get run down by the number 12 uh, Vassar Sullivan, Lexus, and the 14. Big foot out, almost clobbered me. At uh, the heart of racing Astons, both cars in at the same time, pretty much exactly at the same time. Fuel going into the 27, as I've caught up. The 27's off the jacks. So the Joe, we're going to uh, take it back from you. We've had an incident on the circuit, and that is a collision with the side of the track, and there's a bit of damage to the number 85. This is the JDC car. The decay of Mason Felipe. Looked like he's uh, broken the suspension on the rear. Yeah, he has. He's hit the concrete quite hard uh, in the area of the 
infield, coming down to the international hairpin. He's got a very, very long way to get that car back, I think. Uh, now, what I don't know is whether uh, he got help to get down there. May just have been coming out of the pits, or at least one lap out of the pits. And it's actually at the west end uh, of... No, no, it's not. It's in the international hairpin, and he's pulling off right in front. Actually, gone with it before. There's a BMW safety car there. We can see that by the lights. That's really smart thinking. He's not going to try and get all the way around, and we've been saved from a full-course caution. And what he's got to do now is try and get it back into the pit. A legitimate 31 laps, as Jeremy was telling us, for the number 60 of Acura of Simon. Pagano, no yellow flag in that session. That's a fuel run at all. At Imsa Radio 4 on Twitter, if you want to get in touch with us. Corvette in from the GTD Pro League. Joe Bradley's there. Yep, just tyres and fuel, no driver there, pretty standard. <laughs> The way that Corvette pulls away, he should just be given the trophy now. Just maximum wheel spin to get that uh, rubber scrubbed off, isn't it? Fabulous to see. It's almost like it has a burnout mode, isn't it? Tommy Milner now on to his second stint behind the wheel. Antonio Garcia started that car. Jordan Taylor taking it on to the second stint now. Then is Tommy Milner on board right now. The Windward car is in as well. That's the 57 Mercedes. That car has uh, come over from Texas. Uh, in the truck after the unfortunate incident on Thursday and uh, off it goes running a great race so far Russell Ward uh, bringing that car into pit lane and it seems that it's not just an issue for the GTP uh, uh, cars uh, coming out of the pits on, on cold tyres the uh, GTD cars are really having to work hard to get the tyre temperature in Tommy Milner having to move the wheel back and forward quite aggressively to generate as much temperature in his uh, mission tyres as possible. Of course, for so many years, Corvette racing in the GTLM category where they use the uh, what's called a, a confidential tyre, mission confidential tyre, um, which is basically a tyre that's developed for them. Uh, whereas when they moved to the GTD category at the beginning of uh, last year, um, when the GTLM category stopped, they then went on to a customer tyre, and that's been the biggest adjustment for the Corvette racing team, but uh, the thing about whatever problem that it presented to them, they, they solved it pretty quickly, that's for sure. An incredible organisation. Uh, so I, I think uh, their long-term presence in motorsport, 25 or 24, 25 seasons, Corvette racing, you look at the Corvette corrals here at Daytona, it's packed full of Corvettes, same at Le Mans, and that, that um, fan following only comes from a consistent presence in motorsport, in my opinion. Yeah, and when you think that Audi had something similar going on with a, a very different type of car, and that's all disappeared in the last 18 months. They've built it up over, you know, three decades, and they've managed to lose that completely within 18 months. I find that extraordinary, I really do. Yeah, good point, very good point. Um, so the, the, the two... Uh, oh, no. Yes, well, actually, look, the uh, number 01 uh, Cadillac of Scott Dixon, it looks like got on to the lead lap as we have the two Acuras side by side into the Le Mans chicane and that's it's the number 10, position. it is, that's the change for the lead, Philippe Albuquerque takes the lead for Konica Minolta, Acura goes by Simon Pagino so Simon Pagino he is 9 minutes into his stint so he's got another 40 minutes and of course remember he's on to the second stint of those tyres now so it's switching around, Albuquerque's got fresh boots on so, so it's back and forth all the time. That's 7 seconds in 5 laps that have been oh, uh, pulled back so there, there is a, a tyre advantage on the second stint. No choice but to double stint these tyres because you do not have enough tyres to go all the way through the race and there's part of the tyre all allocation was being used on the the Raw weekend as well for the GTPs. They have, coming up in three minutes' time, the option to go onto the SLT, the low temperature tyres. 
the HT, the higher temperature tyres, you can use them any time in the race. You've got 12 sets of low temperature tyres, which you may only use. And off for the Iron, Iron Dames. Dames number 83, the bright purple pink Lamborghini. Sarapovi. That, that was an outlap, so that is... Uh, there we go, off on the outlap. I said we'd be talking about that a lot. Temperature is now coming down on the circuit. 70 yeah. Fahrenheit on the track. Uh, 63 in the air. I wonder if we could see the uh, high temperature tyre uh, trebled in the night. That's a, that's a tough one. That, uh, Michelin are, are probably saying, oh, yes, or oh, no. Um, it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on it um, to see what's what there as well. It's a new challenge for the teams. Track yeah. temperature still sitting 70, at 70 yeah. Fahrenheit. What's that? Uh, hasn't changed much, to be honest, through the day. Uh, in real money, that is uh, 21. Air temperature's only just dropped down to 17. It's been sitting at 18. 90, the track temperature is coming down, but gently. The forecast is to sort of linger at that air temperature all night. Yes. Uh, that's what's forecast, what happens, we'll see, but uh, that's what we've got to run off at the moment. Um, so it's Acura 1-2 at the moment, Philippe Albuquerque for Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti Autosport, the Konica Minolta car. A very familiar car, number 10 painted blue and black with Konica Minolta branding, but with the addition of Andretti Autosport, uh, a real big change for that team. Uh, this year, and uh, everything points to it being a very positive step in the future. Oh, off the Rizzi Ferrari, number 62 Rizzi Ferrari, off at the International Horseshoe, and rejoins the car's got... That's another outlap, that's, uh, that's another an outlap, outlap for yeah. Daniel Serra. So you've got factory drivers, um, you know, being caught out with it, so it's not just uh, um, the drivers with less experience, that is a factory Ferrari driver, um, he's struggling to get on top of that. So this is going to be the story of the night, I think, John. Daniel Serra, very highly thought of. He's going to be part of the prototype team, isn't he? Uh, uh, there's one driver in that car who isn't. Babe. Hold on, hold collar. <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, Daniel Serra, no, he is ah. not. Uh, Alessandro Perghidi and James That's Prado right. are. That's Serra right. and Rigon are not. But there's going to be plenty for them to do, I'm sure, with the new 296. So, uh, we are 18 hours and 40 minutes to go here at the 61st Rolex 24 Hours at Daytona. And down in the uh, fast MD pit, Antonio Tedavalli just had a second place in the P3. It's very action-packed out there. Yeah, it's very packed. Uh, it's first time here, so to get used to everything with all the cars, uh, it took a lot of time. But uh, yeah, it's very packed, and uh, I think our pace is okay so far right now, and uh, we're just working at it right now. P3 is a tricky car because you're faster than some of the cars and slower than the others, so you're having to both look forward and look behind the whole time. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you got to look uh, every way in this track. Uh, there's all cars coming by you all the time, but uh, I think we're getting there. When you've got sort of nine identical cars in a, well, nine very similar cars in a class, how can you as a team, how does the team make the difference? Just by uh, spotting and uh, strategy a lot, so just put us uh, in the right place all the time. Antonio, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Nick. Um, great work there down in the pits. Um, tweet coming in on IMS, at IMSA Radio. Send us all your questions uh, in on at IMSA Radio. Uh, Joshua Barrett, hello, Joshua, uh, says, are the GTP cars are required to double some tyres or is it for all classes? Uh, just the GTPs are a little bit more restricted on their, uh, their tyre usage uh, as well. Uh, so they're going to have it a little bit more uh, uh, to, to look at for, for those. And of course, have the two different options of a low temperature tire, which they can now use, uh, and a high temperature tire. The low temperature tire can be used between 7 o'clock in the evening and 8 o'clock in the morning. So quite a wide window when they can use that uh, as, as well. Uh, so we have just gone past that hour now, 7 o'clock in the morning. Just gone past midnight uh, back in the UK. So if you're uh, watching from over there uh, in Europe, we hope you're enjoying this uh, momentous uh, 61st Rolex 24-hour at Daytona, the arrival of the GTP category, brand-new prototype machines from 
uh, Acura, Cadillac, Porsche and BMW all taking part in this brilliant uh, race and it's led at the moment by Konica Minolta Acura car number 10 by 1.5 seconds Pippo Durrani in third in the number 31 uh, Action Express Cadillac 19.5 seconds further back then it's the first of the Porsches in fourth car number 6 Dane Cameron uh, 32.3 seconds back from the lead Errol Bamber is in fifth uh, 02 uh, Cadillac, that's the WEC car, the World Juniors Championship car that's guested here. Uh, 36.5 seconds back from the lead. And Scott Dixon's managed to get himself back onto the lead lap after, well, great work from the Chip Ganassi crew uh, after being hit from the back uh, by by an LMP3 car. Uh, again, not, not no fault of either car, uh, more a matter of circumstance. He's sitting in sixth position at the moment. Then in seventh, it's Michael Christensen uh, for Porsche Penske Motorsport and Colton Herta eighth in the BMW M Hybrid V8 for Team RLL. And any G GTP car that stops now, Peter, of course, will be able to put yes, the that's right. temp tyre on because it is three minutes past seven. That's right. And, uh, well, Scott Dixon, of course, is slightly off strategy, so he will drop back off the lead lap when he, when he pits. That's, uh, that's what worth uh, worth noting. And he should actually be, Scott Dixon, into the pits quite soon in the 0-1 Cadillac racing machine, probably in the next two laps. I'm in reliably informed, very reliably okay. informed. Um, Just want to run through some retirements and okay. they are retirements they've been declared as such uh, Roberto Lacorte in the 47 Chetilar car after contact with a Corvette I think it was very early on in the race that one has officially retired Gar Robinson's set Ranch 74 Riley the these year in LMP3 that was an engine issue there were fluids where fluids ought not to have been i.e. in the outside world that is a retirement. Only the two retirements officially uh, at the moment. We're keeping an eye on one or two other cars uh, that have gone missing, including the Tower, uh, excuse me, the 85 to Ken, the TDC Miller car, that car, uh, the um, JDC Miller car, that, that car contact with the wall, suspension damage, but it was limping back to the pits. It's not sure back in the pits yet because it was coming back through the infield. So if you're looking at the Alcamel uh, timing, then you'll see an S next to it. Um, that doesn't mean it's necessarily out on the circuit. It just means it's gone missing. I suspect it's in the paddock. Right. Stops for the recent car. Scott Dixon has just come in. That was 29 laps in the 01 Cadillac racing car. Porsche number seven, just 15 laps for Michael Christensen. And that was the car that was getting rebooted early not, on with gearbox issues. I, I wonder if there's, there's either a fault in our timing screen or it's behind the wall, the number seven Porsche Penske, because it's not in its pit box and it's showing as in the pits. But I can see it's not in its pit box. The car number seven, Michael Christensen, Porsche Penske Motorsport. So it may have been pushed it may have been pushed behind the wall. Uh, either that or it's a, a glitch in our timing uh, screen, which is highly unlikely. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that one uh, as it develops and we'll get the information to you as quick as we have it here in the booth. As the gap at the front actually stretched out quite a bit as Philippe Albuquerque makes the full use of those brand new sticky Michelins and moving up 4.4 seconds ahead of Simon Pagino, who's in the, the kind now moving into the second half of his second stint on those set of Michelins. So, um, top job from uh, top job from Pagano, as always. And then Pippo Durrani sitting in third at the moment, 19 seconds uh, away from the leader. It's Peter Mackay with me, John Hindoff, on the fifth floor. Race continuing with 18 hours and 34 minutes to go. And I'm delighted to say we're about to welcome an old friend back to IMSA Radio. Well, in fairness, we're all old now, uh, to be absolutely brutal, but I'm delighted to see still a friend. And that is the one and only Doug Fahan, former programme manager 
Corvette Racing. Hello, Doug. How are you? Happy New Year. I'm, I'm terrific, and Happy New Year to you as well. I, I can't think of a better way to kick it off. No, indeed. New era, a new Corvette down there. Come on, you must have been down there to see that new Z06 GT3. Uh, I, I, it was interestingly enough, it was just coincidental. I happened to be wandering by, and they were announcing uh, they were announcing the fact they're building a new car, and I happened to be there to see that, yeah. Uh, how, from your situation, are you look now s still involved in this because you've still got consultancy work and still involved with, with GM. Clearly, they're never going to let you go. You realise that. You're part of the furniture now. You're listed on the <laughs> assets list. Uh, you know that. Um, just just give me a, a, a view of, of what you're seeing in this IMSA paddock, particularly in the, the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, but across the IMSA Championships, the Pilot Challenge as well. Well, you know, having done this for really most of my life, uh, I don't think we've ever been in a better spot in road racing in America. And, and possibly, I mean, you want to say it, the world. Uh, when you look at the entry list, the uh, number of manufacturers that are involved, uh, you and I know that, that we've run this series with two, three, and four manufacturers, and you're out there now and you see just the wide variety. Everybody is participating on some level or another. Uh, some of the best news, I was talking to my friends over Ford. Uh, they'll be back next year, which brings a whole new element to the to, to the excitement for the fan see base. that new car at Sebring, actually. They're yeah. going to un unveil that new yeah. car. Yeah, they'll be showing Sebring. theirs, and they'll, they'll be in competition, I think, at, the, at this race next year, I'm guessing. Uh, it, it's just, we, we've never been in this position before. We've never been in this position before. The, 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 the world of sports car racing has never been healthier. And I, and I think when you look at for the reasons why, I mean, obviously brand relevance plays a huge role in that. When people can go out and look at what they're, what they're you know, watch what, what's racing and, and be able to go and buy it in the showroom, uh, the technology that's in the P-level cars, oh. uh, it's just, uh, if, Young people are fascinated by it. I mean, I can share this with you. When we look at the Corvette C8, which is, uh, which is for, for me, was uh, the, the final distillation of a career spent at Corvette. That was, if you look at the original uh, program as I presented it to John Middlebrook, the idea was this technology transfer thing and, and, and where, where production and racing become one. And the C8 is, the, uh, is really the epitome of, yeah. uh, of that program. Almost 50% of our buyers of C8 have never owned a Chevrolet product. Really? Yes. They are conquest buys. They are conquest buys. They are people who have obviously followed Corvette, followed Corvette racing, and the C8 was enough to kind of put it over the top for them. Uh, when you look at the performance, the, the price, and the utility, there's not another vehicle on the planet that comes close. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. Stay with us for a little while, Doug. Uh, confirmed now that the number seven Penske Porter Motorsport 963 is in the garage. It's in a state of undress. Joe Bradley is on its way there. A couple of, of uh, tweets coming in. Mickey Heath asking, why are tyres for low temps only allowed to be used between times and not a specified temperature? Uh, that is a, a reasonable point, but at some point you've got to say um, the timings and where it is. I, I, where's the official, I suppose, where's the official... Um, temperature uh, it is seven tonight to eight tomorrow morning um, and actually it's a lot warmer than anyone was expecting um, so Josh Barrett asking is it just the GTP cars that are required double stint tyres now is that for all classes all cars uh, are giving are being given fewer sets of tyres to try to make uh, things uh, a little more sustainable. Joe Bradley has made his way to the uh, Porsche, the Petsky Porsche garage. Joe, what are you seeing there? Yeah, massive amount of work going on here. Remember I told you they kept having an energy warning light? Yes. Uh, well, that's led to them having to change the batteries. Right. Uh, and is that, a is that the work of a... Just one second, Joe. We've got the Iron Lynx car going slowly on the down on the apron as well. I'm looking to see if I can see any damage on that, and actually I can't. I think he put, who did he put into the Iron Lynx? It was out, it came out not very long ago. Was it Sarah Bovey? Yes, it was. Um, I seem to remember mentioning Sarah's name. She's clearly got a problem, had a, an off at, on the, on the outlet at, uh, on the outlet at the Western 
Porsche. Joe, have you had a uh, have you had an estimate from the yeah. uh, the Porsche centre down there of, we have, of, uh, we have, of we the have. job time? You, you know these guys have, uh, have been stripping these cars up and down for the last few months now. So 20 minutes for the battery change, about add on another 10 or 15 minutes for whatever it takes to get at them, and uh, that's the total job time. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Where is the battery pack on that car? I, I, I seem to remember, and I, I, I get this wrong, Andrew Cotton from Sports Car, uh, from uh, Race Car Engineering, um, will tweet it through to me. I, I've got a feeling that's an offset battery pack. Is it in one of the side ports? The battery pack it, on that car. It's, it certainly looks that's like the uh, the area where they're uh, they're looking. Um, I don't. You can't get too close to them. They, you know, they, they've got a lot going on there and I can't get towards that end of the car right. to, to kind of see properly but uh, I think I'll... it's the opposite side of the car to the driver it's because uh, it's about 70 kilos so it balances out the driver it's an asymmetric design that uh, multi-matic uh, LMDH GTP chassis from memory yeah I'll, 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 I'll loiter with intent. loiter with intent indeed I've got uh, Doug Feehan here uh, the real slim click, he says, can you ask Doug how excited are the GM folk about having the Chevy NASCAR as the invitation to the Le Mans 24 hours? Uh, and are they as excited about the extension of reach as we are as fans about listening to it, hopefully for 24 hours going round and round? <laughs> well, yeah, we're excited. I think it shows really when you think about it, you know, tw 25 years ago, we started with this Corvette thing, and there wasn't a lot yeah. of... Yeah, right here, right here, 1999. Yeah, yeah, our very first race. You know, and there wasn't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm inside the corporation for that. It was the first factory-backed Corvette race program since the car was built back in 1953. Look at how far we've come now with the diversity that we're displaying in racing, uh, especially at Le Mans. I mean, we'll have a Corvette. We'll have a C Cadillac GTP, and we'll have a NASCAR with a, with with, with electrification. Effectively, is that? Yeah, I, I mean, you talk about a company that didn't have much interest, and 25 years later, I mean, we're all in on this deal. So yeah, the excitement level is really high. I, I'm, I'm going to give you something for the guys at uh, at GM Marketing. I've just realised it is the centenary uh, celebration event of Le Mans, uh, and with those three entries that you've uh, mentioned, GM are making it. Uh, bow tie event aren't they yes we are and it's uh <laughs> seven, 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 70th, 70th anniversary of corvette as well yeah just so, so beautifully I, I, well. you know it's just it's just a, a real testament to uh, mark royce has done a marvelous job yeah. in championing racing and uh, showing the value it's so much more than a checkered flag and a trophy if you can embed racing into deep enough into your company uh you know you attract young talent to the engineering group you attack attract young talent to your marketing your advertising uh, it, it, it's it's so much more than just crossing the finish line first. So, with that in mind, the new GTP, what we would have seen as DPI 2.0, because they were in the works quite some time ago. Right. IMSA encouraging the manufacturers to make even more styling cues. There's no doubt that those Cadillacs look like Cadillacs, from the wheel design to the the, the door mirror design to the headlamp. They call it lighting signature now, don't they? Yes. In, in auto speak. That's All right. of that. Does that make it easier for the person who's now doing your job at Corvette and for Laura Wontrup Klausner, who's in, at the head of racing, to be able to say, look, there's relevance here, how it looks as well as how it performs? If you do a good enough job in that design, you don't have to tell people, all right? They will see it and they will appreciate it. You know, they've done a marvelous job with the Cadillac. I, the, I, I'm hoping other manufacturers follow suit. You know, back in 2000, 2008, we came very, seven or eight, we came very close at ACO to having the cars, you know, a, a new prototype class where the cars looked, I mean, a lot like what the production cars did. So that got lost. We're back now. Uh, Cadillac's following suit. The design guys, I think, did a marvelous job. It's a stunning design on that car, and unmistakable styling cues with Cadillac. Uh, to me, that's that's a very, very, very important element. You heard me say that in my opening remarks. Product relevance, oh, yeah. brand relevance, that's what brings people to the racetrack. Doug, stay with us. We're going to go for an update from Joe Bradley. He's managed to get to a position where he can see this battery pack replacement remember they were in earlier on they tried to fix this with a software fix the car's been really uh, very very hot rear brakes 
probably not getting the regen if the battery pack is not working. Joe, what's happening down there and where is this battery pack situated? Well, well, there's a lot of work going on. So the battery pack is situated just in front, well, in front of the right rear wheel, yeah. uh, kind of at the point of the rear bulkhead of the cockpit. And they've got a jacking platform there, but sort of the sort of thing that you would use to take a gearbox out of your Hillman Avenger. And it's kind of <laughs> underneath... That's a Plymouth cricket for those of you over here. <laughs> All right. Um, right. It's underneath that area of the car, and I'm presuming, because I've sent you pictures of the new battery pack, by the way, your more eloquent description. Um, so the, battery, the new battery pack is, is sort of off to the side, ready to uh, deploy. Uh, meanwhile, they're disconnecting everything. This is what they must mean by the disconnecting and reconnecting of the system. Uh, because um, they're going to work there, and then once they've got it all loose and disconnected, etc., um, they'll then lower it down on the platform, wheel it out, and then uh, subsequently put the next one onto the, the new one onto a, another platform and wheel it in. Um, so, yeah, not the job of a moment, and uh, under this pressure, well, it's the first time they've done this under competitive pressure, isn't it? So, um, much to their chagrin, it's quite good to see, uh, as I'm a bit of a technical geek. Uh, Nick Dearman watched something very similar going on with the BMW yeah. earlier on and now has the Iron Dames 83 that was going slowly, the Lamborghini going very slowly. The battery pack is about to be offered to yeah. underneath the car. Now, this is, as we said, it's asymmetric. It's, it, it's to balance out the, yeah. the driver. You saw this early on. Yeah, with the it's, BMW it's exactly the same thing as happened on the BMW. Wow. Uh, the same unit, because they are a standard unit, and the same... Uh, as you say, Hillman, Hillman Avenger uh, gearbox jack putting it in. I think because the uh, BMW was behind the walls a bit longer, they're also searching a couple of other things out. But that was their key change. Their key change was the energy store. Um, yes, yeah, the bad news of the 83, which is the uh, Iron Danes car. So everybody with that car has been pushed back behind the walls. a long push because it's, it's, it's actual pit box is as far uh, to pit out as possible. And the uh, going back behind the wall is exactly halfway. So a big old push to the mechanics. That car is behind the wall with that Porsche, but that Porsche I expect will be coming back, well, I don't know, 20 to 25 minutes. The Iron Dames came back under its own steam, but slowly with Sarah Bova behind the wheel. Nick, uh, was it under power when it went past you, or, or did they have to push it from further down the pit lane, or was that just when they were taking it out of the pit lane? No, no, no they, they got, it got to the, it got to the uh, pit box, they had a look at it, but we can't fix it here, and had to push it all the way back right. and out uh, to, to get out into the, uh, behind, the, behind the wall. So gearbox issues for that Lamborghini, battery pack being changed. This is not like just changing a couple of Duracells. I'm looking at the complexity uh, of that battery pack with its cooling systems, with all of the safety systems that's built into that. That is a substantial piece of kit. It's, I've, I've seen engines that aren't any bigger than that. Doug and I are just looking at the pictures that Joe, I'll tweet it out in a minute. Apparently that, that weighs 70 kilos, if that's, uh, or 100 kilos, excuse me. If it only if it only weighs 70 or 100 kilos, they're doing pretty well on that, but up there too. Uh, that's a lot bigger than what our small block pushrod motor was. Yes, that was exactly <laughs> what I was. Exactly what I and, was. And that only weighed 300 pounds. Yeah, that's extraordinary. I'll get that tweeted out when I get a moment. Uh, at him some radio, please. Uh, Joe, you, if you can tweet that out on uh, on your Twitter, I'll I'll forward that on and, and tag him to radio on that. I'll forward it on. And it's Philippe Albuquerque who leads in the Acura ARX06 for the newly minted WTR Andretti uh, from the similar car 14 seconds back uh, of Simon Pagino. He's fought his way back to the sharp end of the field in the number 60 Acura ARX06, uh, doing a good job. Um, big names in US motorsport, Doug, coming together with Wayne Taylor Racing and Andretti. Andretti seeming to have under Michael's tutelage uh, fingers in many pies. They've done uh, uh, Formula E, uh, Extreme E. Looks like they've answered all the critics with Formula One. Oh, yeah, you're not going to bring anything, Mr. Andretti. You can't bring anything. Come back when you've got a manufacturer. Hello, hello, I'm back. Have you got a manufacturer? Yeah, GM, how's that for you? I mean, that's that's pretty impressive, isn't it? I, I, I have to agree. I don't think that... Uh, they can't turn it down anymore, can they? No, well, here's the thing. I, the world is getting smaller every single day. 
And, and let's look at what's going on. I mean, this re reality show, this Formula One reality show yeah, in, in this country yeah. all right, has created Formula One race fans of people who had never been to a race in their life of any sort. I mean, they haven't been to a horse race. And, and now and now they're, they're raging Formula One fans. And, and we now have three Formula One fans in, in, in America. Um, racing is taking on a whole new life that I have never witnessed before, and I, I, I couldn't be happier about it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Cadillac announcement and teaming up with Andretti, uh, American-based, hopefully we'll see some action uh, from the FIA and from Formula One that allows them to come because we have to get approval before yeah. we do that. Okay. Further it, down the line, I'm yeah. not necessarily at the start. There's talk of a Renault engine being rebadged uh, to start with, but is it beyond the bounds of possibility that GM might win um, with some engine technology for Formula One? I mean, the, the tiny, the, the 1.6 uh, V6 engines, very thermally efficient engines, though, and, and you guys know about that. Yeah, yeah, Formula One level of technology is, is well beyond what we're seeing here today, but the fundamentals are the same, yeah. all right? Thermodynamics don't change. Physics doesn't change. The Piston speeds in the NASCARs yeah. nowadays are pretty much right. identical to and, what you and, see in Formula And those are two valve motors with push yeah. rods in them. Yeah, yeah. When you see a slow motion of valve train, slow motion video of valve train, it's, a, it's amazing. You, it, well, it runs for five seconds. Um, I, I think when you, when you look at the things that Formula One offers, it, bringing the world closer together, uh, it's very, very attractive for manufacturers. The technology that exists inside General Motors, and I can tell you this because I've not seen all of it, but I've seen some of it, is absolutely astounding uh, on what they have going on there. I mean, it's astounding. Their capabilities are limitless. Now, is this? can you develop a Formula One motor overnight? Certainly not. But do they have the capabilities? And, and if they have the desire and the wherewithal to do that, there is nothing that they can't achieve. How are you filling your time now? Well, you know, we always said I couldn't imagine you sitting in the window or going and playing golf. So I can't imagine you've you've ducked out of of all things automotive. Well, we never want to rule out golf. Okay, let's get that out of the way right now. <laughs> uh, but 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 the fact remains, you know, my, my role as brand ambassador keeps me engaged with our customer base, which we work so hard to achieve. Uh, your customer base is what drives it. At the end of the day, John. At the end of the day, everybody here from a manufacturer's perspective, their goal is to sell cars. Yeah. All right? That's, I don't, you, there's a million different reasons that you can get to the final distillation, but the idea is to sell cars, and you can't sell cars without customers. And thank you, thank you, thank you. You and Jim Campbell down through the years, we now have Corvette in the UK with the steering wheel on the right-hand side. That is correct. I noticed you didn't say the correct side. You did say the right-hand side. Well, it started at the right-hand <laughs> side over here as well, if you go back That's to correct. Team. And there was, a, And there was a reason why we changed that. I don't know what it is, but it must have been good. Uh, at, at any rate, um, you know, the, the, the fact that, that we have what I think IMSA has recognized and I think all our competitors have recognized, our fan base is, uh, is unequal. Uh, they are dedicated. And by the way, in, in the world of Corvette, no one owns just a Corvette, okay? Nobody owns just a Corvette. They own SUVs, they own sedans, they own pickup trucks. And the idea is if you can get them under the tent and keep them enthused with Corvette, you got a real opportunity to get them into one of the other stellar brands, makes, and models that we produce at General Motors. Doug, so, thank you very much indeed for being with us. You know you're welcome here anytime. And let us know when you come to the UK because... Uh, Love to have you around. Well, yeah. you know, we, we go back a long ways, guys. I mean, we started in this thing, you and I both, about 25 years ago oh, yeah. here. I was, this is my, this is um, my 25th year. Of there, there you Not go. Not like him, he's been around forever. Whoa. I just said this morning, uh, when we started this race, uh, just said, as we're going down to turn one, thank you, Don Pianos, for what yeah. we're looking at here. Because uh, without him, this would never have started. Uh, honestly, God, yeah, I'm telling you, I, I'm Mr. France. I could tear up right now. Uh, thinking about Don and, and, and what he brought forward because really we're all we are all enjoying what we are today based on what uh, on what Mr. Francis has done and what Don Panos has done. Don, Don was never so proud as to not want to team up with people for the greater good. Absolutely. We right. all love the guy. Doug Fayette, uh, GM at Corvette Brand Ambassador. Great to have him in the booth. Thank you, Doug. You take your time. Take, uh, take care of yourself and we'll see you soon. We'll do that. Looking forward to seeing you at Sebring. All right, man. See you there. Bye-bye. Battle for the lead.
Perfect timing, as ever, by Mr Fian. Legend, legend. And uh, great to see him back here. So the battle for the lead is between Philippe Albuquerque and Simon Pagino. Jeremy Shaw uh, is, has uh, rejoined us and uh, is alongside me. Uh, now and this has just been gently boiling up through traffic side by side this could be the pass for the lead no team lap oh excuse me right sorry my apologies looking out in the darkness Pagino 16 seconds further back so this is another car going off the lead lap and people to running in the uh, Cadillac number 31 up now off the lead lap the two Acuras, Jeremy, have been knocking out these lap times. Whatever anybody else does, they seem to be able to go two, three or four tenths of a second quicker when they need to. And they have better energy usage yeah. as well because they're doing longer stints. The last stint for the uh, number 60 car was 31 laps. For the number 10 car, it was 30 laps. Uh, so, you know, 60 car is getting, you know, a, a, on a fairly consistent basis, getting a lot more than, uh, than, than anybody else. Nick the David, last... sorry Jeremy, Nick uh, David is watching a Porsche stop, that must be the number six there. It is the number six, the car that's currently running, it was a, it was a full service, uh, tyres, fuel, and I think the driver as well, I'm, quite, I'm, I'm actually at the point of moving in, so I was walking towards it, I change ends, and coming towards me actually is the uh, 96 uh, Turner Motorsport BMW and GTD, um, that's blocking my way. Behind it is one of the uh, leaders, the 51 or 52, the 52 in LMP2. So we're getting it's quite good now. We've had such a long run since the last yellow flag. We're getting people coming in randomly rather than all at once. <laughs> well, random's quite good. It gives you a chance to uh, scuttle around uh, in, uh, in the pit lane. And I get it in Le Mans style for me to send you to opposite ends of the pit lane.